Chapter 1 A Length of Black Cloth Fan Shen struggled to keep his eyes open. He looked at his fingers, counting off all the worthwhile things he'd done in his life, but the slender fingers on his right hand, thin as chopsticks, didn't get past five. With a sigh, he gave up trying. The smell of hospital medicine was always so pungent. The other day, the old fellow in the next bed had passed away, and in a few days, he'd probably be next. He'd contracted some sort of strange disease, and there was no strength left in his muscles. It seemed like the kind of sickness some hero in a romance novel would get, one where if you didn't get to a hospital, you'd eventually end up unable to even fart or burp, only being able to produce tears. But I'm not a romantic hero, Fan Shen mumbled. Unfortunately, the muscles in his jaw had wasted away to such an extent that this came out as a vague string of nonsense. He stared at his middle finger, filled with self-pity. I'm still a virgin. Dot. He'd done nothing worthwhile his entire life apart from helping old ladies cross the street, giving up his seat on the bus, being a good neighbor, letting his classmates copy his test answers. Fan Shen was the classically useless nice guy. His parents had died a while back. And so it was just him at the hospital, waiting for his life to came to an end. Nice guys finish last. One quiet and lonely night, Fan Shen felt as though his throat muscles were losing strength, as they were no longer able to tighten or loosen up, and his breathing muscles gradually lost their strength, like a rubber band losing its elasticity. He had no idea where that neat young nurse had gone. By his side was an old lady. Her eyes filled with pity as she rambled on. Am I going to die? His fear of death and thirst for life had stirred up complex feelings he'd never known before, and the fact that the last moments of his life would be spent with this old lady instead of that cute nurse he'd been waiting so long to see no doubt added to his sorrows. Feeling miserable, his eyelids drooped, and he cast his hazy eyes toward the black curtain hung over the hospital ward window blocking out the sunshine. Life is lonely as hell, he thought. Dash. Feeling miserable, a single drop of liquid fell from the corner of his eye. Fan Shen felt rather miserable, licking away the tear that had found its way to the corner of his mouth. To his surprise, he found that his tears were not only salty, but also slightly fishy. The hospital bathed him so rarely. Could it be that even his own tears had started to stink? In his thoughts, he couldn't help but curse. Look at you. You have tears streaming down your face. Do you really still think you're some kind of hero? But he soon realized something wasn't quite right. How come he could still stick his tongue out to lap up the tears? The doctor said he'd lost the ability to move his tongue a while ago. Now the only use for it was letting it slide easily down his esophagus, blocking his respiratory tract. He'd become one of the few geniuses to commit suicide by swallowed tongue. Later he found that it was becoming easier to open his eyes. His line of vision opened up, his eyesight becoming sharper than it had been even before he had contracted this disease. The view before his eyes was bright and clear, and he saw something made of bamboo right in front of him. Dot. Fan Shen, dumbfounded, separated the bamboo rods and found himself facing an astonishing sight, a dozen or so figures stood, menacing and clothed in black from head to toe. Each of them held something sharp in their hands, and raising it in the air, they hacked away at themselves. For a moment, he couldn't be sure if this was a dream or some strange near-death experience. Instinctively, he drew his head back and threw his hands in front of his face, acting as any normal person would in such a situation like an ostrich burying its head in the sand. Ha 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 ha. The sound of endless tittering filled the air. It was followed by a great chorus of melancholy groans, and finally, silence. After a moment, Fan Shen felt a sense of unease. He cautiously separated two of the fingers on the hand he was hiding behind, covertly looking through the gap. A bamboo basket lay in front of him, dividing the space before his eyes into strips, and through the holes. He could clearly see a dozen or so corpses lying on the ground, blood pouring onto the floor, the stench of it filling the air. He saw it all too clearly, and the terror rendered him temporarily unable to move. But soon after, he suddenly thought about his own hands. Could they move now? Had he really recovered? What the hell had he just seen? Was it a dream? If he awoke, 
would he find himself lying in his bed, unable to move, awaiting death once more? If that were the case, he might as well never wake up. At least his hands could move, at least his eyes could blink. The thought saddened him, and he wiped his wet face with his hand. He took his hand away and looked at it. It was covered in blood. The liquid that had dripped from the corner of his eye had been someone else's blood splashing onto his face. Fan Shen stared blankly at his hands his heart pounding. These aren't my hands. In front of him was a pair of delicate and beautiful hands, covered in blood. They looked like flowers blooming in a slaughterhouse. They certainly weren't the hands of an adult. He was overwhelmed by the shock of it. His consciousness adrift in crashing waves, he could only stare blankly, filled with endless doubt as terror gripped his entire being. Dot. It was the King Kingdom's 57th year and there was still no end to the Emperor's battle campaign against the Western Barbarians. Councanen rode alongside the army, while the Empress Dowager and the Council of Elders governed in the capital. On this day, there had been a fire at the Ping Courtyard, located on the outskirts of the capital, on the banks of the Liujing River. A group of killers prowled the night, taking advantage of the blaze and rushing into homes, slaughtering everyone in sight in a horrific massacre. A young servant in the courtyard fought back while carrying his young master as he was chased by a group of killers in dark clothing. The two sides fought by the southern gate of the city walls. The ambushing warriors had not expected this physically disadvantaged youth to possess such unfathomable strength, and after reaching a hill, they came across reinforcements, reinforcements whose identity made their blood run cold. The Black Knights the fearsome killers cried out as they fell in their own blood, pierced through by crossbow arrows. The reinforcements rode on horseback, clad in black armor and enshrouded in moonlight, as if emitting the faint glow of soul eaters. Each of them had only their standard military issue crossbow, but in a volley of shots, they had taken down most of the killers. Shielded in the midst of the cavalry was a middle-aged man sitting in a carriage. His complexion was pale and a sparse beard grew upon his chin. He looked at the young man carrying the child upon his back, nodded, then clapped his hands gently. That clap was the signal to attack. A squad split off from the cavalry, and like a reaper's scythe in the night, they charged relentlessly into the bloody fray, laying waste to the rank of killers. Suddenly, a sorcerer emerged from amongst the killers, lifting his staff. He began to chant an incantation. They all felt the rumbling of some unspeakable force gathering on the hills. The man in the carriage frowned slightly, but he did not move. From his side, a shadow leapt out into the night sky, soaring upward like an eagle. With a crunching sound, the sorcerer's chanting stopped, and his head was wrenched violently upward from off his shoulders, his blood spilling like a shower of rain. The man in the carriage shook his head. These sorcerers from the West just don't understand, he said. In the face of true strength, magic is about as useful as a minister's riding brush. Dozens of cold as steel riders made sure the perimeter was clear, clenching their right fists in a gesture to signal to the others that the killers had been completely vanquished. The ranks of the cavalry split, and the carriage slowly rolled forward coming face to face with the young servant. With the aid of his subordinates, the man moved from the carriage into a wheelchair, his legs too damaged to walk. He pushed himself along, unhurriedly approaching the epicenter of the battleground, while the young servant remained straight as a ramrod. Looking at the bamboo basket on the young man's back, the wheelchair-bound man's pale face turned red, finally betraying some hint of color. At last, you've made it he said. The face of the young man, carrying the basket on his back, was covered by a strip of black cloth. In his hand he held a black iron, dagger-like chisel, the blood dripping slowly from its point. He was surrounded by the corpses of his ambushers, their throats covered in blood and what seemed to have been the deadly blow. I need you to give me an explanation for this. His eyes covered with black cloth, he spoke coldly his voice untrembling and without a trace of emotion. The wheelchair-bound man's pitying look at once turned conspiratorial. Naturally, I'll give you an explanation, he said, but I also need to give one to your master. The young servant nodded, and got ready to leave. Where are you taking this child? The middle-aged man said coldly, sitting on the wheelchair. You're blind, 
mind you, don't tell me you're making young master wander the world with you. This is the young lady's flesh and blood. That's the master's flesh and blood too. The middle-aged man in the wheelchair continued coldly. I guarantee that I'll find a very safe place for young master here in the capital. The other man shook his head and stretched the black strip of cloth on his face. The middle-aged man in the wheelchair knew this boy would listen to no one but that young lady. He couldn't be given orders, not even by his own master. Sighing, the man reasoned, everything going on in the capital will be taken care of once the master comes back. So why must you take him away? I do not trust your master. The middle-aged man furrowed his eyebrows slightly, as if disgusted by what he just heard. He paused for a brief moment, then said, A young child has to nurse, to learn words, can you provide those things? He laughed mockingly. You, blind man, what can you do other than murder? The other man didn't get angry merely nudging the bamboo basket on his back. You two seem only capable of slaughter, cripple. The middle-aged man let out a chilling laugh. This time it was only those high-class noblemen in the capital. After the master comes back, I will naturally start cleaning them up. The blind youth shook his head. The middle-aged man lightly massaged his wheelchair with his hand, as if guessing what it was the other feared. A moment later, he frowned. I know what you're afraid of, but in this earthly world, only the child's father can protect him. Is there anyone else with the power to help him escape such a nameless danger? The blind youth suddenly spoke, his voice still emotionless. A new identity, a new life left in peace. The middle-aged man thought for a moment, then nodded with a smile. Where is the place? Danzuport. The master's mother is currently living there. After some silence, the blind youth finally accepted this arrangement. The middle-aged man, smiling rolled his wheelchair around and behind the blind youth. He then reached out and picked up the child in the bamboo basket. Looking at the child's cute face, which was delicate and snow white, he sighed. He really does take after his mother. So beautiful. He suddenly laughed out loud. This little thing is sure to grow up and make a name for himself. His subordinates, who had been standing far away in silence, suddenly heard their superior let out such joyous laughter. While their expression remained unchanged, deep down, it shook them to their core. They had no idea how important this child was, huh? The blind youth tilted his head and took the child back. Although he was more innocent than regular humans, he still didn't want the baby's face getting too close to the hands of this venomous serpent while at the same time using one syllable to express his question out of polite courtesy. The middle-aged man smiled, looking at the child's face. There was something indescribable and terrifying in that smile. He is only two months old, and yet he wiped away the blood on his face. Having experienced tonight's scary events, he is sound asleep. Just goes to show. Suddenly he lowered his voice, making sure not even his subordinates could hear what he said next. He is the child of the Tan Mei. That middle-aged man held tremendous power in the capital, his methods cruel and without equal. Any law-breaking official who ended up in his hands would spit out the truth in no more than two days. His gaze was even more sinister, but as extraordinary as he was caught, not even he realized that the child wasn't soundly asleep, but had instead fainted from fright. Dot. Tan Mei, Tian refers to the heavens whereas Mai refers to the bloodline. Tan Mei, then, describes the heavenly bloodline left in the human world, a bloodline which, according to the legends of this world, awakened in the human world every few hundred years. This bloodline could manifest through unyielding and overpowering combative strength, such as that belonging to the general from the distant ancient country of Naz. During a historically critical moment, one in which his country was on the verge of perishing at the hands of barbarians, he assassinated much of the original barbarian congress using his courage and vigorous combat capabilities. Then there were those Tan Mei who showed exceptional talent in areas like heart or wisdom, such as a couple from West, Bor the scholar and his playwright wife, Fabo, both of whom died 300 years ago. Of course, Nobody could prove that the reason the bloodline remained in the human world was because of heaven's concern for the suffering and pain of humans, though in truth, these beings brought much more than peace to the human world. Furthermore, 
all Tan May I vanished without a trace, neither a person nor country could find a clue as to their whereabouts. They disappeared as suddenly as they came, leaving only obscure records, though nothing that could prove their existence. Coincidentally, the middle-aged man in the wheelchair was one of the very few people who knew that this rare phenomenon truly existed. For some unknown reason, after Fan Shen died, his soul came to this world and remarkably into the body of a baby, whose father or mother turned out to be Tan Mei who surfaced on the mainland. By dawn, the battlefield had been cleared, and the carriage slowly moved along the stone road towards the east. Behind the carriage was the bizarre scene of a team of cavalry clad in black and a sickly pale middle-aged man in a wheelchair. The carriage went over a rock, the sudden motion awakening the sleeping baby who had been lying on the silk cushion. The baby's eyes soullessly looked away from his savior's face and towards the front of the carriage, his line of vision unlike that of any other baby, it was crystal clear but unable to focus, and there was a strange and indescribable to it feeling as well. Not one person knew that the soft and fragile body of the baby accommodated a soul from a different world. Eyes were on the scenery when the curtains of the carriage lifted a breeze passing by and revealing a corner view of green mountains and the retreating stone path in the distance, like an endless display that kept on rewinding. In front of the carriage, a blind boy held tightly to his iron rod, his eyes covered by a black cloth thank blanketed both his eyes and the day. Chapter 2, Story Time Danzu Harbor lay to the east of the state of King, near the sea. Since the recent completion of the ports in the south, and with the sea route to the west that was opened up early on, the state's center of trade had moved south. As a result, Danzu Harbor was gradually forgotten. The formerly bustling port had quieted down years ago. Seagulls flew freely, no longer harassed by annoying sailors. The local residents of Danzu Harbor, on the other hand, had not experienced much change in their lives. Although their income had decreased, the emperor had been exempting them from paying taxes for years, and they continued to lead comfortable lives. Not to mention that the seaport was very beautiful and, now quiet, it naturally became more livable. Once in a while, some big name would come to Danzu Harbor and build a manor. However, as it was so far from the imperial capital, few of the officials really settled down there. Perhaps only the old lady who lived in the house to the west of the city could be counted as one. It was said that the old lady was the mother of Count Sinan, and moved to Danzu Harbor in her retirement. Everyone in the city knew that Count Sinan was favored by His Majesty. He was never dispatched in accordance with normal practice, but stayed in the imperial capital and worked with the Treasury Department. So, most residents showed sufficient politeness and respect to the house. Children, however, did not understand these things. It was a sunny day. The adults were sitting in the pub, enjoying the salty moisture carried in by the sea breeze, eating burned plums and drinking liquor from goblets. A crowd of teenagers surrounded the stone steps outside the back door of Count Sinan's estate in the western part of the city. Approaching them, a funny scene would be revealed as the teens were listening to a small kid of four or five years old. The small boy was adorable, with eyebrows that seemed painted on and a pair of bright eyes. Though his voice was childish, the tone of his speech was as mature as an adult. Heaving a sigh, he made a gesture with his small arms and continued. Truman walked toward the wall and found a ladder. He climbed the ladder, step by step and found a door. He pushed the door open and went out. And then, and then, then dot he was free again, the small kid pouted, appearing impatient that the teens would ask such a basic question. You must be kidding. Why didn't he dot that Chris? Kristoff, interrupted another teen. Yes. Why didn't Truman beat up Kristoff to vent his anger? He had been imprisoned for years. The small kid shrugged and said, no. Hush. So boring. Young master fans yawn. Today's story is not as interesting as the one from a couple days ago. Then, what kind of stories do you like? An ethereal journey. A great epic. Hush. Said the small kid called Fans Jan, extending his middle finger at the bigger teens around him. He admonished, fighting and killing are unhealthy, digging all over for treasure makes nature unwell. Suddenly, a furious shout came from the courtyard, young master. Where are you? Imitating his gesture, 
All the teens flashed their middle fingers, a most spectacular sight because of the large number of kids. They made a collective hush and ran away with laughter. The small child, Fans Yan, stood up from the stone steps, patted the dust off his rear, turned around, and ran into the courtyard. Before he closed the door, he glanced with his clever eyes at the young, blind boss of the grocery store across from the house, displaying a complexity of emotion that did not match his age. He then gently closed the door. It had been four years since Fan Shen had came to this world. During that time, he gradually came to the realization that he was not dreaming. He truly did arrive in an unknown world. In some ways, this world appeared the same as the one he remembered, but in others, it was not the same at all. Overhearing the gossip of the servants in the Count estate, he had finally deciphered his identity. He was the bastard son of the capital's Count Sinan. In stereotypical stories of rich and powerful families, a bastard son was easily hated and persecuted by the wife and concubines. His honorable father, who had no real power, seems to have had only one son. To carry on the family lineage, Fan Shen was sent to Danzu Harbor far away from the capital. Over the years, he had become accustomed to his identity. Still, the soul of an adult trapped in the body of a child has to withstand experiences completely different both physically and psychologically. A normal person would probably go insane. Luckily, in his previous life, Fan Shen was bedridden for many years due to a neuromuscular disease called myasthenia gravis. Compared with his miserable former life, the slight difficulty in moving now was nothing at all. Though living in the body of a child, he had adapted well to his current life. What he was most unaccustomed to was his name. At the age of one, the Count sent a letter and gave him the name Fans Yan and the style name Anzai. It was not a good name. In the dialect of his home down, it sounded like a curse, meaning freak. His form being that of a mere baby at the time, he had no way to express his opposition using words. At the start of his hospital treatment in his former life, Fan Shen could move his head. He often begged the cute nurse to buy him pirated DVDs and books. Living in the Count's home, he learned that the Countess was a kind woman with a reputation for coldness. In fact, she cared for Fan's Yan very much. The servants never treated him differently for being born a bastard. However, he was still upset because he could not communicate with anyone. How could he tell the servant girls that he came from another world? How could he tell his teacher that he could read every character in his books? So, he often snuck out the side door to play with the non-royal children. Much of the time, he regaled them with stories from the movies and novels of his home world. It seemed that he wanted to remind himself of something. He wanted to remind himself that he did not belong to this world. In the other world, he had movies, internet and porn. He didn't know why he told the kids about the Truman Show today. With its unsuspecting plot and without the charming Jim Carrey, he should have known that the youth of Danzu Harbor would not like it at all. But he told the story anyway. Deep in his heart, he felt his situation to be ridiculous, why would he suddenly, so close to death, be reborn in this new body? He couldn't help but think of that movie. Maybe the people on the streets and the seagulls in the sky were props. Just like the Truman Show, Truman finally realized that his reality was fake. He resolutely sailed until his boat punctured the wall of the dome, and he found an exit door. But Fan Shen, no, Fan's yawn knew that he was not Truman. This world was real, not some huge movie set. So he found himself telling stories every day to remind himself that he belonged to another world. How ridiculous it all was. Chapter 3, The Nameless Yellow Book. The one good thing about being reborn would probably be having four limbs that one could be active with. Xian was grateful for this fact. It would be difficult for people who never experienced the kind of disease he had to feel the sort of happiness he felt. He took comfort in the fact that this was perhaps God's gift to him. It took him four years to finally figure it out, since he had an opportunity to live again, why not make the most of it? If God had blessed him with this new life and he had wasted it, wouldn't that dishonor God? Since he could move now. Why not move even more? All the servants of the Count's house knew that this young master, born of a concubine, was an extremely active child. Young master, we're begging you. Please, 
calm down. It was during that moment that fans Jan was sitting at the very top of the fake mountain in the courtyard, smiling as he looked out toward the distant sea. To the maids, it was clear that a four-year-old boy who climbed such heights and smiled with such maturity was insane. Gradually, more people gathered around the fake mountain, with seven or eight servants eventually forming a hasty circle around the mountain. Although Count Sinan was appreciated by the emperor, he did not earn a lot of money and was of low-ranking nobility. Even if he did earn a lot of money, he couldn't possibly spend it all on his mother and illegitimate child. That's why there were so few servants in the Count's home. Fans Jan looked down from the fake mountains at the faces of the panicking servants and could not help but sigh. He obediently climbed down. It was only a bit of exercise. Why all the fuss? The servants were used to the peculiar maturity with which the young master spoke, and so simply ignored the cork as they took him away to his shower. After washing fans yawn until his lips were bright red, his teeth sparkling white, his body smooth and smelling good, the maid held him up and smiled whilst rubbing his cheeks, laughing as she said, Young master looks exactly like a little girl. I wonder what lucky lady will be blessed with you in the future. Fan Xian naively did not reply, as he wasn't the kind to use a four-year-old's mouth to flirt with a maid in her teens, he refused to do something so tasteless that he would wait until he was six to take on such a challenging task. Time to sleep, kid. The maid patted the little boy's bottom. All of the servants found it odd that despite the young master's age, he was already developing an unruly attitude and yet at the same time, he maintained the self-discipline and diligence of a grown man. Like during his nap times, those that had a normal childhood would remember how they had to fight with demons who would try forcing them to sleep during a sunny afternoon. One knew these demons by the name of mom, dad, or even their teachers. But young master fans Jan never needed anyone to force him to sleep. Every day at noon, he would put on his cutest most innocent smiling face and returned to his bedroom obediently to sleep, never making a single sound. The old lady did not believe it at first, often shouting at the maids to keep an eye on him. She thought that the boy was using sleep as an excuse to mess around and play on the bed. However, after keeping an eye on him for half a year, she realized that the boy was indeed sleeping, dead to the world and often difficult to wake up, even when shouting at him. From then on, the maids didn't pay much attention, and just kept guard outside his room. It was summer, so naturally the maids were tired, their bodies tilting to the side. The small fans in their hands moved softly, and occasionally, a firefly would dance in the wind created by the fan. Dot. Back in the bedroom, fans Jan climbed onto his bed and uncovered the mat, carefully retrieving a book that he had hidden. The cover of the book was a light yellow and it was showing its age. There was not a single word on the cover, but the borders were embroidered using unknown motifs. These motifs curled on their final stroke, like clouds or the wide sleeves of ancient clothing. He gently opened the book to page 7, which showed the illustration of a man. A part of the man's body was obscured by red lines, and even though the boy couldn't discern what paint the red lines were made with, they created an illusion that made them seem as though they were slowly moving in some direction. Fans Jan sighed, he looked for on the outside, and he had to be careful not to reveal his true self. Fortunately, he had the book to pass the time with. The book was given to him by a blind youth named Wuzhu when he was very little. Fans Jan had always thought of the young blind man, who was a servant of his mother in this world. Trapped in the body of the baby. He had lain in the arms of the blind young man while traveling from the city to the port. Perhaps the young man did not anticipate a baby remembering anything, but as Fans Yan was not an ignorant baby on their travels together, he could tell that the young man truly cared for the toddler with all his heart. For some unknown reason, the young man left after dropping him off at the Duke's no matter how the old lady had persuaded him to stay before he had left. He placed the book next to the baby. Fans Jan always had suspicions about the situation. Did the servant have no reservations about him learning on his own? After some thought, he realized that the reason was because he was still a baby at the time, and it would have been thought impossible for him to recognize the words, so naturally there was no problem. However, 
fans Jan could read the text of this world, and after the dramatic change that had happened to him, he believed, without a doubt, in the existence of gods and devils. He was even more certain that the book looked exactly like a prop on a Hong Kong wireless television drama, some kind of spiritual training to Zenki. 1. It was a shame that there was no name to the book, otherwise he would have been out on the streets asking the neighborhood kids if this Zenki spiritual training method was any good. Thinking of this, fans Yang laughed out loud. Since God let him relive his life, he was going to treasure this opportunity. Nayagong, too, was something good that did not exist in his world, and even if this nameless spiritual training method on Zenki had been a bunch of nonsense, it didn't stop him from starting to practice with it at the age of one. It wasn't far off from starting practice in the womb, and you couldn't get any earlier than that. No one born in this world, not even the masters worshipped by the people, not even if they were geniuses, could be on the same level as Fan Zhan, who started Zenki training at such young age. What was it called? This is the early birds getting the worms, this is stupid birds flying first. In any case, surely he would not be as stupid as kids who got their first glimpse at martial arts, right? While Fan Zhan was thinking about this, he could already feel the Zenki flowing. It slowly circulated the lines of the drawings in the book and flowed into his body. This was an extremely soothing sensation, as if warm water was cleansing every inch of his body and organs. Gradually, Fans Yan fell into meditative state and comfortably slept on his bed. 1. Essential Qi 2. Exercises to benefit the internal organs, the art of building up one's strength through breathing and other exercises of the internal organs. Chapter 4, Practice and Study In Truth Fans Yan did not know that he was practicing a profound spiritual art. If he had become a soldier, he would train carefully, practicing with utmost caution, and ask for the aid of a teacher or the watchful eye of a trustworthy friend. The most dangerous aspect of this practice was in the fundamentals. When accumulating one's qi in the Danshan and Xushan, the pubic region and the cockects, an enormous discrepancy will arise between the reaction speed of the practitioner's body and spirit. The most direct consequence of this is the immobilization of the practitioner's bodily functions, which will leave them in a vegetative state. When this happens, the inexperienced practitioner may falsely believe that they have lost control of their senses, and forcibly channel Zanke into the organs. If they are both fortunate and exceptionally strong, they may be able to redirect the body's scattered Zenki into the meridians, but this will all be for naught. If this happens to a novice, they may begin to panic, and this may lead to actual demonic possession. Though also a novice, Fans Yan could not only kept control of his senses, but was able to comprehend this mysterious feeling with more ease than some of the strongest practitioners. This was partly thanks to the experiences of his previous life and partly thanks to luck. When he had begun to practice manipulating this obscure Zanke force, his new body was that of an infant. The innate energy he had drawn from his mother's body had not yet completely returned to the world, it remained within him. Thus, his training advanced effortlessly so that, miraculously, a great part of this innate Zanke remained in his meridians. Consequently, those obstacles which are most likely to stump the average practitioner were no trouble for Fan Zhan. In his previous life, Fan Zhan's illness confined him to his sick bed for a number of years, and he was long accustomed to his brain having no command over his body. So when he first encountered this situation, he did not panic, but instead felt the warmth of the memories of his past. Thus, during his first attempt at practice, just as he became vaguely aware of his qi, it dispersed. When this left him paralyzed, he remained unafraid. It was exactly his absence of fear which kept his mind clear and undisturbed, allowing him to easily surmount this most challenging of obstacles. From that point on, his practice became easier. He needed only to contemplate the secrets of the art, and he would enter a meditative state. This helped fans yawn sleep soundly throughout his daily nap 
even thunder did not wake him. Most practitioners found it difficult to enter such a state because it was largely reliant on chance and coincidence. To be able to meditate during one's daily nap like this child did was an indescribable luxury. Heaven truly smiled upon him. Dot. As soon as he awoke, he found his cute little face writhing against a towel held by the servant girl who washed him. In the afternoon, he began to study in the library under the tutor whom the Count had specially invited from the Eastern Sea to teach him. This tutor was not particularly old by any means, no more than thirty. Yet his body gave off the decrepit odor of someone much older. Literary culture had greatly improved across the state of King over the past decade. And ever since the publication of the scholar who she's discussion on literary reformation, battle lines had been drawn between old language and new language. The so-called old language was what fans Yan remembered to be classical Chinese, while new language was similar to written vernacular Chinese, though perhaps a bit more refined. Fans Yan's tutor was an ardent classicist, and so fans Yan spent every day poring over one classic text or another. Although these classics were rather different from the four books and five classics, the classical literary canon of fans Yan's world, they were astoundingly similar in moral content, and even featured the same schism as that between Confucianism, Mohism, Legalism, and Taoism. When he had his first lesson, fans Yan started wondering just where he actually was. It was a stuffy summer and the humidity hung in the air of the library. The tutor opened the south-facing window and the crying of the cicadas carried by the cool, refreshing breeze penetrated the room. He turned around and saw his young pupil slumped over the table, lost in thought. He was about to summon up some words of rebuke, but somehow lost the metal to do so when he looked upon his charge's fair, gentle face. In truth, he quite admired the boy. Though young, he spoke eloquently and knew quite a bit about what their forebears had written on virtue. For a four-year-old urchin, it was really quite impressive. The tutor also had doubts. Count Sinan seemed so anxious, and the demands in his letter had been so great that he felt forced to obey. Now he had to begin teaching the scriptures to this young child. If it were any ordinary person, they'd only be studying a few characters at that age. Pure stuff, really. At the end of the lesson, fans Jan politely saluted his teacher and respectfully waited for him to leave the library. Then he shed his outer layer of clothing, already drenched with sweat, and ran out of the library. The anxious servant girl followed, rushing after him shouting, Be careful. He stopped when he reached the courtyard and a silly, innocent smile spread across his face. Like a little adult, he swaggered into the room and, upon seeing the old lady sitting in the center, yelled out sweetly, Nay nay. 1. The old woman smiled kindly, the deep wrinkles on her face showing her age. Only occasionally, her eyes would flash in a way that let people know that this was no ordinary old lady. It was said that Count Sinan owed everything he had to this woman's presence in the capital. And what did you learn today? Fans Jan stood politely in front of her chair and told her everything he learned from his tutor that day. After saluting her, he went to the side courtyard to eat with his younger sister. The relationship between the old lady and her grandson was a strange one, perhaps because Fans Yan was an illegitimate child. Though the old woman never mistreated him, she expected a lot from him, so there was always a slight feeling of distance. Fans Yan remembered this old lady cradling him as he cried when he was just a newborn. She could never have imagined that a newborn baby could understand what she said to him let alone remember it so deeply. My child, it's okay if you want to blame your father for this. Poor little one, just born, and your mother's no longer with us. Dot. History. This was perhaps the biggest question on fans Jan's mind. The moment he arrived in this world, he witnessed a murder. He knew that his father was Count Sinan, whose face he had never laid eyes on, but who was his mother. That year, Count Sinan had followed the Emperor's army on his expedition to the west, and the murderers had came to kill Fans Yan's mother. His body was home to a soul that had come from another world, so he could never feel any sort of filial emotion toward the Count. But, from time to time, he thought of that long-dead woman whom he called Mother. One, Nanai, or Grandma, 
referring specifically to one's fraternal grandmother. Chapter 5 the nocturnal visitor. What are you thinking about? As the two servant girls were serving food, the young girl sitting next to Fans Yan asked, pouting. Her skin was slightly ashy and she was somewhat skinny, so she looked rather pitiful sitting next to the fair and genteel Fans Yan. Fans Yan stretched out his hand and stroked her downy hair, chuckling. I was wondering what you usually eat when you're in the capital. This little girl, even younger than Fans Yan, was Ra or Yuo, Count Sunan's daughter and Fans Yan's half-sister. She was such a sickly child, and the Countess felt sorry for her granddaughter, so the girl had been brought to Danzu the previous year to recuperate. Though she had been coalescing for nearly a year, it had no noticeable effect, her hair remained wispy and thin. In a noble family such as the Count's, there was no shortage of food, so it couldn't have been malnutrition, it was likely a natural debility. Fans Yan and the young girl got along very well. Although he saw himself as being something of an uncle to her, he was really there to provide company. He often took her out to play and told her stories. In the eyes of onlookers, however, this was evidence of their deep sibling bond. It was Fans Yan's status as a bastard that caused some awkwardness. It wasn't proper to compare him to the Count's legitimate daughter. So the servant girls took pains not to bring up the Count's business in the capital. She answered her brother's question earnestly, twiddling her fingers, telling him of all the things she ate when she was in the capital. But as she began to list them, it seemed that all she could think of were candied hawthorn fruits and little doe figurines. By the time they had finished eating, it was late. The sun had sunk halfway beneath the horizon and dense crepuscule enveloped the courtyard. Raw or you oh? You're such a weakling. Stop being mean. Okay, what story do you want to hear today? Snow White. Fans Yan smiled. He was lucky nobody else was around, because it would be most unsettling to happen upon this four-year-old boy smiling that wicked smile that only adults are capable of. How about I tell you a ghost story? No. Horrified, Ra or Yuo shook her head vehemently her ashen cheeks suddenly damp with tears. It was clear that over the past year she'd already suffered enough ghost stories. Dot. Tormenting young girls was one of Fans Yan's vices. He was an expert at menacing the servant girls, and often told them ghost stories which would incite incessant shrieking and leave them huddled together in bed, trembling. Though he couldn't tease them verbally, lest he arouse suspicion, he still enjoyed their soft, perfumed embraces. He reassured himself that he was still a child and needed physical contact. There was nothing shameful about it, it was a natural desire. And whenever the servant girls got curious, the young master is still so little, how does he know so many scary stories? Fans Yan placed the blame squarely on his tutor. And so the servant girls came to look on the tutor with mistrust. Count Sinan spent so much money bringing him here to teach the young master and he spends all his time telling ghost stories, scaring the life out of the poor little lad and scaring us girls half to death, what an awful man. After wrapping up the last ghost story, two of the servant girls were frightened senseless. They washed the young master and tucked him into bed. It seemed like a normal night. Fans Yan rested his head upon the hard porcelain pillow, then went to his wardrobe and brought out a winter robe. He folded it up into a rectangle and used it as a pillow. He rested against the pillow, but his eyes stayed wide open. The dark night shimmered. He couldn't get to sleep. Even though he had came to accept many things about his reincarnation into this world, there was still one thing he couldn't get used to, that he had to be asleep by 9 o'clock in the evening. He'd spent enough time sleeping on his sickbed in his past life. He felt along the surface of the bed and discovered a nook where he would not be seen. He relaxed and, naturally, his zinky began to slowly flow. He soon entered a meditative state. A moment before he entered this state of emptiness, Fan Xian wondered, how should I live in this world? Just how should he spend the decades ahead of him? He was just about to drift off into the harem reveries that he had conjured up so many times in his former vegetative state when he was woken by an unexpected guest. Dot. Are you fans Yan? There was someone at the foot of his bed with icy cold eyes and unusually brown pupils. With just one look, fans Yan knew that this was not a benevolent visitor. It was a polite enough question 
but when asked in the middle of the night by someone who had snuck into one's room, face concealed, dagger in hand, and with small bags tied about the waist, it was a somewhat disconcerting one. Fortunately, Fans Yan was not a normal four-year-old boy, if he were, he would have cried out upon seeing this strange man. He was also acutely aware that a visitor who could so stealthily infiltrate the Count's estate was a man of great means and little mercy. If he were to cry out, he would certainly be killed. Thinking this over, Fans Yan couldn't help but feel some pride in the fact that, even in the face of death, his cognitive skills remained sharp. He coughed twice trying to keep the fear in his heart from bursting forth. Disguised as this adorable young boy, he pounced. Dot. Papa, you're finally back. Eyes brimming with tears, the four-year-old boy threw himself into the embrace of this would-be murderer, his arms clutching his waist. Yet the child's arms were too short, so he could only grasp onto his clothing as if he feared the man would run away. Perhaps he had grasped too firmly. With a rip. The boy tore a strip from the man's clothing. The night visitor furrowed his brow. He couldn't figure out how to react, so he tore himself away from Fans Yan's embrace and stood there dumbfounded. He seemed to be trying to figure out why Count Sinan's bastard child would call him Papa. He was perplexed. His clothing was made from the finest materials, even a blade should have trouble tearing it. How did this young child rip it with his bare hands? Yet Fans Yan was even more puzzled than the man. When he was all alone, he had used his time in the rock garden to test the power of his Zenki on the stones. When he discovered that his slender little fingers could just barely crush softer stones, such as turquoise, he developed confidence in his capability for self-defense. Fans Yan had managed to use the distraction of his childish tears to get his opponent to let down his guard. He focused all his strength into his fingers, fully expecting to be able to stop his assailant in his tracks. He hadn't expected that he'd only tear away some clothing. It seemed like something serious was about to happen. Chapter 6, The Pillow Although Fans Yan was only four years old physically, he carried a grown man's soul within him. The bloodshed that had surrounded him on the day of his birth into this world was imprinted upon his mind and had always weighed upon him heavily. He knew that one day, his own mysterious past would catch up with him. It seemed that today was that day. His sneak attack had not been successful. His pathetic tears, intended to confuse this unexpected visitor were of no use now. He quickly racked his brains in search of a means of escape. If he cried out, his assailant would make short work of him. Currently, the man wasn't moving, he was clearly still confused by Fans Yan crying out Papa. Seeing that his sneak attack had been ineffective, Fans Yan decided to rely on the innate advantage of his youth. He looked up into the visitor's eyes and wailed, Papa, Papa, as tears streamed down his face. He nervously continued to plot his escape. It's no use pretending, young master fan. The visitor's tone was indifferent, and yet seemingly without a trace of menace. You're a smart one, it seems. Quite an instinct for self-preservation for one so young. But it should be quite obvious to you that I am not Kautzenen. The night visitor gestured with the knife in his hand and then moved toward Fans Yan. Fans Yan's face remained streaked with perfectly innocent tears. But his heart pounded. Who are you? He sobbed fitfully. Your father sent me to find you, so don't scream. The night visitor's eyes were tiny, brown, and not particularly pleasant to look upon. The wrinkles in the corners betrayed his age, and his manner of speaking reminded fans yawn of dirty old men who tried to trick the young servant girls into relinquishing their maidenhood. But fans yawn didn't give anything away and he perfectly played the role of a frightened child, startled and slightly angered. You're not my papa. Then, as if he hadn't seen the knife in his assailant's hand, he turned tail and climbed up on the bed, grumbling. I don't even know what my papa looks like. The man laughed darkly, advancing toward the bed. Suddenly, turning around and looking behind the visitor, Xian's eyes flashed with surprise as he shouted out, Mama. Dot. It wasn't exactly a great diversion. He would have not been fooled had anyone else tried it. After all, the night visitor was a great master who owned an entire laboratory in the capital. But as he had no reason to suspect this young boy of trickery, 
The night visitor believed him when he heard his cry out Mama. The night visitor's face betrayed a look of shock as he whipped his head around to look. Of course, behind him was only a tightly closed door and the deep dark night. A thwack echoed throughout the bedroom. His head covered in blood, the man fell to the floor. In his hand, Fans Yan held a chunk of the porcelain pillow. Still rattled, Fans Yan looked down at the man gripping the severed chunk of porcelain tightly. He gritted his teeth, raised his arm, and brought it down full force upon his attacker's head. There was a sickening thud. Despite the fact that this night visitor was a grand master, he'd be out of it for a while thanks to the blow from that pillow. Dot. A servant girl's voice arose from outside. What was that? It was nothing. I dropped a cup. We'll clear it up tomorrow. Tomorrow? If young master steps on it. Then what will we do? I said we'll deal with it tomorrow. Hearing such a forceful response from the usually gentle and innocent young lad, the servant girl decided not to press the matter. Fan Xian went back to one side of the wardrobe, and with some difficulty, pulled out a heavy winter quilt. He tore it up into strips with his fingers, twisted it, and securely tied up the man who lay on the floor. At this point, he discovered that his back was soaked in cold sweat. A sudden fear gripped him. This was the first time he'd ever tried to kill someone, in either his previous life or this one. He wasn't sure whether he'd actually killed the man or not, but he'd taken a great risk. If this man was a skilled fighter, then Fan's Yan's own little life would have undoubtedly been snuffed out. Passing his hand over the night visitor's cloth-covered face. He found that he was still breathing. He wasn't sure why, but he suddenly got it in his head that he should do his visitor in for good. He shivered. It seemed he had become so hard-hearted after his rebirth. He was almost ready to do something so heartless, without even the slightest hesitation. He was unaware that deep within his heart, he saw himself as someone who had already died once. His rebirth in this world was a particularly precious gift and he would not allow anyone to threaten his life. It was a simple principle, just as one can only realize the strength of wine after one gets drunk, one can only know the value of life after one has died. Gripping the knife in his hand, he pondered. He still wasn't sure whether he should kill this nighttime visitor who lay on the floor. Suddenly, he thought of someone, and a smile crept across his face. Quietly, he pushed open the door and crawling through a hole that the dogs used to come in and out, he came to the shop that stood on the street corner outside the Count's compound. Dot. Tab tab tap. He knocked gently on the shop store, his voice low so that no one else in Danzu could hear him in the night. But fans Yan knew that the person inside would hear the knocking. Although he pretended not to know him for the past four years, when things came to a head, Fans Yan thought of him as the only person he could trust. Who is it? The vendor's dull and emotionless voice came from the shop. Fans Yan wondered if this man really was the same as he was outside the capital years ago, meticulous in all his affairs. He rolled his eyes, and in a quiet voice he responded, It's Fans Yan. Sure enough, the wooden shop door opened without a sound, and the blind youngster stood at the doorway like a ghost. Startling him, Fans Yan looked at the person who had brought him to Danzu Harbor. He looked at this man with, with cheeks that seemed untouched by time these past four years and eyes covered by a length of black cloth, and he couldn't help but wonder, how was it that this man hadn't aged at all? Chapter 7 The Guest With an unconscious assassin lying on his floor, he had little time to ask questions. Someone came to kill me, he said. Getting straight to the point, I knocked him unconscious and he's lying on my floor. The blind youngster cocked his head slightly. His heart skipped a beat, but his face didn't move an inch. He bowed his head courteously. Young Master Fan, what on earth are you talking about? There's no time to pretend. You know who I am. Fan's young laughed. No matter what, he'd always pretend he didn't know him. Pulling the blind boy along by the hand. He tried to lead him back to the estate. You're still talking nonsense, young master. The blind boy furrowed his brow. It seemed doubtful that this young child could know his identity. When he had bought Fan's yawn to Danzu, wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
he was no more than a few months old. He shouldn't have been able to remember him. Could the Countess in Count Sinan's mansion have told him who he was? It was the dead of night. In the distance, dogs howled mournfully. Someone in some house had used the wrong door. Wu Zhu's face remained indifferent as he listened to Fan Xian talking beside him. Finally, he closed the door of the shop and made his way over to the Count's compound. Fan Xian let out a relieved sigh and followed, his small strides struggling to keep up. Coming to the Count's house, the two boys squeezed through the dog hole and stood there in the bedroom. Wu Zhu saw the unconscious assassin on the floor. Fan Xian looked at the man. Unsure whether he was alive or dead, Wu Zhu, he asked nervously, Why did you always pretend not to know who I was when I came to your shop? Wu Zhu cocked his head again. He paused for what seemed like a long time before he finally spoke. Young master, you really have amazed me. He was indeed rather taken aback. Even though he knew that the boy standing before him was the lady's child and so would no doubt be an unusual young boy, he would never have expected a four-year-old to be so mature, let alone capable of matching wits with Master F. Let's deal with him first. With great difficulty, Fans Yan had managed to turn the assassin over, and he removed the cloth covering his face, revealing his true identity. His facial features were thin, and he seemed to be getting on in years. The beard on his chin was streaked with flecks of white, but for some reason, there appeared to be a faint green tinge, as if he were ill. Somewhat perturbed, Fans Yan jumped over behind Wu Zhu, and grabbed his sleeve. This assassin doesn't look like a nice guy, he whined. This is Master F, head of the third bureau of the Overwatch Council. Wu Zhu squatted on the floor, feeling the assassin's jawline. He is one of three people known to be masters of the use of poison. He is adept at using it, identifying it and remedying it. For someone as fearsome as this to be struck down by a kid like you, holding a chunk of porcelain pillow, I don't know whether you're extremely lucky or if his luck just ran out. He was unlucky, Fans Yan said quietly to himself. Granted, he was rather astonished to encounter such a powerful figure, but thinking on it, it was much worse luck for such a man to encounter a freakish young boy whose soul came from another world. Don't touch him. He warned Wu Zhu. What if there's poison on his body? Wu Zhu didn't pause, nor did he explain anything, but his determination suggested to Fans Yan that he wanted to show there wasn't a poison out there that could harm him. Fans Yan knitted his brow with a pained expression. Uncle, what do we do about him? He wasn't always of a mature temperament, but in this world, this blind youngster was the first person he had known, and the only person who he dared to trust completely. He knew that he was a powerful warrior, so he made sure to act both cute and deferential, and uncle seemed the best thing to call him. His gaze darted from place to place, and finally fell upon the knife. He gritted his teeth. The best thing to do, he thought, would be to stab this master to death. Sensing his movement, Wu Zhu stood up. You are so different from the lady he said, shaking his head. So young and yet so ruthless. I don't know who taught you to be like that. I learned it myself. Fans Yan didn't dare offend this warrior, not when he was the only person he trusted. Uncle, I know that you've spent all this time in the shop protecting me, and I know that you're worried my mother's enemies could find me because you're here, so you didn't stay in the Count's house. So it's a good thing that I'm a little ruthless. Wu Zhu shook his head again saying nothing. Fan Xian knew that this sworn servant of his mother was beginning to get suspicious. He laughed. Uncle, what do we do next? His meaning was clear. Killing was an area in which Wu Zhu excelled. Wu Zhu's response came as a surprise. Young master, you got the wrong man, he said coldly. Huh? The wrong man? Fan Xian stood dumbfounded, slowly lowering his head to look at the assassin's bloodied face. But either way, we can't stand around doing nothing. Master F is head of the third bureau of the Overwatch Council, Wu Zhu said coolly, but secretly. To be precise, he is a subordinate of a subordinate of your father, so he hasn't come to Danzu to kill you. If he wanted to, I don't think there would be anything you could do about it, you'd already be dead. Fans Yan thought back. The assassin now lying on the ground had said that his father had sent him, but... Dot. Hell. You've become just like D-Bag. Who'd believe this old lech? Dash.
G had been in the Overwatch Council for years. He was now in his 50s, and though he had a reputation as an expert in poisons, the truth of it was he was already semi-retired. If he hadn't had an offer from a powerful person to teach in Danzu, and he'd had the courage to turn it down, he'd never have left the capital. But he didn't expect to be assaulted, left bleeding and close to death the first time he laid eyes on his student. Looking at the cherubic face of this young boy, with his big blinking eyes, he felt a twinge of fear mixed with shame. He knew exactly who this cute little kid was, and it filled him with a sudden anger that he couldn't express. He turned to face a young lad who looked like some kind of servant, ready to take his anger out on him. You, untie me this instant. I am Master F, and the Count has paid a lot of money for my services. The servant appeared to be even more arrogant than he was. He didn't pay any attention to him at all. I don't recall it ever being stated in your bosses and my agreement that you would come teach, he said coolly. Master Wu? G's muddy eyes widened, though they were discolored brown from the use of poison, he could see clearly now who the servant was. Why, it's you. Fans Yan stared at the now awake assassin. This was puzzling indeed. Chapter 8, The Cemetery Fans Yan was perplexed by G. Why would a father care so much about his illegitimate child? Why would he hire a teacher especially for him? If all he needed was someone to teach him to read. Then why did he send for this old weirdo? Fans Yan could see that Fji recognized Wu Zhu. He didn't feel it was right to interrupt their conversation, and so he sat on the bed and played dumb, with a distracted look on his face. Waiting for the masters to explain everything, Fans Yan loosened the bedsheet that he had bound Fji with, then hid behind Wu Zhu giggling, acting the fool. But the two imposing men in front of him were fully aware that he was no ordinary child. Daylight was beginning to break. The sounds of growing roosters and servants boiling water could be heard faintly in the distance. At some point, I'd like you to explain how you know who I am, said Wu Zhu coldly as he led Fji out of the door. Fans Yan's heart skipped a beat. He had no idea how he should explain it. When he traveled the hundreds of miles to Danzu with Wu Zhu four years ago, he was barely a few months old. He racked his brains, but couldn't think of a good excuse. All he could do was blame that strange old man for his frightening intrusion. The city of Danzu had begun to rouse itself awake, but the unremarkable shop showed no signs of being open. Hidden in a secluded room within the shop, Wu Zhu eyed Fji coolly. What is that cripple up to? Fji could be considered a great expert in more ways than one. But faced with the rumored cold-blooded viciousness of the blind youngster, he was nervous. The young master will one day be a grown man, he replied, and he'll face a lot of problems in the capital. The earlier he is prepared for them, the better chance he has of success. Wu Zhu lifted his head to face him, though he knew full well that he was blind. Fji always felt that behind the cloth that covered his face, Wu Zhu was staring at him with murder in his eyes. If you object. Master Wu, he said, I shall return to the capital. I am sure that the master will treat your complaint seriously. Wu Zhu shook his head. I thought the cripple sent you for more than that. It's not that simple. Correct. Wu Zhu was the only one who dared to speak about the master that way, thought Fji. The master has never found the box that the lady left behind, he said, bowing his head as he spoke. He is very worried that someone may find it. And so he has asked that you advise him on the matter, Master Wu. It's no use looking, said Wu Zhu flatly. The lady destroyed it before she passed away. Ji nodded and turned to leave. Stopping, he frowned. There's something odd about the young master. He's only four years old, and yet you've let him study such a powerful form of zinky cultivation. Are you not worried something might happen? What's odd about it? replied Wu Zhu as he stared at the man who was soon to be the young master's teacher, is that I never taught him any Zanki. That'll be your job. Fji rubbed the wound on his head, which was beginning to ache. He had a bad feeling about all this. Forcing a smile, he took his leave. After he had left, Wu Zhu made his way into a secret room within the shop. There in the corner stood a dust-covered box. Though his eyes may have been covered by a length of black cloth, Anyone could have seen that he was deep in thought. Dot. Later that day, a strange man came to the Count's mansion, presenting a card with his name on it, 
he received an audience with the Countess. Somehow, he gained her trust, and was invited to serve as the second tutor for the young master of the Fan household. The servant girls quickly spread this strange news. How could this roguish-looking old man, his head covered in bandages, be qualified to act as tutor for the adorable young master? In the library, Fan Xian needed his tutor's back massaging it with his fists. Considering the ugly business with the porcelain pillow that had transpired the night before, he felt that he had best get back in Masterf's good books as soon as possible. It wasn't my fault, sir. He said in a voice so sweet and childish that even he felt repulsed by it. You had a knife, and I'm just a little boy, so I was scared. I had the knife because I had to pry open the door. Thought G. I just wanted to take a peep at what the fabled bastard child had grown up to look like. How was I to know he suffered from insomnia? It was perhaps an inevitable misunderstanding, and unfortunately it had left him with an aching head. There had to be some way he could be compensated for his troubles. I thought you were going to teach me something in secret, said Fans Yan. That's right, replied Master F. In a lot of folk tales, a young child meets some strange traveler and learns some mystical art, and no one around them has any idea what's going on. That sort of thing actually happens a lot. Fans Yan fixed Masterf with a stare as he talked. But there are more than just fools in this world, and you are not my daughter-in-law, and I do not care for climbing walls every day. Fji stared sternly back at the young boy. Given that I've pretended to be a teacher, it is better that I use this as an opportunity to teach you. Fan Xian giggled and climbed onto his lap. Teacher, do you know my papa? What is he like? Fji's face went red. He knew this young child was ruthless, no matter what sort of innocent act he put on, yet he was filled with a sense of powerlessness. On hearing the question, he paused in thought for a moment. The Count is a friend of my boss, so he asked me to come and teach you. You can call me your teacher. Teacher. What are you going to teach me? Fji laughed, and his brown flecked pupils flashed with an unusual light. I am a master of poisons. I have come to teach you how to use poison to kill, and how to avoid being poisoned by others. He thought his words would frighten the young boy to tears, but he quickly realized that the little boy standing in front of him was no ordinary child, so trying to scare him in this way would be of no use. Sure enough. Fans Yan's big eyes were filled with excitement, and he fluttered his long eyelashes as he blinked with fervent interest. What are we waiting for? Do you want me to go catch some rabbits to experiment on? Or maybe some frogs? Fji turned away, dumbfounded. Was this kid really only four years old? Dash. Several months later, at a burial mound a dozen or so miles away from Danzu Harbor, Faint dawn began to break in the pale eastern sky. It spread across the gloomy cemetery, making it seem even ghastlier and more dreadful. With his hands tucked into his sleeves, Fji stood outside the cemetery looking at the young master who was stooping in an open grave with trembling brow. Under the pretext of going on an outing, Fji had taken fans Yan away from the Countess for several days. They had actually gone to the cemetery to dig up corpses to study the structure of the human body. He knew that the young master fans Yan was no ordinary child, but as he watched him acclimatize so quickly to the gloom of the graveyard, study his mind, and dissect the corpses as he had been learning that month, he couldn't help but feel rather horrified. Fji was a professional used to dealing with corpses all the time. But he had never come across a four-year-old boy who was so calm around dead bodies. The prim, handsome boy, surrounded by the fetid stench of death, wore a face mask as he yanked the entrails out of a half-rotted corpse. It was an utterly ghoulish scene. This second life was about as miserable as the first one, thought fans yawn horribly. Chapter 9 Age is just a number. Pulling down his face mask and washing his hands with clean water, Fans Yan started recording the features of the corpses. He analyzed the diseases the deceased might have contracted, taking detailed notes in a black, leather bound notebook Fji had given him. After he was finished, he stood up, his face somewhat pale, his long eyelashes fluttering incessantly. Is there anything else to do, sir? Looking at him. Fji frowned. He hadn't expected the kid to have such guts. Before he could open his mouth to say anything, 
The nausea had finally gotten to Fan's yawn. He ran to the edge of the graveyard and began to vomit violently. When the nausea had finally passed, he stood up again. A soft look of pity glanced across Fji's face. Had he been too harsh, ordering a four-year-old boy to get up close and personal with such terrible things? As he watched Fan's yawn vomit, Fan Ji suddenly realized that this was the first time he really seemed like a child, rather than an old soul in a young body. It's okay, you've got some first-hand knowledge now. We can discuss it another time. Before Fji could finish his sentence, Fans Yan's young voice interjected. It's a shame Dan Zhu's such a small town. Not enough dead people. Otherwise we might be able to find fresher corpses. Fji's heart skipped a beat, and he slowly turned his head to look into Fans Yan's innocent eyes. He wasn't sure exactly what he was expecting to find in them. After a long while, he spoke coldly. Why, huh? Why aren't you scared? Why aren't you angry at me for making you do these things? Fji fixed the young boy with a bewildered frown. Fans Yan lowered his head. Teacher, he said respectfully, you said you would poison someone so I would be able to watch and learn. I'm scared. I'd much rather dig up corpses. So there are some things in this world that frighten you. There are. Fans Yan looked pitifully at his teacher. I'm only four and a half years old. Age is just a number. Fji nodded, then shook his head again. Even though you're young, there are some things that you might not understand but will have to learn anyway. A nobleman's bastard like you will face plenty of plots and attacks. One's worthless sympathy can often be the thing that leads to one's downfall. Fji had the odd feeling that the child fully understood everything he'd just said. At that moment. Rays of daylight found their way into Fan's Yan's eyes, setting them off with a shimmer. Fji was briefly taken aback. There was something wholly otherworldly in the boy's eyes. Over the years, his poisons had killed countless people. During the year of the late Emperor's Northern Conquest, his poisons had killed thousands of soldiers from the Northern Wei Kingdom. His crimes would undoubtedly damn him to hell. Then why did the sight of this innocent child cause him such unbearable unease? After putting right the nameless grave they had disturbed, the bizarre master and student pair walked eastward toward the dawn. You must have a lot of questions, said Fji as they took to the road. Fans Yan grunted in affirmation. A sweet smile spreading shyly across his face. You're very good to me, teacher. Fji hadn't expected the child would answer so tactfully. If you can smile about something like this, he said, laughing bitterly. I really wonder how mature you are. Better to laugh than to cry. That's true. Fji stared at the city walls in the distance, furrowing his brow. Your father owns a great estate in the capital. A lot of people will struggle to take it from you. So you'll have to become strong and learn as much as you can. Fans Yan said nothing. He was deep in thought. He'd always heard that his father, Count Xinan, was well trusted by the emperor, and that he lived in the capital. The year before last, there was a great political upheaval in the capital, and a great many nobles had died in a coup. Finally, his majesty had taken control of the situation purging the houses of countless aristocrats. Although his father was one of those nobles, he had somehow managed to retain the trust of the emperor, and had even greatly improved his standing. But fans Yan still couldn't understand what kind of estate could lead to his own death. How could it cause his father to enlist this formidable intermediary from the Overwatch Council to serve as his teacher? I understand. One day, someone will try to kill me. So you're teaching me to use poison. Really, I'm scared someone will try to poison me. Right. Killers have many methods, but poison is the easiest and least likely to arouse suspicion. Fji rubbed the crown of his head. My job is to teach you about such matters within a year, so that no one can kill you by poisoning one of your meals. But why only now? Surely you've been worried that somebody might poison me for the past few years. Fanzian needed clarification, so he continued asking questions, all the while he couldn't help but worry that his teacher would sense a maturity beyond his years. Fji smiled, but his words were grim. Because last month, Count Xinan's concubine gave birth to a son. In other words, you already have a rival for Count Xinan's estate, and that concubine has connections within the Overwatch Council. Your father was worried something might happen to you. 
and it wouldn't be convenient to dispatch someone to guard you for a long period of time, because that would arouse suspicion. So he sent me to teach you. Fan Xian noted that Fji had said both Count Sunan and your father. I'm a bastard, said Fan Xian, smiling. By law, I have no right to inherit my father's title. So the concubine shouldn't worry about me. One can never be too sure of anything in this world. Fji snapped back. Although you've got Master Wu protecting you, he can't be your nanny. Poison in your food might not hurt him, but it will still kill you. And if you die, you don't know how many people might die alongside you. Fans Yan's misgivings grew stronger. What sort of power did he wield? This father he had never seen. It was clearly far more than someone of his stature should normally have. Dot. The morning sun was bright. And as Fji led his charge toward the walls of Danzu, their shadows, one tall, one short, stretched out upon the ground. Fji observed Fan's Yan's face, still rather pale. Truth is, dead people are nothing to fear. Okay. And don't use Zenki to control your emotions. If human emotions aren't given the proper outlet, even if your powers of Zenki control are at their peak, you'll become a murderous monster. I understand. Obediently. Fans Yan scattered the Zenki within his body and stopped suppressing the fear and disgust he felt at handling corpses. At that moment, Fji suddenly spoke. There are still some rotten entrails in your sleeve. You taking them home for breakfast? Arg. The child's frightened shriek and the subsequent sinister laugh of his teacher pierced through the quietude of the rustic dawn. Chapter 10, No Shame in Asking Over the year that passed. Young Fan Xian began to learn all that Master F knew about poison. Occasionally, they would find the time to leave the city, searching high and low for poisonous ingredients like strychnite trees and purging nuts, as well as tasting various types of fungus. There were countless times when Fan Xian was overcome by such a powerful stomach ache that he would have feared for his life if he didn't have such a grandmaster in poisons by his side. Of course. In order to fully pursue his studies, under the command of Master F, his young and delicate hands were responsible for the deaths of innumerable rabbits, and toads would flee at his approach. That year, Fans Yan turned five. Strangely, after Fji had arrived in Danzu, Wu Zhu no longer made the effort to avoid Fans Yan. Every time Fans Yan slipped away to Wu Zhu's shop to drink wine, which, as a child, he shouldn't have been drinking. Wu Zhu made him a few bar snacks to go along with it. Fans Yan was curious. Wu Zhu is a servant of his mother's, why didn't he care that he drank wine? Fans Yan knew that his mother was no ordinary lady, and that was why she'd had such a dedicated and powerful servant as Wu Zhu. But he couldn't be sure that the blind boy's strength and skill would always protect him. Without even realizing it, Fans Yan had gotten accustomed to Wuzhu being close by to guard him. He'd gotten used to occasionally sighting Wuzhu down some alleyway or next to some street side tofu cellar, his eyes covered by that length of black cloth. Over the year, the Zenki within Fans Yan's body continued to make slow, steady progress. He was on the verge of making a breakthrough. But the powerful Zanki that accumulated in his sleep became somewhat unstable and began to affect his moods. He knew that there were many unknown dangers in this still unfamiliar world, and that there were many things about Count Sunan's estate in the capital that he did not understand. After he awoke, he set himself a goal, live well and make progress every day. And because of this grand goal, in order to keep himself alive so that he could someday carry out his three grand missions, he dedicated himself to his practice. In his past life he was paralyzed as a result of his debilitating muscle disease. So to find himself able to move freely in this new life made him value it all the more. Every day he rose early to strengthen his body, climbing up onto every surface he could, working so diligently at it that it began to perturb G. Unfortunately, he could never find a truly appropriate way to train himself physically. He showed far more diligence than any other child. But he usually consoled himself with the fact that, being a young man in his twenties, it was only proper that he be more committed than those other snot-nosed brats. But the nobody knew the truth. He wasn't born this committed, he was just hyperactive. He'd been confined to a bed for over a decade, there was no way he'd let himself get lazy now. Dot. Night fell, 
and Fg sequestered himself within his private room. He leant on his writing desk as the oil lamp flickered. The white hairs on his temples seemed to have turned darker since he came to Danzu. With a goose quill in his hand, he wrote something down on white paper. A knock came from outside. Come in, Fg said softly, not bothering to lift his head. Fan Xian pushed open the door lifting his feet over the high door threshold. He scratched his head and approached with a big grin. What are you writing, sir? Fji didn't seem annoyed in the slightest. He pushed his paper to one side and turned around. What's wrong? He'd spent the better part of a year in the company of Count Sinan's baseborn son, and he wasn't sure why. As the poison master of the Overwatch Council, feared by corrupt officials and underworld criminals alike, he felt some sort of warmth and kindness when he laid eyes on the kid. He was young, but he was tough and hardworking. He didn't look at poison with the contempt and disgust that most people did, and that pleased G. And most importantly, he was smart and thoughtful, so much so that he didn't seem like a five-year-old child at all. Master F. Fans Yan scrambled up onto a chair with some difficulty finally managing to plant his buttocks on it. I would like to know what my father is like. This wasn't the first time he'd asked about the pasts of Count Sinan and his mother, but every time he had, Fji had refused to say a word. Your father is an incredible man, replied Fji. Of course, your mother was even more so. The words meant nothing. The Overwatch Council was responsible for investigating the kingdom's biggest criminal activities and probing into official corruption. It was greatly feared throughout the land, and G had been a member since its earliest days, rising up to the lofty post of director of the Third Bureau, feared even by the capital's criminal underworld. And such an imposing figure, a grandmaster of the use of poison, had came to the faraway town of Danzo to tutor Count Sinan's baseborn son, simply because the Count had ordered it. It was clear that Count Sinan wielded great power in the capital, but it was hard to say whether that power stemmed from his official status or from other, less upright means. Fans Jan still knew nothing about his mother, who died on the day he was born, but his intuition told him that she was no ordinary woman. He didn't know why, maybe it was the blood. Her blood, that ran through his veins, but he had always felt a vague yearning for this woman he had never seen. Fji did not seem like he wanted to carry the tropic any further. Now that the Count's concubine has given birth to a son, you have no chance of inheriting his estate. So what are you planning to do? Fans Yan smiled sweetly. You taught me how to use poison, and how to cure it. I've learned quite a lot about medicine. Worst comes to worst. I could be a doctor. G stroked at his beard. You're right, he said with a hint of pride. Even the doctors of the Imperial Palace don't know any more than me about medicine. As my only student, you could easily become a physician. They discussed the option of becoming a doctor, but deep down, both knew it was little more than a pipe dream. Teacher, I'm having problems with my Zanke practice, said Fans Yan suddenly. I was hoping you could help me. That's why I came here tonight. G was unparalleled in his mastery of poison, but that was all he would teach Fans Yan. Life is limited, he told him, but there is no limit to methods of killing. Therefore, we should devote our limited lives to the limitless pursuit of the most efficient method of killing, and to master F. Poison was the most effective method for killing. Fans Yan had the world's greatest master of poison as his teacher. Why was he bothering with Zanki? When it came to this sorcery that Fans Yan couldn't stop worrying about, Fji felt the same as any other citizen of the Kingdom of King. It was of very little use when it came to combat. But this was the first time in a year that Fans Yan had brought it up and Fji couldn't help but feel curious. He stretched out his fingers and took Fans Yan's pulse. Then he went pale. Chapter 11, The Fifth Grand Master Fji slowly frowned. Because he believed that the blind man was possessed of great power, he never considered the potential problems with Fans Yan's Zanki training. And yet today, while checking his pulse, he discovered something unusual. Seeing his usually obscene teacher being all cautious, Fans Yan realized too that something was wrong. Grinning, he asked, is there a problem? Look at you, grinning like that, aren't you afraid of becoming too obsessed? Fji stared at him, continuing, the last time, 
I only knew the Zyke you were training with was tremendous, but never did I imagine it to be like this. Fans Jan scratched his head, tremendous, tremendous how? G answered seriously, quite tremendous. Fans Jan looked back, also seriously, teacher, we're just talking nonsense here. Dot. G is an expert at poisoning, not a grandmaster of martial arts, so naturally he could not determine what sort of ability Fan Zian's nameless Zenki was. He could, however, very much feel the dangerous power of the Zenki emitting from the child's body. After some thought, he urged Fan Zian to go find Wu Zhu, but unexpectedly, Fan Zian sighed sadly and said that Uncle Wu Zhu only listened to what his mother said and gave the book to him. He himself had never trained and also refused to say too much on the matter. Fji raged, Master Wu is being too unreasonable. You are the young master of his house, why did he, instead of instructing you himself, make you learn such a dangerous ability without any guidance? For the past year, he had taken this five-year-old as his greatest source of consolation during his later years in life. Even more than that. He hoped Fan Zian would carry his mantle in the future and glorify all he had learned. For those reasons, Fji became angry at the blind Wu Zhu when he heard this. Is Uncle Wu Zhu really strong? Fan Zian squinted as he asked his question, looking like a little fox. Of course. Fji leisurely thought of the past. It's just that not that many people in this world know of Master Wu's existence. Have you heard of the four great grandmasters? Of course fans Yan had heard of them. In today's world, worshipped by the common people like gods, they were the four great grandmasters whose martial arts prowess reigned supreme. Counting on one hand, there were two in the Kingdom of King, one in the Kingdom of North Qi and another in Eastern Yi City. In the current world, King had already held an overwhelming advantage, having been led by its emperor. But strangely, after the political bloodshed from the year before, the nation prospered while the emperor became rather quiet and no longer attempted to expand his territory. But that aside, it was only natural for the strongest nation to have two of the strongest people. Indeed, we currently have two of the grandmasters residing here. G laughed coolly, humans are foolish, they only recognize the strength in fighting. Never would they realize that if one's skill with poison were to reach other worldly proficiency, he too could be a grandmaster. Fans Yan suddenly cleared his throat to stop his teacher's gloating. Dot if we exclude the most mysterious temple, King has two of the four great grandmasters, one of them being the younger brother of the teacher of the current Jingdu commander of defense. Yi Laya Yan. Fans Yan opened his eyes wide, thinking that this was a pretty big reputation. But the defense force was in charge of safety for the entire region, the most important position. That commander's teachers. Younger brother, Yi Laya Yan or whatever, must have been very strong. There's another strong one, and he supposedly lives in the royal palace, though no one has seen him. Hey, teacher. We were talking about Uncle Wu Zhu. What's the hurry? Fji gave fans Yan another stare. The one named Yilaya Yan lived through 17 duels without losing a single one. But once, when your mother came to the city for the first time, she beat the current commander of defense to a pulp. That commander, named Yi Zong, happens to be Yilaya Yan's nephew. And for that reason he wanted to stir up trouble for your mother. Fans Yan was stunned. He had no idea that the mother he never saw was once such an arrogant character. Fji chuckled, but something happened later. Yi Laya Yan suddenly stopped troubling your mother, and Yi Zong even went to Ping Temple to pour tea for her and apologize. Huh? No one knows what happened. It's an absolute mystery. But I'm guessing Yi Laya Yan and Master Wu Zhu fought once behind the palace walls. Master Wu is your mother's servant, so it's not unusual for him to come out and deal with such things. Fji raised the teacup that was by his hand and took a sip. Who won in the end? Fans Yan's eyes were full of curiosity. While he knew that Wu Zhu was strong. He did not expect the blind man to have the experience of dueling one of the four great grandmasters, Yi Laya Yan. No one knows, but it was probably a draw. Fji chuckled. Apparently, after he went back to his sword school, he trained his swordsmanship for half a year while blindfolded. After that, 
he gave up the sword and picked up a series of ancient Sanzu, truly becoming a grandmaster. Thinking back, that battle must have brought him much enlightenment. Fans Yan propped up his little face, thinking, four great grandmasters. Does that mean Wuzhu is the fifth? Fans Yan's eyes sparkled in awe, in awe of the fact that his own blind servant would be so ridiculously strong. When he ventures out into the world someday, who would he have to be afraid of? Suddenly he had a question. Teacher, didn't you say these things are secret? How do you know all this? Ji said coolly, I'm a high-ranking official in the supervising department. For us, there are no secrets in this world. For some reason, fans Yan had always been interested in the strong people of this world, as if some years later he would run into one of them, which is why he asked, the other three, teacher, have you seen them? The other one and king only exists in legends, I suspect he is in the royal palace, but no one has actually seen him. Fji said, as for the Grand Master of North Chi, that would be their head priest, that perverted bald man named Ku He. Bald? Fans Yan assumed that a world without Buddhism wouldn't have monks. A monk, I heard Ku He was once a pilgrim, kneeling on the temple steps for three months, subsisting on the cold and dew. Somehow, he managed to move those in the temple, and thus received divine theology and became a grand master. Fji spat out in disgust, appearing to be jealous of the pilgrim named Kuhi, you can tell that Baldi is a liar from a glance. Temple, temple, the place is a temple. Teacher, you're talking nonsense again. Dot the temple is the most mysterious existence on the continent, supposedly it was the place where our ancestors worshipped. But unfortunately, other than the extremely fortunate bastards, no one could find exactly where it is, and so no one knows what it is like inside. Maybe. This temple doesn't exist at all. Fji hit fans Yan's small head hard, I don't care if you mess around every day, but how dare you be so disrespectful towards such a holy place. Fans Yan held his head and looked at his teacher in shock, first from the fact that his teacher who kills with poison without blinking, turned out to hold reverence towards a temple, and second, from the fact that he himself accepted what he heard so easily, superstitious things like four great grandmasters and temples. Looks like I fit in this world after all. Chapter 12, Overpowering Chi, who has evidence to prove the existence of this temple. Fans Yan still possessed the empirical views of a modern man, answered Fji proudly, Kuhi. One of the four great grand masters, became one of the strongest on this continent after came to be in the temple's favor. Isn't that proof enough? Or perhaps Ku He took too many stimulants and used the temple as an excuse. Fan Xian retorted, Blasphemy. While I envy the luck of the bald Ku He, for the past few decades, he held the utmost reverence for the gods, and I do admire that. How can he use temple as an excuse? And what is a stimulant? It's a medicine which boosts the body, something like an elixir. He must have had too much, otherwise how did he lose all his hair? Fans Yan was joking with his teacher. Fji ignored him. The temple is like the Tan Mei, they both are found in the books, and in the royal chambers of all kingdoms with the most important part are the sacrificial temples. It's just that the temples themselves want no part in worldly matters, and never interferes. It is for that reason that all the ceremonies are made at the heavenly altar three miles away from the palace. King and Northern Chi both conduct large-scale sacrifices at their altars, but they never use it to influence politics and other national business. Only some pilgrims believe the temple to be ruins of the realms and take on journeys to train their hearts and bodies. Fan Xian was smiling, but inside he thought, what is this temple really like? If it's part of a belief system, then why doesn't this world have things like churches? If those fundamental organizations don't exist, then this belief system would have no authority. No authority equals no benefit, and without benefit. No reason for any organization to exist. And so, he didn't believe what his teacher just told him about the temple being an existence which transcended this world. But at the same time, he thought, if a belief system really is based on such a mysterious place, it's not so bad, since it doesn't seem to interfere with people's lives. Dot. Alright, teacher, 
You've been off topic for too long. You haven't told me what's going on with this Zenki in my body yet. Seeing a rare childish tantrum, Fji checked fans Yan's pulse carefully, then stated, As I said earlier, the Zenki inside you is very powerful. Even though you've been training for such a short amount of time, the amount of Zenki in your pubic region and meridian have far surpassed what a body of your age is capable of containing. Is it that serious? Fans Yan looked uneasy. I don't know. Then you're just trying to scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. It's just that you right now are like a leather bag used to hold alcohol. The bag can only hold so much, but the amount of alcohol inside keeps on increasing. If you continue, I'm worried that you will end up bursting. Recently, while practicing, Fans Yan felt some burning pain around his waist, but other than that, there weren't any unusual symptoms so he was reluctant to believe his teacher. He shook his head. My teacher is scolding me for being a glutton, I believe. Try moving your Zenki like you do every day in practice. Fji frowned slightly. Fans Yan did as told and closed his eyes, naturally entering the meditative state of his training. The warm cloud of chi around his abdomen began to slowly expand gradually moving towards the limbs along the meridians of the human body. Fji too closed his eyes, setting his fingertips on the boy's wrist, judging carefully. After a while he frowned, saying, Don't hold it back on purpose, you're only a five-year-old child, as powerful as your Zenki may be, it can't harm me. I'm worried that your body is too frail and can't handle it. Oh! Fans Yan had indeed been controlling the strength of his Zenki so he slowly released it out through the pubic region. Thinking back on what Fji said, fans Yan couldn't help but agree, of course, the amount of Zenki he has can't hurt that toxic old thing, and therefore, if he releases too little of it, his teacher wouldn't be able to make an accurate diagnosis. While thinking that, he closed his eyes again, with this nameless art of Zenki resounding through his mind, do not keep the force within you and bring destruction. Let it flow from you like water from a spring. As he chanted, the Zenki inside began jumping as if being issued a command. It joyously came out of from his pubic region, traveled to his back along the meridian, and came rushing towards the wrist on a strange path. A dull noise was heard from the book chamber. G violently opened his eyes as he felt his fingers being deflected off the child's wrist by a dense wave of Zenki, and being unprepared. G himself was flung against the wall, the impact of which created a dull thud. There was a burning sensation in his fingers, and his chest was in pain. G spat out blood. Dot. On the other side, Fans Yan felt stuffy and raised his head. Only then did he discover Fji's miserable state. Shocked, he hurried and helped his teacher up. Fi G waved his hand, signaling that he was fine and got up on his own. Wiping away the blood from his lips, he stared at the little boy with a strange look that was hard to interpret. Fi Ji mumbled to himself, he's five years old, for FCK's sake, and yet his Zenki is this overwhelming. If you keep training, one day, the Zenki inside you will explode and kill you. Fans Yan was stunned to hear his teacher use such strong language. He didn't think the rebellious Zenki in his wrist would make his teacher bleed. Despite being hurt, the first thing Fi Ji thought of wasn't his own well-being, but rather that of his student. Realizing this, even though Fans Yan sometimes locked away his feelings while hiding in the body of a small child, he felt somewhat moved. The wooden door opened and a black shadow rushed in, a pair of idiots. Even now, the blind Wuzhu still talked with a cold tone. He led Fans Yan over and put his fingertips to the child's slender neck. After a pause, he said coldly, You're not hurt, just shaken from seeing Fi Ji throwing up blood. He then took another look at Fi Ji, and remained, Fi Ji, you are teaching him to use poison. I trust you're qualified. But young miss once said that your martial abilities are one of the weakest of the eight masters in the capital. And since this is something I gave young master, it's better if you don't say anything unnecessary. In Danzu City, Fiji was a rather inconspicuous, somewhat trivial man. But here in the capital, he was a very impressive character. Now having been injured, though mostly through his own carelessness, 
He was unhappy after hearing Wu Zhu putting it like that. Adding to his own worry was Fan's young learning such overly powerful ability at the age of five, his expression darkened. Chapter 13, The Crude, Simple Explanation With a dark expression, Fji spoke coldly. I know I am not qualified to question the training method that you passed on to Fan's Yan. However, I am very curious. Why did you not teach him personally? Knowing that he was only five, even if he was truly talented, for something so dangerous you should have been there for him as his mother's servant. This was something understandably reasonable to say. After all, it was Wu Zhu who left the obscure Zaiki training method next to Fan's Yan's swaddle. This meant he had an obligation to ensure that no problems arose during his training. Fans Yang glanced awkwardly at Wu Zhu, his eyes pausing on the black cloth wrapped below his brow. I did not leave this for the young master. The lady left it, Wu Zhu said deliberately. Fai Ji had no intention of offending the blind man, but he was growing agitated. Cunning for someone with such profound training. Even just a simple tip or two could have saved fans Yan from training in such a perilous manner. After a pause, Wu Zhu suddenly spoke. I have never practiced Zenki. With this, he simply turned and left, leaving behind the dumbstruck master and apprentice pair. Dot. What did he just say? He said he never practiced any. Zenki. And his voice faltered when he said that. Fji watched Fan's Yan's feigned sophistication and felt rage boil up inside him. Just where did a five-year-old boy learn to speak with such cynical wit? It's hard to imagine a man without any Naegong coming to a draw in a Sanzu fight with Lai Yian, one of the four great grandmasters. At that time, Yi Lai Yian was still using his sword, as he had not yet completed his Sanzu training. Master. Can someone without Naegong Zenki become as powerful as Wu Zhu? Fans Yan questioned sincerely. Fji's brows furrowed in thought as he spoke. Only if he carried out every single movement with strict precision would he be able to fatally injure someone with his iron rod before they could react. Fans Yan naturally remembered the night he had arrived in this world in the arms of the blind young man and how the iron rod he held dripped with a steady stream of fresh blood. However, this kind of speed and power are beyond what humans are capable of. Fji shook his head, then suddenly cleared his throat. He quickly sat next to the desk and peered at Fzion. Little one, if you can't grasp this art, then it is best that you stop. I guarantee that with my method you will never have to worry about anyone bothering you. I will consider it, Fans Yan answered maturely. After some thought, Fji retrieved a sachet of medicine and placed it in Fan's Yan's tiny hands. Take this. It's a kind of expensive medicine. If your training ever goes awry, consume one pill with plenty of water. Fan's Yan nodded his head in response. Thank you, Master. He knew that the medicine was extremely valuable. Fai Ji smiled faintly as he looked at this child who was like an adult then spoke suddenly. Isn't it strange that I'm treating you so nicely despite the fact that your father forced me to come all the way to Danzu just to teach you? Fans Yan didn't say anything, but merely stared at him with an expression of thanks. Fji laughed and shook his head, patting Fans Yan's head. Perhaps, at my age, having a student as clever as you is something worth being happy about. For now, don't think about the Count's estate in the capital. Fji said seriously, even though you're still young, I hope you remember what I'm about to tell you. Hearing the seriousness in his teacher's tone, Fans Yan sat up straight and listened carefully. Your family is far more complicated than you could ever imagine. This matter involves not only your own survival, but the lives of many others, so you must remain vigilant at all times. In the years that you grow to be an adult, you must learn how to protect yourself so that in the future you can protect others. In the future. Protect whom? Fans Yan was puzzled. Fji laughed as he pointed at his own nose. Someone inseparable from you, like myself for instance. Fans Yan nodded hazily. He thought that the situation was indeed complicated. Even having lived in two different worlds, he still could not understand what his teacher was getting at. All right. Go to your room now and get some rest. As for that corrupt Badao Kung Fu, it's probably best not to practice it anymore. Fans Yan prudently returned to his room. When he opened the door, 
he saw Wu Zhu sitting silently in the corner, with the lights off, the room was just an inky patch of gloom, yet despite this, the piece of black cloth that covered Wu Zhu's eyes seemed even murkier and opaque than the night itself. Wu Zhu. Fans Yan bowed his head in respect. A faint, monotone voice traveled from the corner where Wu Zhu sat. The tome is divided into two parts. The first is called Badao, and the second one has no title. The tome was given to you by the lady, so I left it beside you when you were young. I have never learned these spiritual methods. So I cannot teach you. I believe, however, that since it is called Badao, one can assume that the way it uses Qi is more aggressive. If you encounter any issues during training, then it's your own problem. With this, the piece of black cloth disappeared. What a crude, simple explanation, and what an odd, apathetic man. Fan Xian sighed and climbed into bed, then retrieved the nameless book from a secret compartment. He thought about his training process and realized that when Zenki filled his donshan, it did not follow the flow of the meridians as it should have. Instead, parts of the Zenki split into the Xufu channel, which leads directly to the Xushan, located above the back of the kidney. The Xushan passes through the spine. Fans Yan had learned both in his past life and in his lessons with Ji the vital importance of the spine. As the spine is directly connected to the brain, a single careless move could leave one trapped in a vegetative state. However, as Fan Xian meditated during his daily lunchtime naps, the Badao Zanki in his body would travel through his Xushan and become relaxed and calm. The agitation would subside and a feeling of serenity would wash over him, like eating ice cream on a hot summer day. This was how he had trained since he was one year old. Could it be that he had been doing it wrong? Fan Xian did not think that, immersed in the martial arts world, he would end up taking the path of corruption. Yet. Like a man desperate for relief, he found himself addicted to the pleasures of the Badao path. If he stopped training, the remnants of the Badao Zenki within him would one day burst through his mortal body. Blind Wu Zhu told him that the consequences of his training were all up to fans Yan himself. To train, or not to train? That was the question plaguing fans Yan at that moment. Chapter 14 The Sea Salt Merchant It was early in the morning and the birds were chirping away. The maids had just finished cleaning the house and were starting to prepare breakfast. The return to the city of Count Sinan's daughter, Miss Fan Ra or Yuo, left only one and a half person to answer to, so there wasn't much to be done. After having completed all her chores, Donger, an older maid, went to wake Fan Zhan, but was instead shocked by his poor condition. She called the doctor right away who informed the maid that it was nothing serious after having checked the young boy's pulse, reasoning that it was probably something the boy ate, afterwards leaving a prescription and parting with his pay. After Fji came to Count Sinan's house, Mr. Zixi, who was a fan of classical literature, left subtly, as if he was the morning wind. Fiji looked at the young boy, who had two dark circles under his eye and chuckled. They say that the hearts of youths are like the sun, ignorant to human hardships. But what happened to you? How did you end up so sleep deprived that you needed a doctor? Fans Yan had been thinking the whole night but still hadn't decided whether he should continue with his Zenki training. His original intention was to treat this nameless spiritual art as entertainment in this boundless life. However, if it endangered his survival, it was best that he be cautious. Due to the lack of sleep, he became absent-minded. Having heard his teacher Fji talk about the ignorance of human hardships, he recited intuitively, I was young and ignorant of hardship and sorrows, and I loved climbing high. I climbed high, I feigned hardship and sorrow to help me create, yet now that I've tasted hardship and sorrow, I speak but hold back, I speak but hold back. Oh how exquisitely cool this autumn day is. Dot. The study room quickly fell silent. Fan Zhan, who had not made a single sound for half a day struggled to pry open his heavy eyelids and yawned. Don't be angry, teacher. I had a late night. Fiji watched the boy as he stroked his beard subconsciously, and without realizing it, he stabbed his chin with a goose feather pen. Painfully awakened, he questioned sluggishly, earlier dot that poem dot who wrote it? Poor old man Zin. Without thinking. Fans Yan accidentally revealed Zinkizi's surname, 
only to realize his mistake, fans Jan stuttered as Fiji's eyes lit up. Old man Zin is a two-way merchant who collected sea salt last month. Not bad for a merchant. I wonder what his full name is. Zin.Kizi. Fans Jan snuck a peek. Fiji had already resumed being his normal self and began teaching. There was so much more to teach than just biological points, and so his load was a heavy one. Dot. Fans Jan returned to his bedroom after lunch and was once again faced with the complicated question of whether he should continue with the dangerous Zanki training. As he held the yellow book in his hand, he began to feel depressed. More than anything else, he should probably be depressed about the poem he accidentally recited in the study room. The ugly page, written on a wall on the way to Bashan, was a poem written by Zinkizi. After he was criticized, his poems expressed a mellow bitterness. Fan Zian was of course quite familiar with it and had recited it, unaware of the trouble that he would bring upon himself. He wondered if his teacher believed his feeble excuse, but judging from Fji's reaction, Fan Zian wagered that he probably believed the original author really was a sea salt merchant. Fan Zian was not obsessively concerned with morals, so to him, there was nothing hateful about plagiarizing poems. From his point of view, to keep the knowledge of these poems to himself rather than making good use of them was equivalent to violating a national treasure. He had plenty of time in the years that he had lived in this world to come up with ways of making a living. It took no time for the work of plagiarism to secure its place in the top three position on his list. During his thoughts, fans Jan often brainwashed himself, rather than a poacher. He was a preserver, a mighty idealist, sharing and spreading the cultures of Earth. However, he had not planned on plagiarizing like this, nor at this moment in time. He had planned to at least use the author's name as a pen name for their work. Today, in the same situation as in the study room, if you plan to plagiarize as a five-year-old, then your choice of work should have been Song for the Goose by Wobin Wang. The lively imagery of this poem better conveys the model child prodigy image. If you were caught humming words such as I speak but hold back, oh how exquisitely cool this autumn day is at such a young age, you would not be thought of as a child prodigy, but rather, as a child freak, one who looked normal on the outside but deep down bore 365 painful scars conveying the bitter passing of the four seasons. On the one hand, Fan Zian was thinking about these trivial matters, he was able to rely on these years to stabilize an ever-intensifying biological clock. When it came time for his daily nap, Fan Zian gradually fell asleep, and in his dreams, he was in the middle of meditating on the immense danger that Fji considered to be the overwhelming power of Zanki. It was on this day that fans Yan decided he would accept his fate and continue his training with this overwhelming Zanki, since all of that was needed for the training was for him to sleep anyway, and he'd worry about any issues when they came up. Dot. After fans Yan's nap was over, Fji continued with his unfinished letter. The completely dried writing suggested that the letter was written the night before. Dot. This child is prettier, braver, wiser more determined and mature than anyone. If he were to hide himself among all the five-year-olds of Chi Kingdom, he would still be easily identified. From my observations this year, I have found that he is more than perfect to inherit the family fortune. The biggest concern is his background identity. The writing stopped. It was at that point in the previous night fans Yan questioned him about Zanki. Fji sighed and paused as he remembered the words fans Yan had said earlier that day. He continued writing, dot I speak but hold back, oh how exquisitely cool this autumn day is. How am I supposed to believe that those words came from a five-year-old boy, knowing that the art of prose has deteriorated these past few years? I find it hard to even believe a merchant may have written this. What's more, the young master panicked afterwards. And this is something that I have rarely seen happen in the year that I have been acquainted with him. The biggest question here is how Zin Kizi had the opportunity to meet with fans Yan even though I am with him most of the day. At the end of the letter he requested sincerely, please ask the people of Dongzhen Road to find out exactly who the sea salt merchant Zin Kizi is, 
and also his reason for making contact with fans Yan. The answer as to why the young master was so anxious over these words take priority. Please hurry. Fji ended the letter with a crooked signature and put down his pen. A few days later, the Overwatch Council of the capital city sent spies out and hunt for a sea salt merchant. Although they found numerous illegal private sea salt traders afflicted with government officials, they could not find a merchant with the surname of Sin. Rumors spread from the city that the director of the council, feared by all, was furious with the lack of results. He punished the spies by taking three months' worth of their pay. The spies searched everywhere under the sun, their faces thunderous and ready to kill. Dot. May God have pity on the unlucky man named Zinkizi in this world. Chapter 15, Farewell for Now, FG. With the years passing, Fall arrived once again and chrysanthemum flowers blanketed the mountains. Fji's teaching career in Danzu Harbor was originally set to end in the summer, but he loved the air, the ocean wind, and the cuisine at Count Sinan's estate. In particular, he so much enjoyed teaching fans Yan that he extended his stay for a few more months. After those few months, Fji, an expert in taking life by poison and also in prolonging it in the elderly, rubbed his fattening tummy. He had regrettably received a letter from the capital and reluctantly informed Count Sinan's mother of his leave. Knowing that Fiji was sent by the capital, the Countess made no effort to persuade him to stay. She comforted him instead before gifting him a red envelope as an act of thanks. Down by the road heading west of Danzu Harbor, teacher and student said their goodbyes. Why don't you listen to my advice and discontinue your Zanke training? It won't end well. I haven't encountered any major problems with it, at least, not yet. If there are no problems, then why did you go through barrels of alcohol in the kitchen? It was an accident, fans Yan answered distressfully. In recent months, the Zanke in his body became increasingly aggressive and these incidents occurred often. Due to these incidents, Fans Yan had no choice but to sacrifice his bedtime ghost stories with the maids as he was afraid that in the heat of the moment his hand might run astray on one of the maids' bodies and he would make a deeply regrettable mistake. Learning the art of poison is learning the world's greatest killing method. What's the need to learn anything else? Because poison can easily harm the innocent. Fiji stared into the eyes of the little boy and asked, Are you sure you're not turning six this year? Fans Yan looked at his teacher innocently. It's not my fault I'm an early bloomer. Fji sighed and tutted. It really wasn't easy keeping his mind sane around the little rascal for so long. It was time to leave. Fji rubbed the back of the boy's head and looked back towards the city of Danzu. In the future, if you ever come to the capital to be a doctor, remember to look me up. Very well. Fans Yan bowed in respect. He truly appreciated the eccentric old man. Over the years, his old soul longed for someone to converse with. Blind man Wuzhu was too cold for consideration, so the role was filled by his teacher, who had an impressive background. Throughout the time they knew each other, he could sense how they had grown close. Stop practicing Zenki. You can be quite garrulous sometimes, sir. Maybe it's because I'm too old. G rubbed fans Yan's soft black hair with one hand while messing his own white hair with the other. Anyway, that Zenki is worthless. It's too powerful and uncontrollable. Fji hadn't given up on changing Fzian's mind. There's a formidable swordsman in the city of Dongyai who owes me a favor. I could introduce you to be his student. Fan Zian inhaled a cold breath. Are you talking about the master swordsman of Dongyai City? That's right. Fji said enticingly, one of the four great grandmasters, his practice is much more powerful than yours. Fan Zian was interested in something else. How do you know him? Well, when he was eight, his father called me in to treat the boy's sickness. Judging by the fact that he hugged trees all day, the little monster was obviously just dumb. I treated him half-heartedly and left with my money. I never would have known that a few years later I'd hear that he learned the Sigu sword style and became a great grandmaster. Fans Yan looked at him with disdain. You treated him half-heartedly? Let's not even mention the fact that you practically stole your pay. You nearly killed a world-class warrior. That is quite worthy of contempt. Fji feigned anger and walked towards the carriage in the distance. I have taught you everything about biological poisons and all knowledge related to it. However, 
there is one key piece of information that I have yet to tell you. Fans Jan ran after him, his tiny legs working as fast as the wind. What is it? Finding the right antidote is easy. Finding the right poison is easy. The hardest part is the administration of the poison. Without turning his head, Fji continued walking. Fans Jan, however, stopped in his tracks and carefully turned those words over in his mind. In the past year that he had been with G, he had learned that in the field of poisons, the hardest thing to do was to find a poison that was colorless, odorless and tasteless. So the secret was in how the poison was administered. He began to giggle shyly all of a sudden. It's not like he was preparing to be an assassin or planning on killing the emperor. Why was he stressing out over this matter? All he needed to do was be confident that he wouldn't fall victim to poisoning under the hands of the ant in Kautzenon's estate. He watched as the carriage disappeared into the distance with dust following in its trails, left at the side of the road. Fans Jan performed a deep bow. He realized that the eccentric old man had not wanted to come to Danzu at first, but after a year of running around together cutting up dead bodies and frog legs, they had grown used to each other. Neither of them would ever forget this relationship. With the lonely departure, Fans Jan could not help but feel sad. G really is a great man. It's just a shame he looks dot a bit miserable. Dot. There was a long period of time afterwards in which Fans Jan was unable to adapt to the departure of his teacher. A normal noble boy his age would probably have been playing with his friends. Although he was the only noble child in Danzu, there were plenty of possible playmates close to his age. Fans Jan knew that at the end of his story, he would not be able to associate with his peers. Since his mental age was older than other children, he often felt like he was babysitting. Not everyone wants to be the king of other children to satisfy what little ability they have. This was similar to how, back in Fans Jan's former reality, no stereotypical macho man would ever want to be a kindergarten teacher. After Fji left Danzu, Fans Jan lost the only person he could converse with. He felt like his life was starting to get boring. He stood on the front steps of Count Sinan's villa and watched as crowds of people passed by and began to feel lonely. He had no idea what he could do trapped in the body of a child. He remembered back to when he first arrived in this world, of how he had thought of wonderful things that he could do and he couldn't help but laugh. In his previous life, when he lay on his sick bed, his lack of ability was obvious from his appearance. He had thought that, at least compared to the people of this world, he would have some extra skills like making soap or molding ugly glass cups. That was only the beginning of the list of simple yet beneficial things he could do. When fans Jan realized that soap and glass already existed and were nothing special in this world, he didn't feel too beat up about it. However, when he realized that Fiji's carriage horses had saddles and steps to help get on the horse, he felt so overcome with failure that he began to sob lightly. Chapter 16 A Letter from the Capital The skies above the city of Danzu darkened suddenly. The thick heavy clouds that hung over the heads of the people looked like patches of wet, dirty wool, or maybe burned cotton candy. The shore dwelling inhabitants there were so accustomed to the weather that they knew it would still be a while before rainfall so no one panicked. It was unlike previous years when the weather looked like it was about to take a turn for the worse and the handsome illegitimate son of Count Sinan's house could be found shouting from the neighboring rooftops at the entire city, it's about to rain, bring in your laundry. The only main street in Danzu Hirober was filled with food and trinkets. Seeing a pretty boy in the crowd, one of the merchants tried to make conversation. Master Fan, why don't you tell us to bring in the laundry anymore? Fans Jan smiled shyly and said nothing. He grasped his maid's hand with one hand and held some tofu with the other. Nobody was surprised that he helped the servants. Everyone knew that the illegitimate son of Count Sinan's house was unlike any other noble child in that he loved helping those beneath his station. In the six years since Fji left Danzu Harbor, Fans Jan had grown to be a fetching young boy who emitted a sense of reliability. Back at the house, he handed the tofu to the servants before greeting the countess and picking up a piece of paper next to her. Returning to his study, he placed a letter from his little sister next to the piece of paper on his desk and the expression on his face immediately lit up. This year, 
the Emperor of King Kingdom made some changes to his reign title and year to reflect the name of the country, a peculiar move that nobody anticipated. Although it might have seemed that the civil servants were fine with the change, they complained when nobody was around. During those days, it didn't matter if you were a scholar at the Ministry of Education or a kanji drinking novel writer, if you were with the new language party or the old one, you still had to pay the 8th Bureau of the Overwatch Council to review a report. This topic was heavily covered by sour old scholars. After the Emperor's reign title was changed, next on the list was pushing new laws. These new laws were nothing new and only served to reorganize pre-existing ones. The only thing the public found refreshing was the introduction of newspapers at the start of the new year. Newspapers? No one had any idea what they were until the first issue after which a collectivo marked the end of the public's interest. The newspapers were produced by the Imperial Palace and every issue had to be approved by the Emperor himself before publication. This prevented the possibility of any problematic articles that could incite backlash. The following issues cost the expensive price of a silver coin and were bought by those attracted to their novelty. Some of the higher status people began to suspect it was a ploy set by the Emperor and wondered if he was planning on building a new garden. Included within the thin paper were pieces of useless information. These ranged from landmarks to historical figures, but the main feature of the paper was articles covering the private life of government officials, like how the general was beaten by his wife or why the commander of defense in the capital was missing a tooth. There were even peripheral articles related to their neighbors, the Northern Qi Kingdom and the Dongyai City. However, the government officials only paid attention to their own close circle. In the beginning, they laughed at the articles, but soon became embarrassed when it was their turn to be featured in the newspaper. Knowing that the emperor was behind the newspaper, nobody dared to complain. The newspapers were printed in scarce numbers and the entire city of Danzu had only two copies, one of which could be found in Count Sinan's house, as they were subscribers. The piece of paper fans Yan had stolen from his grandmother's room was the much-discussed newspaper. After a quick scan of the paper, fans Yan could not control his facial expressions. He wanted to stick his entire fist in his mouth. What kind of era was this? Tabloid newspapers? And ordered by the emperor, no less. Dot. The new mail order law enacted by the royal family meant that the brother-sister pair could secretly send letters to each other with secrecy. Fans Yan frowned as he looked at the newspaper. For a while now he had heard people discussing the new laws, which in his opinion were a product of nonsense by the emperor. However, everyone knew that the emperor was not one to rub the wrong way. Fans Yan was not in the mood to change the world. He wasn't even interested in the first place. But when this world began to grow similar to his own, he was naturally interested to see how things worked behind the scenes. After much meditating, fans Yan still hadn't gotten to the bottom of the matter. Smiling wryly, he pushed the paper aside and self-deprecatingly thought to himself that perhaps another person with larger ambitions had also traveled to this world. Anyhow, these matters were of little relevance to him. It was the letter next to the paper that carried greater importance. In Fan's Yan's memories, Fan Ra Eruo was someone related to him by blood that had stayed in Danzu for a while during their childhood. His poor little sister was lanky and dark compared to his graceful and pretty appearance. They had not seen each other for many years. Fan's Yan wondered what she looked like now. Had her sparse blonde hair darkened? Had she become prettier? Fan Xian was even struggling to remember if she was called Fan Ryuo or Fan Ra or Yuo. I am such an incompetent brother. Fan Xian thought he didn't care for his sister enough. Even his soul had experienced two different lives. He was still related to her by blood through this body. Two years ago when Fan Ryuo began school, she often sent letters to Dan Zhu. Fan Xian, on the other hand, hardly replied as he was too busy going through Wuzhu's relentless training, his daily Badaozanki practice, and also reviewing the poisons book Fji had left. For some unknown reason, Fan Ra Eruo, who turned 10 that year, was extremely reliant on her faraway brother and frequently sent him letters. Perhaps it was because the horror stories that they had shared in their childhood were deeply ingrained in her mind. At first, 
She mostly wrote about how she missed her grandmother dearly and her memories of Danzu Harbor. For the past six months, though, she wrote mainly about her boring days at the estate in the capital and hardly talked about their home in Danzu Harbor. Fans Jan brushed the letter lightly with his fingertips, his pretty face tinged with concern. On the paper was his sister's delicate handwriting. She had written about her life in the capital recently and how she had been accepted into a school for aristocrat ladies. It was as if this was the natural pathway in life for someone like her. Chapter 17 I offer this kitchen knife to you. It was apparent from what was written in the letter that there was always something troublesome going on that didn't match Fan Ra or Yuo's age. Thinking back, after the head wife died, the woman who had given birth to a son started to become more and more arrogant in the capital. Because Uncle Sinan was always busy with official affairs, Fan Ra or Yuo was alone in the capital. Perhaps there were some minor problems in her daily life. Picking up a brush and dipping the tip in ink, Fan Xian paused for a moment to think before writing his reply. In his letter, he was rather roundabout in telling her to spend as much time with Count Sinan as possible, and to behave herself in a lovable and mellow manner. She must not openly complain, but she should occasionally show her hidden bitterness. Secondly, she must stand her ground in front of that woman and a certain proud younger brother. As people would often say, make yourself too kind and people will take advantage of you. If Fan Ra or Yuo didn't wish to be treated unfairly, at the very least she should show her willingness to defend herself. Thirdly, she needed to be kind to the house servants, especially to Count Sinan's aide. She needed to observe the uncle with a pure, innocent gaze as the latter displayed his boring methods. Finally and as slightly as possible, she should offend the female master in the capital and bear the consequences for a bit. Then she should find a way to let the male master know about it. Any man would have a strange desire to protect, especially his own daughter. Under such circumstances, Count Sinan would certainly remember the daughter left behind by his late head wife. But there were still limits to such methods and Fans Yan hinted as in the letter. Fans Yan didn't know if this trick he picked up in his previous life from romance novels would work, but he believed that if Ra or Yuo was bright enough, she would figure it out. Afterwards, he impatiently waited for her to write back. He was afraid he might bring trouble to the 11-year-old girl. Two months later, Fan Ra or Yuo's letter came. From the content, Fans Yan could tell that his younger sister had been happy recently. He didn't know if it was due to his suggestions or if there was never an incident of mistreatment in the capital in the first place. In the letter, Fan Ra or Yuo asked why treat the servants kindly. Seeing this made Fans Yan realize that, in a hierarchical society such as this, not everyone was equal. In response to her question, he wrote back a few anecdotes to explain to her that kindness benefits both others and oneself. Fans Yan had originally planned on copying down some stories from the Decameron and send them along with the letter. In his previous life, Fans Yan remembered the leading critics always praising Giovanni Boccaccio for glorifying romance and equality between men and women in his words. But after giving it some more thought, Fans Yan gave up on the idea. As he remembered there were a lot of adult content in the Decameron. This was a small episode of Fans Yan's free time that somehow provided him with some mental sustenance, and it got to the point where seeing how that girl was doing in the capital became one of the highlights of his life. Although Fan Ra or Yuo was very young, she could sense her older brother in Danzu was no ordinary child. Despite their age difference, the siblings' exchange of letters like these showed that Fan Ra or Yuo was slowly being influenced by Fan Xian. Her vocabulary was much more mature than that of other girls her age. She had also started to notice the minute changes occurring in the world. Kites in spring, fish in summer, bluebirds in autumn, geese in winter. Between the exchange of letters, seasons passed. Dash. When he wrote to Fan Ra or Yuo, Fans Yan always shook his head and smiled uneasily. His arms during these years had never been healthy, 
either swollen or in stabbing pain. Sometimes he could not raise his right hand and had to resort to writing with his left. Fan Ra Eruo was astonished by how her older brother's handwriting seemed to change with every letter. Everything began on that night six years ago. After old Fleft, little Fan Yan was feeling lonely and sneaked outside through a dog hole. He arrived at the strange grocery store that was often closed. Familiar with the route, Fans Yan came to the back door, took out the key from the dense vegetation you under the stone steps, and entered. It had been pitch black inside the store, but with Fans Yan's arrival, a small oil lamp was lit. Little Fans Yan sniffed the air and easily found the yellow wine Wuzhu had prepared for him. Smiling sweetly, he took up the bowl and drank. Wuzhu did not drink. Fans Yan had never even seen him eat. And this was something he had gotten used to early on. Understandably, such a scene was rather absurd, a six-year-old boy indulging himself in alcohol like some free wanderer. Anyone who saw this would surely do a double take. Wu Zhu always let fans yawn drink with no intention of stopping him. He even prepared some appetizers for the young master. While yellow wine was not very strong, drinking too much would still make one a bit tipsy. Intoxicated. The cute fans Yan squinted, watching the forever expressionless blind man, who didn't seem to age. Uncle, how come after all these years your appearance hadn't changed? It's like you don't get old. Fans Yan then continued to answer himself. It looks like after becoming strong enough, you can obtain eternal youth. But uncle, didn't you say you never trained using Neagong? Uncle. How many people in this world are truly strong? How are the levels established? Nine levels in total? Nine again? Why? The drunk little thing didn't realize he was conflicting himself. What level are you? Don't have one? Then, what level is that idiot who does the Sigu sword style in Dong Yai? Don't have one either? What about the uncle of what's his face? Still no level? All those were spoken by fans Yan himself. Finally, he chuckled. Could it be that I too will train to no level? The blind Wuzhu was chopping radish into thin strands. His hand was slow yet steady. The knife was quick on the way down, but as soon as the blade came in contact with the chopping board it was immediately withdrawn. The level of accuracy was scary. The result was strands of radish of equal thickness, as if they had been shaped by industrial tools. They lay flat on the chopping board looking very exquisite. Wu Zhu raised his head and blinked out slightly. He walked up to Fan's Yan and put the kitchen knife in the boy's hands. Chapter 18 Blood and Tears That night, Fan's Yan stared blankly at the radishes on the chopping board, gripping the vegetable knife. After having spent time digging up and dismembering corpses, he was to embark on his second course of study, extremely useful, but extremely tragic. Sometimes he found his life truly meaningful. Out of the blue, two bizarre teachers had come into his life who didn't seem to mind his thoroughly precocious nature. The skills that Fji and Wu Zhu had taught him, methods for poison and murder, were rather abnormal. Dot. Late in the night, a slight tapping could be heard from the back of the store. Business is slow today, said Wu Zhu, Leaning forward and speaking coldly, Fans Yan wiped the sweat from his brow. Looking at the mountainous pile of radishes that he had cut up, he smiled, moving his right wrist. He had discovered that, after years of chopping radishes, he had developed a quickness on par with Wu Zhu, and when it came to the fineness of the shredded radish, he was starting to catch up. But his right wrist still swelled and ached. The sound of chopping still echoed through the store and he knew that the difference between Wu Zhu's control of the knife and his own was enormous. Although he didn't understand what chopping radishes was supposed to do for his practice of martial arts, he was still aware that Wu Zhu was capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the four grand masters. So he began to immerse himself in the act of radish chopping, beating out a rhythm on the chopping board. Of course, this was not the only training he undertook with Wu Zhu. He spent many hours training in conventional techniques such as the horse stance and mountain climbing. Wu Zhu's demands on him were great. He spent so long in the horse stance that he found it near impossible to squat upon a chamber pot. He chopped vegetables until his wrists ached and he ran so far that he found it difficult to get up in the morning. But the hardest part was that every three days, 
Wu Zhu would take him to a remote place outside Danzu to train Dash although it was more accurate to say he simply beat the young boy senseless with all of his unparalleled strength. Dot. His was a bittersweet childhood, filled with blood and tears. This was how her ladyship had trained her servants back in the day, explained Wu Zhu. Fans Yan felt somewhat apprehensive about his training. It had to be hard, strict, and practical and involve a great amount of physical practice. In Fans Yan's previous life, this had been the principle that had gained China a great many gold medals. But Fans Yan did not complain. Instead, he simply smiled at the tasks that were assigned to him. On the surface, it seemed like he was only following orders. But his adult's intellect told him that this truly was all for his own good. The powerful Zenki within him had grown all the more violent over the years. He could hold it within the Danshan and Xushan points in his pubic region and his spine, but in the rest of his still developing body, he couldn't prevent it from overflowing and cutting off various meridians. He often found it appearing to overflow outward, and when that happened, the nearby furniture in the house usually ended up being damaged as a result. If this carried on, one day, the speed of his Zenki flow would surpass the growth of his meridians, and he would explode and die. He still didn't know if Wu Zhu even knew of any methods to control such a powerful Zenki flow. All he could do was train his body, and so his physical capabilities improved greatly. As he chopped radishes, he trained his powers of concentration and as the years passed he could feel his control over his Zenki becoming more stable. When it came to death, no one in the world had had the experiences that fans Yan had, no one feared death or cherished life quite as much he did. So he suffered all of Wu Zhu's training in silence, knowing that it would help him to overcome the side effects of the power that raged within him. Thinking about it later on. He understood the deeper meaning behind Wu Zhu's actions. If Zenki were fire, and the body were a stove, then training one's muscles was equivalent to forging a stronger stove, while training the mind and spirit was like making a larger hole in the stove in order to control the fire more effectively. As he suffered Wu Zhu's blows in training, he reminded himself, a strong sword cannot be forged without striking the steel, but it still hurt like hell. Dash. Morning came, Fan Xian awoke and rubbed the dust from his eyes. He rose from his bed and slipped under the servant girl's blanket. Sniffing her bodily aroma under the covers, he was satisfied. The servant girl, Sissy, was combing her hair when he noticed that he was already awake. Smiling, she walked to the edge of the bed and pulled the covers off the boy, who had wrapped himself up like a cocoon. She stopped combing, gathered up her hair, and went to prepare hot water for a bath. Fans Yan climbed off the bed and sat on the cotton pillow he had given Sissy. He lifted up his pants and peered in, and recited the words from a drinking game he used to play in his previous life, making rock-paper-scissor gestures. Who's horny? I'm horny. Who's horny? You're horny. He raised his eyebrows and lifted his pants again, looking down. I'm horny, he said to himself. You still don't know how. He'd spent many years in this world and had gotten used to being waited on hand and foot. He yawned and waited for the servant girl to return. After waiting for what seemed like ages, he fell back to sleep, and found himself being awoken by a hot towel being rubbed in his face. The distant sound of angry shouting came from the courtyard. Fans Yan dressed himself and, led by his curiosity, he made his way out the door. He soon came across a rather awful scene. In the garden, Zhu the housekeeper was severely scolding the servant girl Sissy. It seemed that he was angry because she was rushing to prepare the hot water and had not combed her hair or dressed properly. The other servant girls surrounded them, clearly frightened. Zhu the housekeeper had come from the capital a few years ago. Fan Xian knew that he had been sent by the count's mistress to spy on the household, but he had seemed like an earnest enough man throughout that one year and fans Yan had never caught Zhu doing anything suspicious as he watched him in secret, so he let him do as he pleased. But this scolding of the servant girls displeased fans Yan. He was a very protective person. Squinting his eyes, he went forth and interceded, but for whatever reason, Zhu was not in a mood to be trifled with. Sissy was to be punished. Fans Yan knitted his brow and looked up at the housekeeper with his adorable face. They're my servants, he said smiling, 
and I'll deal with them myself. They were ordinary words, even a little weak. But the servant girls knew what they meant, and it filled them with fear. They did not know whether the danger of a clash between the two branches of Count Sunan's estate, one in the capital, one in Danzu, could be kept back much longer. Chapter 19 a matter of dignity. Housekeeper Zhu was somewhat arrogant today for some reason. He forced a fake smile, young master, regarding the things in the house, the countess said I'm still in charge. Housekeeper Zhu stretched out the title of young master intentionally as he said it, his disrespect was obvious. Smiling, Fan Xian noted the hint of contempt in the housekeeper's eyes. While he never felt bad for being an illegitimate child, being looked down upon and treated like a bastard were still uncomfortable experiences. Seeing things going downhill, a certain smart girl went away to find the countess as the other maidservants only observed nervously. Although on the surface the two houses were connected, everyone knew that young master Fan's Yan's background wasn't all that glorious. Besides, all of the estate's supplies for living in Danzu Harbor came from the capital from the hands of the second wife. Because he had a close connection with the second wife, the housekeeper dared to show the young master such disrespect. After all, in everyone's eyes, the one to inherit the grand property of the Sunan branch house would only be that little young master in the capital, not the twelve-year-old youth standing here smiling lovingly. The servants, as much as they loved and respected Fan's yawn, dared not offend the second wife at such a crucial moment. They stood to the other side of Fan's Yan. Only Fan's Yan's personal maidservant tightly held his hand. Fan's Yan understood very well what the servants were thinking. Anyone who wanted a better life didn't exactly have it easy, and therefore would not feel sadness or disappointment. They only tilted their heads, looking at this unhappy housekeeper Zhu with curiosity, thinking, he had always been calm. So what finally made him snap? Housekeeper Zhu is Count Sunan's second housekeeper in Jingdu. Because he made some small mistakes in the capital, he was chased far away to the remote Danzu harbor. However, housekeeper Zhu did not believe he had actually departed from the lavishness of the capital, and did not grieve over it. Count Sunan's head wife had been dead for many years and his second wife gave birth to a son seven years ago. Because the second wife's family had some reputation, naturally, she wanted to take advantage of the situation and aim for a proper place. It was during a time like this housekeeper who arrived in Danzu. Undoubtedly, he had come with ill intentions. In order to fulfill his duty, he meticulously managed the Count's estate and was exceptionally respectful towards the Countess. He was also kind towards the servants and rarely meddled with the private affairs of others. But every time he saw that little mongrel, the one who led to his disguised exile, he couldn't help but show his true feelings. No one knew why, but he was a bit afraid of the young boy, despite the latter being only in his early teens. Because no matter where he went, he could almost always see that boy's faintly smiling face and his pair of clear eyes, as neat and pretty as that face was, anyone would feel disturbed if it followed them around constantly from the moment they woke up. When housekeeper Zhu kindly greeted the servants, little fans Yan's pretty face was hidden among the flowers, staring at the housekeeper blankly, when housekeeper Zhu scowled over the statements of account. Little Fan's Yan propped his face up on the windowsill of the accountant chamber, staring at the housekeeper innocently, and when housekeeper Zhu made his report to the countess with utmost respect, Little Fan's Yan rested his face next to the countess, staring at him with infinite curiosity. After several months like this, housekeeper Zhu was almost driven insane. He could see that innocent beautiful face at all times. It was like the face of a ghost floating in white mist, a face that beautiful could only belong to a ghost, a face which stared at him so intensely. With his psyche almost at its breaking point, he even began to become paranoid. Could that boy know he was sent here to deal with him? But then housekeeper Zhu thought, that little mongrel is too young, how could he know the dangers of the adult world? But... Why is he always looking at me? Why, just like now, if I were him, I'd feel humiliation. How could he still smile like that? Housekeeper Zhu smiled coldly, thinking, 
thing will be over soon, there is no need for me to get upset over this brat. Dot. Fans Yan didn't realize his unscrupulous observation of housekeeper Zhu would be so taxing on the housekeeper's psyche. But even if he had known, he wouldn't feel sorry about it. He was only curious as to what methods this ant in the capital would deploy to deal with him. But after seeing housekeeper Zhu scolding his maidservant to save face, Fans Yan's expression turned gloomy. After hearing how the housekeeper pronounced young master, Fans Yan's smile slowly faded. I heard young master chased a maidservant out of the house a few years ago, such unruly behavior certainly won't do. Housekeeper Zhu continued to talk with disdain, ignoring the youth's gradually worsening expression. You are still young, it would be best from now on if you didn't worry about the things in the house. Fans Yan laughed. Are you warning me to stay put? Housekeeper Zhu claimed he wouldn't dream of it, but his tone was overflowing with arrogance. Who would dare? It's just that before coming here, the second wife ordered me to look after you, since you are still of tender age. So then you aren't afraid of me using my authority as your master to slap that big mouth of yours? Fans Yan asked, curious. Housekeeper Zhu chuckled, stroking the sparsely grown beard on his chin. He said, young master. Even though you lost your mother as an infant and lacked discipline growing up, everyone knows that you still had the upbringing of a learned scholar. You wouldn't treat your servants so harshly. The housekeeper looked at the beautiful youth before him and laughed to himself on the inside. A mere child he is, to think he would try to use his authority to threaten me. Oh! Fans Yan came back to his senses as if just realizing his identity as an illegitimate child, he turned and left. The maid servants, while secretly wanting justice for the young master, took a breath of relief since no conflicts had occurred. Sissy held Fans Yan's hand as her eyes began to tear up. She felt sorry for the young master, but was afraid he would become upset. Only after sigh dying Fans Yan and discovering tranquility in his eyes did she finally come to peace. Taking Sis's hand, Fans Yan led her inside and set up two stools by the door. He made Sissy sit on one of them before making his way into the garden with another stool. The maid servants had not yet dispersed. Housekeeper Zhu was still savoring his earlier display of courage. Fans Yan set the stool directly in front of Housekeeper Zhu. Those nearby were puzzled. Housekeeper Zhu was no exception, and was about to raise a question. But little Fans Yan had already stepped onto the stool. At only 12 years of age, Fans Yan was not very tall. On top of a stool, he was only the same height as Housekeeper Zhu. The people were confused not knowing what Fan Xian was about to do. At that moment, Fan Xian puffed two breaths into his right palm and raised it high. What are you doing? The sentence hung in housekeeper Zhu's mouth and came out with a shower of spit. Fan Xian brutally swung his little hand forward. With a loud and crisp smack, housekeeper Zhu tumbled over to the ground. A red handprint appeared on his face, and there was some blood on the corner of his mouth. He was physically stunned by the hit. There was no way he would have expected such strength to come from a child, not to mention. This child. Actually dared to hit him in the first place. Little fans Yan hopped down from the stool, flexed his wrist, and took a handkerchief from a maidservant standing close by. He wiped hand as he looked at the housekeeper, who was groaning while holding his face, and said in a light voice. Even a learned scholar would resort to violence. Even though I don't abuse my servants, I am more than happy to show you the style of a son from a wealthy family. Chapter 20 Standing at the top, Zhu the housekeeper laid on the ground miserably, the mark on his face red as a peach blossom. He spat out a few broken teeth and was half dizzy in shock. He directed a weak gaze full of fear and horror towards Fan Xian. I seriously don't understand what you guys think. Fans Yan said in a quiet voice. Did you really believe I wouldn't hit you? You seem to have forgotten your place. Perhaps a more cultured master wouldn't do anything to his servants, but that is not me, unfortunately. Don't tell me you're going to hit back. So, that's that. All you can do is to deal with it and endure, laugh, or go cry about it to the countess or back in the capital. But, from now on, don't go into the back garden. I dislike seeing you. After saying this, 
he dusted his pants off and turned to Sissy who was sitting dumbfounded on the stool. He told her quietly that he wanted to go out and left the Count's estate. Behind him, looks of fear inevitably surfaced on the faces of the servants. None of them would have thought this cute, gentle boy had such a violent side to him. The contrast between the two sides shook everyone to the core and made it all the more terrifying. At this time, the Countess had arrived in the back garden too. She looked at the groaning housekeeper on the ground and thought of that child. She couldn't help but express a glint of meaningful happiness. Chasing the head servant out of the house last year, and slapping Zhu the housekeeper silly today, the twelve-year-old fans Yan finally established his authority in the Count's estate. Dot. Along the shore five kilometers from Danzu Harbor was a dangerous region covered by reefs. The sea winds churned up the blue water, smashing it against the rocks into huge sprays of white foam. On the east side, there was an extremely narrow passage hidden among the hazardous rocks. Fans Yan came along that path. He turned his body with his back to the sea. Listening to the deafening sound of waves at his back, he looked up. In front of him was a series of steep cliffs. This mountain was formed naturally next to the sea. Behind the mountain were ancient forests and swamps spanning hundreds of li, making scaling the cliffs the only way to reach the apex. Taking a look at the cliffs, Fans Yan frowned slightly. In his mind, he traced the path he always took while climbing. However, the sea winds had been strong recently and the rocks which stuck out from the cliff were loose. If he were to climb to the top today, he must be more careful than usual. The sea crashed into the reefs behind him, but the rocks proved cold and insurmountable, with only some seawater reaching the shallows, making this area of the shore wetter than others. Fans Yan's shoes got wet from standing there and his feet felt quite uncomfortable. Taking off his shoes, Fans Yan put them in a clean cavity just below the cliffs. Taking some coarse sand and rubbing his palms together, he began to adjust his inner zanki. Having readied himself, he planted his right hand securely onto an inconspicuous outcropping and deftly lifted his entire body into the air. He began to climb up as if he waited next to nothing. He ascended rapidly, with his entire body flattened against the cliff surface. He looked like some strange animal which was adept at climbing. Each time he reached out his hand, planted down with his foot, or lifted himself upwards, it all seemed effortless, there were no signs of difficulty. After only a short while, he was close to the top. The sea wind whirled behind him, blowing away his body heat and sweat making him feel refreshed. I bet even Gojing couldn't climb this fast. But the blind man at the top of this mountain will be much fiercer than Ma Yu. Fans Yan thought back on what happened in the garden as he continued to climb. Something didn't feel right to him. That precious housekeeper of the second wife stayed put for over a year. Why did he happen to mess up today? The sea winds carried moisture, making the exposed rocks somewhat slippery. Seeing that he was almost to the top, Fans Yan relaxed his focus, thinking about what happened earlier only distracted him further. His right hand slipped and he almost fell. As dangerous as that seemed, Fans Yan did not panic and directed his zenki into his right hand. With three fingers, he latched tightly onto the only piece of projecting rock that could support him. Shaking slightly, his fingers looked as if they were deeply embedded into the rock, unmovable. A wooden stick reached down from above gesturing him to grab it. Fans Yan seemingly wanted to avoid this stick very much. He didn't even look at it and started to swing his body. With the tip of his feet, he kicked against the cliff's surface, providing him with the momentum to propel his entire body to the top. The maneuver was as risky as it looked. You weren't focusing enough. That could cost you your life. At the mountain top, on the edge of the cliffs, Wu Zhu stood facing the sea breeze. His clothes were made from coarse fabric and a strip of black cloth covered his eyes. Fan Xian ignored him and sat down in a lotus position. After a short period of adjustment, he stood back up and told Wu Zhu about what happened today at the house. He also expressed his suspicions, hoping Wu Zhu could provide a definitive answer. You think a single slap will keep the housekeeper in check? Wu Zhu asked coldly. I do. As long as grandma is on my side, fans Yan said as he lowered his head. While he didn't imbue that slap with Zenki, 
The great power stored within his fragile young body over the years was still frightening. More importantly, he displayed his gloomy temperament at the most crucial moment. This was dreadful indeed. Then that's enough. Wu Zhu didn't appear to want to probe deeper into the matter. This is only my suspicion, but why did the housekeeper decide to stir things up today? He has spent over a year in Danzu Harbor with his tail between his legs. Under normal circumstances, there really isn't any reason for him to show his ugly colors now, unless he feels that he's had enough and something will happen in Danzu soon. Maybe, in his eyes. I'm no longer a threat to my half-brother in the capital, and so he no longer sees a need to please me. Fans Yan smiled bitterly, a look which did not match his youthful face. It was indeed strange, now that he mentioned it. If Ji was somewhat uncertain and fearful regarding Fans Yan's early maturity, Wu Zhu, on the other hand, was unconcerned about this. It looked as though Wu Zhu would not react to anything when it came to Fans Yan. Even if Fans Yan were to turn into a tree demon, Fans Yan thought that perhaps it was because Hu Zhu was blind and unable to see the expressions that Fans Yan unknowingly made, expressions which shouldn't appear on the face of a child. That's trivial, Wu Zhu said suddenly. He obviously felt Fans Yan was overanalyzing the subject. I predict someone will came to kill me. Is that trivial? Fans Yan laughed. Wu Zhu coldly replied. G and I have taught you so much. If you can't handle something as trivial as that, then it becomes non-trivial. Fans Yan thought about it for a moment, and accepted the fact. He understood that Master Wu Zhu would not take care of things for him this time. Let's begin. Okay. Dot. After a long while, in a remote area above the cliffs, Fans Yan removed his tunic. Again. He moaned dejectedly to the side. As soon as his voice floated away from the cliffs, a wooden stick came down from above, mercilessly striking his back with a muffled crack. Chapter 21, Pain Currently, the overwhelming Zinke inside Fans Yan had reacted automatically, forming a dense layer which blanketed his back. However, the wooden stick was even faster and stabbed him before the Zenki could react. The term stab meant that the stick was thrust in a straight line by its owner, with all the power focused into the tip. Fans Yan let out a cry. Although the youth's body was protected by Zenki, the blow he just received sent pain down to the bone, causing his body to curl up. One moment he was writhing on the ground in pain. The next he pushed off against the ground with his hands and started to roll while assuming the same curled up position. Fans Yan ferociously kicked behind him. Seeing a beautiful young boy performing such an insidious kick was enough to shock anybody, though what answered his kick was a simple slapping sound. Dot. Fans Yan half knelt on the ground, continuously massaging his ankle. He inhaled the cold air as his face twisted from the pain. He knew begging for mercy would be useless, as proven early on these past few years. All he could do was eye the blind man standing three meters away and calculating his next move. As agreed, if he could land a single blow on the blind man, even a corner of his clothing, it would be considered a victory for Fans Yan, with the reward being a month-long break. Having suffered several years of being beaten, Fans Yan had yet to accomplish that, due in part to Wu Zhu being alarmingly swift and not giving away his position. Even more terrifyingly, Wu Zhu made no extra movements that would give away what he planned to do next, making him unpredictable to Fans Yan. As an example, with Wu Zhu, indicators such as line of sight cannot be taken advantage of. Secondly, that inconspicuous wooden stick, Every time Fans Yan tried to get near Wu Zhu using Zenki or underhanded tricks, that stick would move like the claw of a demon from hell, mercilessly slamming into Fans Yan's wrists, ankles, or even his fingers. They weren't broken, but they hurt. The pain was unbearable. What absolutely baffled Fans Yan was that, no matter how hard he tried to muffle the sound of his movements, Wu Zhu, through his blindfold, could still locate and hit him every time without fail despite the roaring of the waves crashing into the rocks below. Ayayaya. Taking another hit to the wrist, Fans Yan cried out, his voice dragging like he was singing Beijing Opera. He distanced himself away from that merciless blind man. Dot. A small, 
Nameless yellow flower bloomed meekly on the cliffs. Fans Yan lay on the edge of the cliff, his strength gone. The sea below had already calmed down, glistening gold from sunshine. The reefs that were constantly bashed by the waves finally gained a moment of peace and began to slowly dry. Some crustaceans climbed over them looking like tiny black dots when viewed from above. Touching the painful spots on his body, Fans Yan navigated his chi to inspect his interior condition. He discovered that his rampaging Zanki had been partially absorbed into the Xushan behind his waist, while the rest of it was used up trying to defend against those relentless stick strikes. The Zanki inside him right now was calm. Just like the sea before him, Fans Yan knew resting now would do his training no good, and so, in spite of the soreness and pain, he got up with great difficulty and assumed a lotus position as he began to carry out the maneuvers from the scrolls of power. He shot a glance at Wu Zhu, who was standing at the cliff's edge. The black strip of cloth which covered Wu Zhu's eyes flapped in the sea wind. That's really cool, not just acting cool. Fan Xian made a silent judgment about the blind man. He said in a quiet voice, Careful, uncle, or you'll fall. Naturally, a powerful character such as Wu Zhu would not die from simply falling off a cliff. Fan Xian was only making meaningless chatter. Don't get distracted. Wu Zhu only spoke one emotionless sentence and stopped responding to Fan Xian. Fan Xian signed and started to calm himself, entering a state of meditation. After who knows how long, he came back to himself among the sea winds, and discovered the sun had already changed its position. And Wu Zhu, not too far away from him, still kept the same posture, looking like a sturdy flagpole which could never be broken. Fans Yan stood up, noticing his body had completely recovered, his zenki full to the brim. The pressure on his meridian also died down significantly, while his muscles, ankles, and wrists still ached. Those would be taken care of once he returns to the branch house and rub on the medicine he prepared himself. Walking through the wind, which carried the faint smell of the sea, Fan Xian walked over and stood next to Wu Zhu, and would have been shoulder to shoulder if he weren't so much shorter than the blind man. Fan Xian picked up a rock and chucked it towards the sea with all his might. Currently, Zaiki was flooding throughout his body making his strength much greater than that of regular people. The rock flew far, and when it finally hit the water, the splash could barely be seen by the naked eye. Somewhat full of himself, fans Yan thought not even those master martial artists could match his arm strength. Seeing the powerful waves and the birds flying freely overhead, his spirits got a boost from what was around him. He spread his arms wide and roared at the sea. Capital. I will arrive one day. Wu Zhu still stood there in silence, as if not hearing Fan Xian. Dot. What are you going to do? Fan Xian blinked out a bit before realizing Wu Zhu, who was always reserved with his words as if they were gold, finally spoke. He answered, smiling, I'm going to see exactly what the world is like, of course, the outside world is dangerous. Wu Zhu said in his usual cold tone. He did not turn around. Fans Yan shrugged his frail shoulders, looking somewhat mischievous. With Uncle Wu Zhu protecting me, what would I be afraid of? After the lady was born, I forgot some things. There was a pause in Wu Zhu's otherwise unchanging tone. There are many people in this world who could harm me, and naturally they could harm you too. Uncle is so modest. Fans Yan laughed sweetly, thinking. In this still unfamiliar world, I have only you as my bodyguard. If ever you decide to walk away, what would I do? If I was with you in the capital, I would bring you trouble. Fans Yan raised his head, looking at Wu Zhu's almost eternally expressionless face, and thought for a moment. He then answered, with some embarrassment, I would protect you. Wu Zhu finally turned around after hearing this, and intensely looked Fans Yan in the eye, and said, the lady dot she said the same thing. Fans Yan smiled, knowing part of his shamelessness came from his mother after all. Chapter 22, The Poets Why do you wish to see this world? Wu Zhu seemed to be pondering something. The place you are standing right now, isn't it part of this world? Fans Yan didn't know how to answer that question, for he came from another world, and therefore would naturally be curious about many things in this world. Furthermore, 
He needed to find the answer to a question which had been bothering him for the longest time. How did he end up in this world? Ji once mentioned the temple six years ago, when he still taught at Tanzu. At the time, fans Yan thought, other than the divine intervention, what else could turn a person dying from illness into the youth he was today? He had been intrigued by this temple ever since and wanted to see what was inside. The capital, too, was a place he really wanted to visit. Fan Ra Eruo didn't know if she could live a happy life under her stepmother's protection, and left Fji for a few years. Just for a bit, Fan Xian wanted to visit that perverted but cute old man. Most importantly, because he had been bedridden for so long in his previous life. His current life so far in Danzu as a child had presented Fans Yan with a jarring contrast. The contrast manifested in Fans Yan's heart like a ball of fire, burning his psyche, stimulating his hopes, making him want to do something, gain something. Peace and ambition, privilege and happiness, romance and beautiful women. These nouns didn't exactly match each other. They were incompatible, and yet they flashed across Fans Yan's mind. After thinking for a while, he answered carefully, Since you only live once, the only way to make the most out of this unrepeatable game is to go around seeing different sights and meeting different people. That was what Fans Yan really thought. During his previous life, he gave a lot of thought on his deathbed on how he would live in his next life, should there ever be one. Wu Zhu said, what do you plan to do? First, I must make sure I survive. Fan Xian kneeled to pick up another rock. When he threw it this time, there was no, and the rock shattered on the reefs below, which is why I must obtain the means to protect myself. And then, I've set three goals for myself. Wu Zhu quietly listened. First, I am going to father many, many children. Second, I am going to write many, many books. And third, I am going to live a very, very nice life. Fans Yan was extremely calm as he said such absurd things there wasn't the slightest sign of embarrassment. Deep down, he reasoned that, since this world was not Earth, then as the sole example of a human from Earth, it was his biological duty to pass down the human's legacy by fathering many children in this world. At the same time, he believed he also represented the civilizations of Earth. Humanity's accomplishments in art through the millennia could not be found in this world. If he couldn't write, or should it be copy? Many, many books and let literary legacies such as Kao Zukin's works and Kill Bill shine in this ignorant world. He would feel sorry for the sages of this parallel universe living in solitude. And of course, he would feel most sorry for himself. Naturally. He also saw himself as the only earthling who could observe this world, and therefore he had to make sure he could live a comfortable life. Only by doing so could he live to a ripe old age and observe for as many years as possible. It wouldn't be until many years later that fans Yan finally admitted those were all excuses to rationalize and glorify his hidden desires, his perversion, shamelessness, and greed. On the cliffs by the sea, Wu Zhu seemed to require some time to fully understand what fans Yan's three goals really. Calmly, he analyzed, then you need to marry many wives, find many Sayok, and hire many servants. Sayok? Fans Yan knew the term but was still unsure what it meant here. Scholars in poverty who write manuscripts for other people, they have no rights to authorship. Fans Yan grinned. He had original planned on making big names like Old Cow and Old Shabby his ghostwriters and had no need for Say Oak. As he thought that, Wu Zhu continued his overly simplistic analysis. If you are to marry many wives, hire many servants and Say Oak, then you need to earn a lot of money. If you want to earn a lot of money, then you need a lot of authority. The more authority you need. The closer you must be to this nation's center of power. Wu Zhu neatly turned around to leave. As soon as you turn 16, we're going back to the capital. Behind Wu Zhu, fans Yan stayed where he stood, staring blankly. He had merely expressed some of his not so unreasonable ideas, but somehow this slightly mentally challenged strong one deducted them to be related to a matter of national power. Not to mention he just cleanly made decision to go back to the capital, fans Yan still remembered, on the day he was born, Wu Zhu carried him on his back and escaped from the capital. 
Fans Jan didn't know if he should laugh or cry at his current situation, so he slapped himself hard to get out of his trance. He caught up to Wu Zhu, and said, Uncle, I told you what's on my heart, shouldn't you reward me with something? What do you want to know? My mother, why were people after us in the capital? Regarding the lady, I will tell you everything once you turn 16, as that's the lady's final wish. As for the people after us, you don't need to know. Since they all died ten years ago, when they got back to Danzu Harbor, it was already noon. Fans Yan parted from Wuzhu a distance away, and Fans Yan made his way into the city by himself. The people of the city had already gotten used to seeing this young master wander outside on his own. Although there were no wild beasts or dangerous places around, people still felt the Count's estate was too careless regarding the safety of this illegitimate son. After all, in their eyes, Fans Yan was merely a 12-year-old boy. For the Danzu inhabitants, who lived carefree without needing to pay taxes to the imperial court, they had plenty of spare time to come up with some odd theories. For example, they wondered if the people of the branch house wanted the illegitimate son to get eaten by wild beasts or fall down a cliff. With that idea in mind, Seeing this cute boy live in this supposedly dangerous mansion made their hearts race. Fans Yan didn't know what they were thinking and kept smiling slightly. Lowering his head just a little, he returned to the Count's estate. The servants were waiting for him, knowing that he would return to eat. The Countess sat on the old, wooden armchair, her eyes half-closed as if she were sleepy. Chapter 23, Makuzi Young Master is back. A male servant shouted. All the servants immediately busied themselves with preparing lunch. Fans Yan and the Countess sat opposite each other at a large table in the hall. The table was scattered with a mess of various dishes. Something was off about this scene. Rather than retreat to the back courtyard to eat, the idle servants simply stared at Fans Yan's chopsticks. Several of the younger servant girls were quietly salivating. They seemed hungry. This was an unwritten rule in the Count's mansion. Fans Yan stringently demanded it, and the Countess acquiesced, so everybody had gotten used to it long ago. As long as young Master Fan was having a meal in the mansion, Others could only be permitted to eat after he had personally tasted and approved of each dish. The servants didn't understand why the young master, who had always been gentle and tender, insisted on such an unreasonable rule. One time, however, Donger, the servant who was closest to Fans Yan, tasted the saltiness of his food before Fans Yan did. She was subsequently driven from the mansion by a ferocious Fans Yan. After that, everybody knew that the young master did, after all have a shameless aristocratic side to him. When Donger cried and left, the Countess just stared at her coolly without a word. The entire mansion was silent, except for the sounds of fans yawn chewing and sipping soup. All of the servants quietly stood beside him with their arms at their sides obediently. Like all noble households, whatever food the master didn't eat was always sent to the servants' quarters as a reward. So Fans Yan ate less of each dish. He just picked away at the food with his chopsticks. He ate slowly and carefully, with thin lips pressing and relaxing like two beams of light opening and closing. The Countess was gently caressing a statue and mouthing a silent prayer. After a long time, Fans Yan had tasted each dish. He laughed sweetly with bright, beaming eyes. He pointed at a plate of stir-fried bamboo shoots and told one of the servants. This one's good. The servant girls breathed a sigh of relief and began to fill their bowls with rice. The idle servants could finally go to the back courtyard, but another servant went to the kitchen and brought the remaining stir-fried bamboo shoots out to the hall, placing them in front of Fans Yan. Help yourself, ma'am. Fans Yan stood up, saluted the countess and received the bowl of food with both hands before politely placing it in front of the countess. He repeatedly added the stir-fried bamboo shoots into his bowl, munching on them with a pleasant expression. On his handsome face, that kind of smile seemed exceptionally grotesque, as though he'd finally found something he'd been after for a long time. For some reason, the servant girls standing to the side, upon seeing the smile on the twelve-year-old boy's face, couldn't help but shiver as they recalled the powerful smack that Zhu the housekeeper took that morning. Dot.
I'll go to my room to finish my meal. Fans Yan told the servants this before taking a plate of stir-fried bamboo shoots and a bowl of white trace and going to his room in the side courtyard. It was very impolite of him to leave before his elder had finished her meal, but the countess didn't say anything. In his bedroom, he ate some emetic powder and then started poking his fingers down his throat. After digging around for a while, he finally vomited out the remnants of the meal. He then immediately took several pills he had prepared himself out of the drawer and washed them down with fresh water. He directed his zinky throughout his entire body and discovered there didn't seem to be any problems. This finally put him at ease. He looked at the plate of stir-fried bamboo shoots, smiling bitterly. He dumped them out into the chamber pot behind his bed, they had been poisoned with Makuzi a method often used by the secret agents in the Council of Auditors. Makuzi is a beautiful, tangerine-like fruit which grows in the southern islands. Its flowers emit a strange, pungent odor and its fruit contains poison. When the fruit's juice is mixed with food, the dish is unlikely to change color and it will still smell normal. On the contrary, it will actually make the dish more fragrant. It was frequently used by the spies of the Council of Auditors in carrying out assassinations. After entering the body, the poison takes effect that night, when the victim convulses before dying. This is very similar to death by infection, thus making it difficult to divine the true cause of death. As the only student of G, the inventor of this poison in the Council of Auditors, Fans Yan immediately identified its slightly bitter taste when he tried the stir-fried bamboo shoots. The murderer was actually quite clever, for they knew to mix the makuzi fruit juice with bamboo shoots, which were themselves bitter. The reason Fans Yan didn't immediately leave the countess just now to purge the poison was to keep her from being frightened. Now, he suddenly felt scared when he considered that if it had been some kind of fast-acting poison, instead of makuzi he'd already be dead. Fans Yan took his teacher's advice in always being attentive to his diet. He worried that his aunt in the capital might strike a vicious blow. That's why he had to cause such an odd scene while eating just now. To keep the servants safe from any poison, he requested that he taste each dish before anybody else could begin eating. He was like the eunuch in the imperial palace responsible for testing each dish before the emperor could eat it. Though Fans Yan believed his own life was more important than anybody else's, he wasn't willing to have innocent people die for him. Dash. Seeing that the young master had came to the kitchen, the servants quickly stood up and offered him a stool. Younger master. Are you still hungry? Do you want to eat something? One of them asked with a smile. Fans Yan smiled and said, Those stir-fried bamboo shoots were delicious. The chef standing next to him laughed, I'm glad you enjoyed them. Yes, they were quite fresh. When were they bought? Fans Yan nodded enthusiastically and asked carefully. We bought them this morning, so of course they were fresh. Oh, right. Did any outsiders enter the kitchen today? Mr. Ha who normally delivers food, was ill. His nephew came instead. All right then, I should get going. Fans Yan took a piece of smoked meat from the plate the chef offered. He ate it and, smiling bashfully, said, Don't tell the countess that I came down here to pilfer food. When Fans Yan left, the servants began talking about him. They all commended the character of the Count's illegitimate son saying he was free of any aristocratic vices. It was just that. His rules for eating were a little too much. In an alleyway in Danzu Harbor, Fans Yan was scaling the back wall of some building with his hook-like fingers. When he exerted his strength, he was like a climbing civet cat. He was at the food delivery man Mr. Ha's house. For many years, there were a total of only a dozen or so servants at the Count's mansion, all of which were natives of Danzu Harbor with the exception of several maids who had been replaced. So Fans Yan didn't suspect any of them. Though Fans Yan had met Mr. Ha before, he thought it was strange that he should fall ill at such an opportune moment. Mr. Ha's room was pitch black, but for Fans Yan, it was as bright as daytime. He quietly slipped into the room and smelled a trace of blood in the air. Chapter 24, Assassin Mr. Ha's corpse lay on the bed, covered by a cotton blanket with only his feet poking out. The smell of blood was faint, 
meaning the assassin had done some clean-up. Fans Yan would have missed it had he not developed a sharp nose while under Fji's tutelage. Fans Yan stood quietly in the corner. The darkness hid the assassin, and also Fans Yan. Trying to mimic blind Wu Zhu's techniques, Fans Yan relaxed himself as much as possible. Zaiki flowed slowly inside his body as his heartbeat merged with the noises outside. The assassin should still be around. The Overwatch Council's secret agents were always thorough. After poisoning Fans Yan, they would certainly stay until the night in order to ensure the bastard son was dead, after which they would leave Danzo under the cover of darkness. Since the assassin was posing as Mr. Ha's nephew, they must be familiar with the layout of the building, so they wouldn't want to change observation spots. Unfortunately, Fans Yan couldn't have expected how things would develop. He studied the room carefully. Other than Mr. Ha's cold body on the bed, there were no other people in the room. He slowly followed the wall, moving further into the room, careful not to noisily bump into any furniture. His eyes glanced over some inconspicuous corners of the ceiling. He snuck along the wall to the window where light shone through. Mr. Ha obviously wasn't rich enough to afford more windows. So the room was poorly lit. Fans Yan stood beside the window, hiding his presence by taking advantage of the contrast between light and dark. After standing there for a long time, he frowned. Had he been wrong? Perhaps that poison-toting assassin was long gone. If that was the case, coming to the house right away instead of keeping Zhu under watch was obviously the wrong move. Fans Yan walked to the bed wanting to take a look at how poor old Mr. Ha died. But he became tenser the closer he got to the bed. He heard the sound of suppressed breathing. Because of the noises from the market outside, the breathing wasn't audible until fans Yan closed in. The assassin hid behind Mr. Ha's body when he noticed someone had entered the house. The breathing behind the body was extremely steady about seven breaths per minute. If Fans Yan didn't have his unusually abundant Zenki enhancing his hearing, he never would have noticed. Fans Yan stopped, staring at the bed. He didn't know if it was a trap. From outside came the lively calls of merchants. Fans Yan could pick out the faint sound of a certain carriage. He knew there was a market directly in front of this building, and that a horse-drawn carriage would have trouble navigating down the narrow road, and thus waited quietly with his dagger. The assassin also waited quietly. He didn't see who entered the room, but at this point he could tell that the intruder was equally patient. A long time later he started to feel like he had underestimated the dangers of Denzu. He regretted remaining here to ensure the death of his target. Dot. As the carriage passed through the market, the merchants on both sides began to hurl insults at the driver, who was obviously vexed. If he wasn't short on time, he never would have taken this route. With great difficulty, the merchants cleared a path for the carriage. The driver thanked them and was ready to proceed. However, the carriage smashed a crate of eggs, infuriating the egg merchant. The merchant held on to the reins, refusing to let go. The market descended into chaos. Meanwhile, in the house beside the marketplace, hearing the disturbance outside, Fans Yan took advantage of the noise and brought his right foot down hard. He vaulted himself to the side of the bed and mercilessly thrust a thin dagger into the area behind Mr. Ha's body. At that instant, Fans Yan got a clear look at the assassin's face. His eyes were cold and the brows above them were a little messy. Fans Yan could tell he was relatively young. His appearance was average, with slightly thick lips and dry skin. Caught completely off guard, the assassin suddenly moved his right hand. A small, black crossbow bolt burst out of the blanket, flying straight at Fans Yan's face. Fans Yan had already landed with his arm up, his entire torso was defenseless. The bolt sped like a beam of light. Fans Yan started to react as soon as the bolt was fired. For five years, Wu Zhu had beaten him with a stick that swung much faster than this bolt. When he landed, he didn't put all of his body weight down, and his other foot didn't come down. Twisting his toes, with his entire body stuck in a powerless position in the air, he retreated a few inches to the right. The bolt brushed past Fans Yan's left cheek, 
burying itself deep into the roof with a dull thud. The assassin was absolutely astonished. He couldn't believe that the person who came was this attractive youth who should have already been felled by poison. What was even more unbelievable was that this kid could dodge a point-blank, concealed crossbow shot. Presently, fans Jan's dagger plunged deep into the assassin's body with a disgusting, muffled sound. Fans Jan felt like he was stabbing into a slab of pork with a kitchen knife. Because he had to dodge the arrow, fans Jan's aim was off and he stabbed the assassin in the shoulder. He was still alive. The assassin writhed like an eel in water. He readied his left hand to give fans Jan a lethal strike, but the pain in his shoulder combined with the force of being slammed into the bed caused him to fall. The concealed crossbow slipped out of his fingers. He braced himself. But when he tried to get up, the pain was more intense than he ever could have imagined. Moreover, that boy's dagger had pierced through his shoulder and stuck into the bed. He had been pinned to the bed alive. Dot. With the assassin completely neutralized, Fans Jan's left hand clutched around his throat. The assassin finally showed his fear of death. His thick lips parted slightly as if wanting to say something. Fans Jan's heart tightened as he felt a chill. He didn't give the assassin the chance to talk or retaliate. With a crunch, Fans Jan broke the assassin's neck. His head slumped to the side and he died instantly. Fans Jan kept his hand on the assassin's broken neck for a moment, feeling the crushed pieces of bone. As the assassin's blood gradually cooled down, Fans Jan finally removed his hand and crouched over panting heavily. Chapter 25, Tofu-like Jade. It took some while for fans Jan to finally calm down. The cold sweat made his clothes stick to his body. He took the long, thin dagger out the assassin's shoulder. The terrible sound the blade made as it was dislodged from flesh and bone made him pause before he finally removed the small, insidiously hidden crossbow from the dead assassin's sleeve. The slender blade was covered in some sort of black opaque substance. Fans Jan knew that Masterf created a black coating that was not only poisonous but that could cause excruciating pain for anyone wounded by it. He carefully placed the blade inside a scabbard made of elephant hide and glanced at the corpses, those of the assassin on the bed and old Ha the vegetable cellar underneath it before he turned to leave. As he opened the door, Wu Zhu was standing quietly at the corner of the stairs. If the carriage hadn't come, what would you have done? He asked. Fans Yan lowered his head and said nothing for a long time. Finally, having managed to get a hold on the horrible feelings that his first kill had brought up in him, he raised his head and smiled. I would have stayed still like he did, and waited for you to come. They climbed down off the wall again. The lessons he had learned climbing the cliffs outside Danzu had finally been put to use that day. Fans Yan lowered his feet onto the floor and walked ahead knowing that Wu Zhu would leave him, and that when he was in danger, he would appear again. He walked through the hustle and bustle of the market and stayed quiet, his right hand dangling by the side of his thigh as it trembled gently. He walked with heavy steps through the market and came to a stop in front of a stall. It was a tofu stall, and the hawker was a fair-faced woman in her twenties, with pale, delicate hands and an apron tied around her waist. Donger, fans Yan called out to her. Smiling, Donger was the servant girl he had driven out of the Count's manor. When he was younger, he would lie on her bosom and sleep. They had always been close. After Donger had left the manor, she had opened a tofu stall at the market, so fans Jan often dropped by to buy some tofu to take home. A gentle smile crept across Donger's face when she saw who it was. Young master, she asked as she let him in, what brings you here? He sat on a small stool and as more people came in to buy tofu, Donger glanced at him awkwardly. Fan Xian nodded, and allowed her to see to her customers first. Looking around, he saw that there was a crib at the back of the stall, with a little girl inside it who seemed to be two to three years of age. Her cheeks were rosy and her clumsy and delicate hands reached out at the little bell attached to the crib. Fan Xian reached out to pick up the little girl and play with her. Donger turned around and hurried back to clasp her to her bosom. Don't get your clothes dirty, she grumbled. You lonely create more work for those servant girls. Fan Xian giggled. Donger, when I was the same age as your daughter, didn't you hug me like that every day? Donger laughed. Young master, 
How can you compare yourself to us mere servants? It was rather curious. Donger had been chased out of the Count's manor for testing a dish before fans Jan had had the chance to. But by the sound of it, she bore no malice toward the boy at all. Fans Jan scratched his head, unsure of what to say. Donger realized that something was wrong with him, so she picked up her daughter and cooed to her. This is the young master, can you say that? Young master, call me uncle, insisted Fans Jan. Dot. He sat at the tofu stall for a long time, watching Donger cut tofu, weigh it, and wrap it up in paper while he played with the young girl, getting her to call him uncle. After a long while, he managed to expel the gloom from his mind, and stood up to say goodbye to Donger. You've come all this way, said Donger, a little embarrassed, and I don't have anything good for you to eat. Fans Jan smiled. Donger, do you think I'm not eating well? That's true. Donger laughed with a young woman's bashfulness. Thank you for buying all these things for my little girl, young master. Fans Jan shook his head and smiled. I just hope you don't hold it against me for chasing you out of the Count's mansion. Donger smiled and said nothing. She trusted the young lad, and even though she'd never understood why he'd flown into a rage over her testing a little bit of food, she knew that he didn't do it on purpose. What was more, after she'd left the manor, the young master would secretly send her money. After she'd married, she'd lived comfortably with her husband and her child. A large part of why she came to work at the tofu stall was because it made it easier for the young master to come see her. Fan Xian waved goodbye to her and stepped out into the market. Looking back, he saw the gentle young lady holding her daughter's Aoni as she cut the tofu floating in the water, leaning forward slightly. Her body was still slender and supple, with no trace of the passing years upon her. She looked just as she had ten years ago, when she would hold him tight. Fans Jan had found an excuse to chase her away because she was his personal servant girl. If anything had happened to him, she wouldn't be safe either. In Fans Jan's early years, he had loved her most, and loved to climb all over her often fantasizing about what they could do together when he was grown up. But he had forgotten one very important point, as he slowly grew up, she would also grow up, and now he was twelve, she was in her twenties. It was just like the story of Bao Yu and King Wen in the dream of the Red Chamber. It seemed hopeless. When you were born, I had not been born. When I was born you were already old. You regret that I was born so late. I regret you were born so soon. When you were born, I had not been born. When I was born you were already old. I regret that we could not be born at the same time, so that I could spend all my days with you. As he made his way back to the manor, he hummed a tune to himself and fantasized about how he could get Donger to love him, an attempt to rid himself the image of the cold dead eyes of old Ha and the assassin staring at him. Dash because he had eaten stir-fried bamboo shoots laced with poisonous makuzi for lunch and had snapped a man's neck in the afternoon, he found he had very little appetite at all, he could barely eat anything before going to his room that evening. When night came, he found himself somewhat hungry. Holding an oil lamp, he walked to the kitchen alone, taking care not to alert any of the servants. Entering the kitchen, he washed and cleaned a fish his vegetable knife like a bird in flight. In a flash, he descaled and removed the belly, and used the techniques Wu Zhu had taught him to cut thin shreds of ginger. As his knife fell upon the chopping board, it made no sound, and he put the ginger shreds into a small bowl with some vinegar. Over a large flame, he steamed the fish belly in steaming water. As he squatted, watching the stove and the steam that gently rose from it, Fans Yan had an amusing realization. Fji and Wu Zhu were teaching him how to kill and avoid being killed for his mother's sake. But objectively speaking, they had also taught him how to be a good medic and a successful cook. Chapter 26 The Old Man in the Blanket Three minutes later, Fans Yan took up the steaming plate of fish in his hands. He covered it with some exquisite soy sauce that had been sent from the south and watched the beautiful amber juices flow over the plate. The aroma flowed through the kitchen as he mixed the steamed fish with the sauce. He found some leftover rice from that evening, combined it with the steamed fish, a little ginger and vinegar, and ate happily. The next morning, when he went to say hello to his grandmother, 
The servants informed them that a thief had sneaked into the kitchen during the night. When Fans Jan realized what they meant, he couldn't stop himself from smiling. I cooked myself something to eat last night, he said to the housekeeper as he kneaded the old woman's shoulders. Don't worry about it. The housekeeper stared at him, dumbstruck. The young master wasn't a young child. Why didn't he call for the servant's help? Instead he'd insisted on doing it by himself. It would have been no laughing matter if he'd burned himself. Fans Jan could tell that the housekeeper was pondering something. I read about a way to steam fish in a book, he said to the countess, acting cutely. I wanted to try it. If it was good and I'd cook it for you as a surprise. That's why I didn't want the servants to know. I didn't realize it would cause such trouble. I'm sorry. The excuse seemed reasonable. Nobody would have suspected a thing. The countess did not react. That's fine. She said gently, you just have to remember to clean up after yourself after you've finished doing something. She had always been rather strict with Fans Jan, it was rare for her to speak so kindly. Fans Jan felt something was amiss. There was a trace of tenderness in her words. Why, I already know what happened last night, she continued softly. Housekeeper Zhu failed in his duties. It's outrageous that you were able to sneak around in the kitchen like that and do something so dangerous without anyone noticing. I've already sent him back to the capital. They can deal with him there. Fan Xian was taken aback. He remembered that, after the killing, he'd completely forgotten to investigate the matter with Zhu. It was clear that Zhu was responsible in some way for allowing the would-be killers to sneak into the house and poison his food. He was disappointed in his own carelessness. Dash. In the library the next morning, he skimmed over a few of the books that had arrived from the capital before heading out again. As he passed the market, he suddenly realized what his grandmother had meant when she had said you just have to remember to clean up after yourself after you've finished doing something. One corner of the market had already been burned to ruins. Oddly, the fire had not spread to any of the neighboring buildings, only one building had been burnt to the ground, with nothing left remaining. The people gathered around were enthusiastically discussing the fire. Thanks to his small stature, Fans Jan was able to crouch nearby and eavesdrop. Two people had died in the fire, their corpses left completely unrecognizable. The place that had burned down was the building where Fans Jan had killed a man the day before. Had the fire destroyed the corpses and wiped out all traces? Fans Jan thought about how his grandmother had already sent Zhu the housekeeper back to the capital, and when he connected that fact to the wretched pile of ashes in front of him. He broke out in a cold sweat. He understood now what had happened. He never could have imagined that his strict, gruff grandmother could come up with such a meticulous plot to keep her grandson safe. He thought of the Countess and how she spent most of her days resting. He found it hard to reconcile that image with the smoldering rubble that stood before him. Fans Jan loitered amongst the people in the crowd. As he looked at the charred stones and blackened wood and took in the smell of burnt house, he realized something. The people around him had noticed his arrival. After having greeted Fans Jan, they were ready to say something to him. He acted as if he hadn't heard them and left the market, wandering toward the old grocery store. The housekeeper has been sent back to the capital, Fans Jan said. Wu Zhu stood in the shop, facing the quiet street. He didn't react. The local residents had all rushed to the market to see what all the hubbub was about. So the streets were empty. The building we went to yesterday burned down, continued Fans Yan. Wu Zhu still made no response. Fans Yan grabbed his sleeve, speaking in a firm whisper. You think I'm stupid for forgetting to deal with you, don't you? I even had to get my grandmother to clean up after me. Wu Zhu turned towards him. Are you trying to make me feel sorry for you? Do you think that you're so young, that you don't know how to deal with such things? So you've lost your self-esteem and you've come seeking my pity? His voice seemed almost curious, much livelier than his usual emotionless tone. Fans Jan smiled. I don't have that much self-esteem. It's just that I don't feel good about killing a man. And he stopped talking. Deep down, he felt that if he hadn't had Fji and Wu Zhu as teachers after having come to this world, he wouldn't be much stronger than any other child of nobility, and maybe. Maybe he'd already be dead. Caught in this power struggle and surrounded by a web of secrets, 
It seemed like knowing a little more was of no use. Anyone who sought to ride the waves of power also had to be proficient in such underhanded and intricate means, compared to them. He was still just some naive kid. There's the feeling of killing a man, and the feeling of being killed. Which would you prefer to experience? Asked Wu Zhu. Fan Xian wasn't sure how to respond. Of course nobody wants to be killed. Since you already know the answer, don't ask me. Wu Zhu handed him a seal. There's something else I need to tell you. The Countess expelled housekeeper Zhu from Danzu Harbor. She didn't have him killed, because she thought it best that the people of the capital didn't make a fuss about this. Fan Xian looked at the seal. It seemed familiar. He'd seen it used on paperwork around the Count's house. It belonged to Zhu the housekeeper. He raised his head and looked at Wu Zhu with suspicion. You killed him? Wu Zhu nodded. Fans Yan suddenly remembered the assassin's identity. Why were the poison and the follow-up methods used by the assassin so similar to the methods of the Overwatch Council? He asked, puzzled. Ask G- Dash. It was a bright spring day in the capital. In the west end of the city stood a square building its exterior painted grey-black. Within this sinister-looking building, in a secret room, a thin-faced, clean-shaven man sat in a wheelchair, his legs covered by a smooth woolen blanket. The glass windows of this hidden room were covered completely by a thick black cloth, not a single speck of sunlight could enter. Many years ago, this man had contracted a serious illness somewhere in the north, from that point on, he began to fear the light. Master how goes the investigation in Danzu? The old man asked the strange, gray-haired man, the same age as he was called, who stood before him. He gazed into his brown pupils and smiled. Fji sat in his chair, sipping tea, looking at the strange smile that crept across the lips of his superior officer. Which of us is the real old pervert? He thought. Chapter 27 the Overwatch Council, the majority of the departments that handled the nation's political affairs were situated on Tan Avenue, in the eastern district of the city. Few citizens lived nearby, and the street was exceptionally wide, with many beautiful and grand wooden buildings on either side. These buildings were the center of the Empire's authority. For example, the Department for Army Affairs was located at the crossing and sported a great stone lion at the entrance. Its gaping mouth and powerful claws stood in the direction of the rising sun. The interplay of light and shadow gave it a fantastic yet bizarre look, like some great prehistoric creature, as a representation of the military might of the King Kingdom, it was sorely lacking. But the true center of the kingdom's power lay in the bowels of the palace in the northern part of the city. Save for its tall watchtower, the palace lacked the towering height of the other government offices, but the thick palace walls and magnificent courtyard within made it feel like extremely sacred ground. The officials of the kingdom of King all knew, rather well, actually, that his most revered majesty didn't deal with day-to-day -day matters of the administration, for them. The most terrifying part of the imperial bureaucratic machine was neither the buildings that housed the departments of state nor the imperial palace. It was that square-shaped building in the west end of the city, with its sinister grey-black walls. That was where the Overwatch Council presided. The Kingdom of King was divided into three ministries and six departments, the three ministries being the worthy Overwatch Council, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of War which was a step above the Department for Army Affairs, and of the three ministries, the most powerful was the Overwatch Council. It had the power to investigate, arrest, and in certain situations, held judicial authority. No other department had authority over its powers. In a sense, it was an unchained beast that acted on the orders of the Emperor, like an agency of His Majesty's secret agents. Or rather, the Overwatch Council was, in truth, the Emperor's secret police. The officials of the Kingdom of King were always rather concerned. His Majesty was a genius, his powers granted to him by heaven itself. He could even keep in check the sinister director Chen and the Council's countless secret agents and hidden powers. But if something were to happen to His Majesty, who could take the reins of this ferocious beast? Bureaucrats who had suffered under the whims of the Council cursed it in secret. The Council was no beast. It was simply a treacherous and despicable wild dog. Within a hidden room of the ministry's chambers, 
a secret dialogue was taking place. The assassin who was caught in the fire at Danzu was one of the ministry's men, under the jurisdiction of the Dongshan Road Division, said Fji to the director, his voice hoarse. The Fourth Bureau has always been in charge of operations abroad. The Department of Internal Affairs discovered during the course of their investigations that an official in the Fourth Bureau was a distant relative of the Master's second wife. That must be how the mission was carried out. Has he been identified? This was the old man's greatest concern. Fji narrowed his faint brown eyes, filled with uncertainty. I believe that among the eight people who are aware of this incident, no one will leak it. And although Master Wu was a close confidant of the lady, he was rarely seen at that time. No one is aware of his identity these days, and Yi Yian, the only person who he has met, is now a Grand Master. There is no way he could travel to Danzu for leisure, it is far too much of a coincidence. So there is no need to worry about anyone figuring out his identity as a result of Master Wu. The director's thin, prominent fingers drummed on the table as he pondered. Back then, when I ordered you to dispose of every one of the Black Knights who had laid eyes on Wu Zhu, you asked me for leniency. Now it seems that you were wrong. Fji laughed. A strange light flashed in his eyes, stained brown by years of exposure to poisons. There had already been a great many deaths that night. Fji did not seem, at least on the surface the least bit afraid of the old bureaucrat before him. His status and experience preceded him. He hissed as he laughed. It is foolish to kill without good reason. The lady used to be fond of saying that. Have you forgotten? The old man smiled. It seemed that he was reminiscing about happy memories. But his smile remained the same even as he gave his sinister orders. The Dongshan Road is under the jurisdiction of the Fourth Bureau. As all the necessary signatures were obtained for authorization and there were no errors in the process, there's no reason to hold accountable for this incident. As for the others, deal with them as you wish. He smiled as he thought aloud. Using my own power to kill the people under my protection. Is it a coincidence, or do you think someone is trying to probe into something? This second wife is quite a woman. Yan Ruohai of the Fourth Bureau is useless at his job, he continued. He'll sign off on anything and will happily kill anyone as long as it's not his own son. He is causing trouble. Freeze his salary for three years and send his son, the one named Yan Binian to work in the north. Don't let him return until he has risen you up the ranks by at least two grades. The director took the documents from the Department of Internal Affairs that were laid out on the table. Writing down his final concluding remarks, he signed his name, Chen Pingping. Whenever Fji saw the director's shriveled and unsightly signature, he wanted to laugh, but he had no choice but to hold it in. He knew that this weak and girlish signature was going to send high-ranking officials to their deaths and send an even higher-ranking official's son off to infiltrate the bleak lands behind enemy lines, forbidden to return until he could prove that he was of exceptional worth. That was a fate worse than death. The old man laughed to himself. I grew up with Fan Jian, I didn't expect his family affairs to cause me such grief. Send one of your best men to investigate how the second wife is involved in all this. Fan Jian was Count Sinan's personal name, the name of Fan Jian's father. Ji knitted his bow, and his brown eyes trembled. Impossible. They should be under the impression that the child died long ago. You misunderstand me. I'm also certain that they are unaware of Fan's Yan as the lady's son. The director smiled. His Majesty has always demanded that we keep our distance from the nobility and the bureaucracy. And yet, the year that you were sent to Danzu, even though it was kept secret, it is still possible that they may have found out whether it was the Empress or the Prime Minister. Our connection to Count Sinan is a source of great intrigue. There is a power hiding in the shadows and it lent its services to the second wife in order to test the reactions of both ourselves and Master Fan. For this reason, it is important that we do not react too forcefully. Do you understand? Fji suddenly found himself filled with doubts over the attempted assassination in Danzu. He couldn't be sure that it wasn't a result of the director's intentional leaking of information. Dot. The old man wheeled himself to the window, lifted up a corner of the curtain and gazed out. Anyway, he said coolly, we need to talk about the box. Whether or not Wu Zhu is telling the truth, 
we cannot let it fall into the hands of our enemies in the north. It's a pity we don't know how big it is, or even what it looks like. Fji stood next to the director, following his gaze out of the window. When I end up in hell, you'd better be right behind me so we can play cards together. The director laughed. Fji knew that the director was not as old as he looked. But I'm a good guy, he said. Smiling, I'm going straight to heaven. A shadow drifted like a gust of wind from a corner of the secret room, pulling down the black cloth and blocking out the strong sunlight from shining on the old man. It moved without a sound. This was the person who had killed the staff wielding sorcerer outside the walls of the capital many years ago. G pointed at the black shadow. I reckon he'd be the one who came with you to play chess. Dot. Outside, the sun shone brightly and the tiles on the main hall of the Imperial Palace shone with a deep gold light. As pedestrians passed by the entrance to the Overwatch Council, they found themselves crossing to the other side of the street. It was as if they feared that its gloomy air would spill out onto the street. A stone tablet stood by the entrance of the Ministry's chambers. Gold words were painted on the table. I wish for the freedom of all peoples of the Kingdom of King. One must suffer mistreatment without surrender. One must suffer great calamities without retreat. Should disaster strike, do not be afraid to face it. Do not submit to the whims of beasts. A name was written underneath, Yi King Mai. No one knew who Yi King Mai was, but the people of the capital all knew that the tablet was placed there when the Overwatch Council was built. It shone with a golden light, as if it were in contact with the tiles of the Imperial Palace far away as if it hid away the darkness within both buildings. Chapter 28, Nighttime Reading with a Beautiful Girl Danzu had recovered from the revelation and was settling back into its peaceful ways. Nobody seemed to be that bothered about the relationship between Old Ha the vegetable seller and the other man who had died in the fire. The authorities had no explanation for how the fire had started and people didn't seem too bothered about that either. Order had always been kept in Danzu, thanks to the observant eyes of the local neighborhood watch. The criminals and adventurers who could be found all across the north had no chance of applying their trade in the city. Because the center of trade had shifted southward, His Majesty had exempted the seven counties neighboring Danzu from taxation. Although this hadn't greatly enriched the lives of the locals immediately, it at least made sure that everyone had grain to spare, there would be no revolts over crop failures like there had been 30 years before. And although Danzu was next to the sea, the natural disposition of its people wasn't affected by the unpredictable weather born from the sea. Within the city, the people kept their cool and were always respectful toward the city's noble families showing the appropriate reverence and care toward the estate of Count Sinan. Although they were all well aware that Fan's Yan was an illegitimate child, they still called him Young Master Fan, and made sure never to show any of the contempt they might have felt. This was what troubled Fan's Yan. Apart from the unfortunate business with Zhu the housekeeper, where he had acted with the full entitlement of a scion of a rich family, he had not had any opportunity to play such a part. Strolling along the streets of Danzu, the people treated him amiably and respectfully, no one ever tried to provoke him. The Zenki within him slowly accumulated, refining and strengthening his meridians. Most of the energy that drained off to the Xushan point located on his lower back wasn't causing any issues, but wasn't sure what purpose it served staying there. Fans Yan had always played the part of an earnest, tactful young gentleman. But as the days went by, he felt stifled. And now that he knew he was strong enough to kill a would-be murderer, he looked forward to the day when he could play the hero, delivering justice and rescuing beautiful women. But Danzu was peaceful. Too peaceful. Dot. Soothing incense burned in the study its faint aroma comforting the soul. Fans Yan held a delicate writing brush in his hand, writing earnestly on a sheet of fine writing paper that was about the width of four palms. Because literature was divided into modern and classical styles, one wrote with either a goose quill or a brush. The goose quill was easier to use and was used throughout the offices of state in the Jingdu. When Fji came to Jingdu to teach him, he had also used a goose quill. But the fine craftsmanship that went into the goose quill's sharpened tip required a true master's touch. If used for a long time, the tip could easily be deformed, 
and so it was not widely used. Fans Jan preferred the writing brush. He thought it was a great stroke of luck that this world used Chinese characters and that using a writing brush made for much more beautiful penmanship. He decided to practice his calligraphy diligently to avoid embarrassment. On the other hand, he also felt that only the calligraphic beauty of the writing brush could honor the story that he was writing. Sissy, his personal servant girl, held the ink sticks with her slender fingers, slowly and softly grinding them clockwise on the ink stone. Her gaze fell onto the paper the young master was writing on. Dot when Kin Zong saw Zine alone in the room washing the tea bowls, he ran up to her and kissed her. Zine was taken aback and stomped her foot. What are you doing? Do it again and I scream for help! Exclamation mark my lady, I beg of you, I am overcome with emotion said Kin Zong. If you will not do as I ask today, I shall die here on the spot. What do you want from me? Asked Zine. I will only do what you ask if you help me get away from this prison and leave these people. It can be done, said Kin Zong. But distant waters cannot quench the immediate thirst. Sissy glanced at the page and blushed. How can Zine be so shameless? Fans Yan lifted his head curiously at the servant girl's complaint. How is Zine shameless? He asked, beaming. When he was in the study, or in some other place people were unaware of, he would always call for the servant girls. This habit had started with Donger. The servant girls couldn't say no, and the old lady of the house didn't care, so they could only do as he asked. They had long been used to his behavior. There was nothing strange about it. Sissy's cheeks were as beautifully red as the sunrise. That nun, she stammered, she speaks and acts so carelessly. But young master, what is a nun? And what sort of place is this man to nunnery? Fans Yan giggled. Wait until I get to the part about Genzong and Zine's illicit relations, he thought. Then you'll see what carelessness means. But Sissy's question made him realize, if there were no Buddhism in this world, then there were no monks, and indeed no nuns. He scratched his head with his empty hand. He wasn't sure how to explain it. Nuns are like ascetics, he finally responded, and Manta nunnery is a bit like a temple. Sissy was shocked. Young master, don't write such things. The temple lies in the mists of the heavens, and takes pity on the common people. It doesn't get involved in earthly affairs. How can it be such a filthy place? Fans Yan cut his explanation short. I understand, he said, smiling. I will be more careful with my writing. He wrote a little more, and then a thought struck him. He asked Sissy to leave so that she wouldn't lay eyes on some of his raunchier work and report it to the old lady. When he was young, he would tell Donger stories to scare her. Donger thought that he had been taught the stories by his teacher Zeke and she had gone to tell the old lady. It led to fans Yan being made to write lines from memory as punishment for days. Sissy warned him to be careful again, set down the ink stick in her hand, and left. As he watched her walk away gracefully, fans Yan felt his heart pounding. Grasping his pen, fans Yan pondered. Copying out Dream of the Red Chamber was a lot more complicated than just copying a few poems from the old masters. He had started writing the year before, and he had probably copied it out from memory fifteen times. Luckily, his memory was strangely clear, and he could recall his previous life without even the slightest gap. Indeed, it was lucky that it was so clear because he could finally remember by heart the beautiful and hard-to-recall prose that Kaogzukin had written. The only thing was that the characters and the setting were completely different to this new world. He wasn't sure if the people who read it would understand it, so there were some important parts that still needed to be slowly altered. But he still had total faith in his version of Dream of the Red Chamber. A cow is a cow no matter where you take it and the same could be said for Dream of the Red Chamber. Chapter 29, The Book Thief In his previous life, fans Yan had loved to imagine himself as some classical scholar who read books next to a beautiful girl. He insisted on keeping Sissy close by as he wrote all day. The combination of the smell of burning incense, her delicate aroma, and the smooth glide of his writing brush on paper made him feel exceptionally at ease. But he realized that if his writing were to be discovered, it would likely cause him a lot of unnecessary trouble, so he decided to keep it to himself. 
Fans Jan had always felt that he had to prepare properly for life in the capital both physically and spiritually, and it was nothing like copying some short poems to be recited on the spot at some banquet. Like Dream of the Red Chamber, matters had to be prepared for well in advance. He wasn't sure why, but he had always thought that his future lay in that faraway capital at the heart of the King Kingdom. Perhaps it was because of his father the high-ranking official. Perhaps it was that silly little girl, or perhaps it was the nameless yet intriguing mother who he had never met. He pondered for a while, then picked up his brush and finished the part where Bao Yu and Ken Zong get up to some unspeakable things. After the ink had dried, he slipped it into an envelope, and got ready to send it off to Fan Ra or Yuo in the capital. He never left any part of the manuscript at the mansion in Denzu. As soon as he had written a chapter, he would immediately send it away to the capital immediately. He found it hard to suppress his desire to share the experiences of his past life with the people of this new world. It was like hiding the most beautiful piece of jade in the world beneath his bed, unseen by the world, for many years. His heart ached terribly, and he longed to show the world, or at the very least just one person, the stunning beauty of this secret he kept. A collector who refuses to show a work to the world can be only one of two things, a pervert or a thief. Fans Yan knew he was no pervert, though he was definitely a thief, he was a smart one, and no one in this world would ever know. So Fans Yan, ignoring Fan Ra or Yuo's age, sent her a manuscript every month. He told her that it was a work called The Story of the Stone, and was written by a fellow named Kao Gzukan, who he had come across by chance every month. He would write a chapter and share it with his little sister. Although in the first 15 chapters of Dream of the Red Chamber there were parts where Bao Yu meets with Gen Keking in his dream and has his first lustful liaisons, fans Yan was certain that the young girl would not be influenced negatively by his years of letters, or regard her brother as some sort of perverted freak. Sure enough, when Fan Ra or Yuo read Cao's words, ignorant of their origins, she appreciated them even if she could not truly understand them. Yet she began to develop a taste for it, especially when she read the part where Dai Yu entered the mansion, and every month she would urge her brother to send her more of Cao's work. When fans Yan received her letter, he couldn't help but feel depressed. The next chapter did not exist, and he would not be able to copy it very quickly. Even if he copied 70 or 80 chapters one day, he would still end up like a eunuch. Dot. After he had finished copying for the day, Fans Yan began to read a book, as he usually did. His study was filled with all kinds of works, all sent from the capital by the Count. Every time he thought about the Count's attempts to expand his book collection, his impression of this father he had never met would always change. At the very least, he knew that a maturing boy needed such things. In a country with no pornography, Fans Yan had no way to stave off boredom and loneliness, save for manipulating the powerful Zenki within his body and tormenting the servant girls, and so he dove headfirst into the many and varied books held within the study. The books covered all kinds of topics, from agriculture to the laws of the land, nothing was missed. There were also some of the classics of the world packed tightly onto the shelves like bricks. Fans Yan had built the shelves according to his vision. They were simple, and each shelf was lined with the lemongrass that grew in Yeazo. This herb prevented bookworms from getting into the books, but it seemed that few people were aware of its properties in this world, and so outside of the estate it was only used as a cooking ingredient. After reading books for many years, Fans Yan discovered traces of many things that he had studied in his previous life in the classics of this world. They only appeared slightly different in their writing styles, and thus ended his plan to becoming a great scholar of his time by copying the works of Hanfzi, Xunzi, Lazy, Sunzi, and many other old masters. Whether it was on the subject of poison, practicing his Zenki, or reading, Fans Yan was always committed to his studies. With steady and hard-working dedication almost unseen in a boy his age, he continued to gain knowledge. He knew he was no different from the people around him, he had not arrived in a world where the average IQ was 50 points. The only advantage he had was some of the knowledge he had from the society of his previous world, 
and the fact that he had gained self-awareness earlier than the average toddler. The oil lamp crackled and let off a small ball of flame, lighting up the room. As Fans Young bent over his desk to study, his eyes began to droop, and he fell asleep. After his morning bath the next morning, Fans Young went to greet the Countess in her room before going to the hall for breakfast. Ever since the incident with the assassin, his impression of his grandmother had changed greatly. Apart from the morning greetings he had been doing for years, he would also chat with the kindly-looking old woman, trying to make her laugh. I heard that one day His Majesty once called his Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Director of the Overwatch Council, the head of the Palace Eunuchs, and a group of high-ranking officials to the Palace Hall to discuss matters of state. That day, a meteor fell from the sky, smashed through the roof of the Palace Hall and squashed all of His Majesty's ministers flat. His Majesty summoned the Imperial Physician to treat them, and he waited outside the sick room. Soon after, the Imperial Physician came out and His Majesty asked him, Doctor, could you save the Prime Minister? The Physician shook his head. I'm afraid I couldn't save the Prime Minister, he said. As she listened, the Countess's face was full of suspicion. She couldn't understand why a child would speak about affairs in the capital. They were treacherous things, of which she had boundless first-hand experience. She eyed him uneasily. His Majesty asked, what about the Chancellor? The physician shook his head sadly. I couldn't save him either. Then what about Eunuch Hong? The physician shook his head again. His Majesty got angry. Then who could you save? The physician perked up. Your Majesty is most fortunate, the kingdom has been saved. On hearing the last line, the Countess immediately burst into laughter, to the point where she was close to tears. She pointed her finger at Fans Yan's innocent face. You little devil, she scolded. If we were in the capital and you told that joke, they'd haul you off to the Overwatch Council. Chapter 30, The Past Although no other nation could match the power of the Kingdom of King, there was no end of scheming within the corridors of the imperial court. In the eyes of the citizens, the government's most treacherous officials were the prime minister, the chancellor, and eunuch Hong Gong Gong, leader of the palace eunuchs, all mentioned in the previous joke. It went without saying that the director of the Overwatch Council was also infamous, but out of respect for his relationship with G, fans Yan had decided not to make him the butt of the joke. He based the joke off of one he'd heard about Taiwanese politics during his previous life. He also relayed it in a letter to his sister, which had amused her greatly. After telling it to his grandmother, that seemingly befuddled but actually shrewd old lady, she'd burst out laughing too. Having made the most powerful woman in Danzu laugh, fans Yan told her that he would be going out for a while. She didn't seem to mind, she'd gone back to her usual expression that of an unruffled as an old well. She sent him off with a disinterested grunt of approval. As he left the manor, he felt thankful for his growing closeness to his grandmother. After all, grandmothers had taken care of him in a lot of different ways. As he thought about it, he remembered a rumor he had heard. The House of Fan had been a great clan in Jingdu, but his father Count Sunan's branch of the family was small and insignificant so they were often pushed around. Not long after his grandmother had given birth to Count Sinan, she was pressed into service as the wet nurse of Prince Ching's household, unheard of for a member of the nobility. Luckily, the previous emperor had no heirs, and as a result of his overactive sex life, he died an untimely death. The two most likely successors to the throne were murdered by an assassin from the Kingdom of Northern Wei and the prince who had ordered the assassinations was also assassinated. Eventually, after an absurd and complicated chain of events, nothing particularly out of the ordinary for the politics of the kingdom, the ever-cautious Prince Ching managed to ascend to the throne. Ching spent a number of peaceful years as emperor, and when he passed away, the title of emperor was passed on to the current emperor. The emperor led expeditions to conquer the barbarians to the west and the kingdom of Northern Wei to the north. The once mighty kingdom of Northern Wei fell to pieces in the chaos, breaking up into the kingdom of Northern Qi and a few small vassal states, as well as the always neutral city of Dongyai. 
The role of the emperor was historically to achieve political and military victories, but the current emperor was also considered a great master of both literature and martial arts. As a result, there were often officials who presented petitions to his majesty, asking that he go up to the highest mountain to take part in rituals to thank heaven for peace and prosperity and praying for blessings at the temple. But for some reason, his majesty had always refused. Officials would try to win the emperor over with elegant coaxing, assuming the emperor was just fishing for compliments, but were instead beaten to a bloody pulp. The old mistress was the wet nurse of this decisive warrior of great power, an emperor who kept himself hidden within the palace. Fans Yan had been suspicious about his father for years. Count Sinan's secret power far outweighed the power he should have had as an official. He had even gotten Fji from the Overwatch Council to be Fans Yan's teacher. But knowing now that his grandmother had been the emperor's wet nurse, his suspicions had been resolved. His father Count Sinan was much like Cao Yin, a noble who lived during the reign of the King Xi Emperor in Fans Yan's previous world. Cao Yin's mother, Sun Shi, had been the nanny of the King Xi Emperor, and so Cao Yin was trusted by the Emperor throughout his life, becoming a close aide to the Emperor. Even though he was only a minor official, he was allowed to report directly to the Emperor. When Kang Xi went on expeditions to the south, the Cao family would often accompany him. Cao Yin was feared by officials across the country. In the later years of Kang Xi's reign, Cao Yin was investigated for running up huge debts in the treasury. However, Kang Xi saw to it during that time to pardon him again and again, situation after situation. It was not until after Cao Yin's death that his family fell on hard times, having growing distant from the emperor. And so Cao Yin's grandson, Cao Xuqin, came to Beijing at the age of 18, and wrote Dream of the Red Chamber. This was the story that Fan Xian had copied and brought to this world. Master Cao, it seems that although we find ourselves in different places, we are kindred spirits. It seems appropriate that I'm copying your book. Thinking on the similarities between Cao's family and his own, he couldn't help but laugh. He gently folded up the letter that contained the tenth chapter of the story of the stone and left the manor. Dash. On a cliff overlooking the coast, Fans Yan closed his eyes in meditation. His body was filled from head to toe with a mysterious feeling. Because he had been a materialist in his past life, he now found that this powerful energy swirled around him and gave him a dreamlike feeling, almost as if he were falling in love. Love is always a bittersweet thing, and his practice with this powerful energy brought him both pleasure and pain. It was clear that it was changing his body in exceedingly mysterious ways, greatly improving his strength and his responses. But it often refused to do as he commanded and would scatter, putting him in danger. Because of the years he had spent being beaten senseless by Wu Zhu, his Zenki had become more well behaved. But today he was approaching great danger. It was the final day of his Zenki training. Wu Zhu stood calmly to one side, looking at Fan Zhan, who sat cross-legged and in a deep meditative trance. He held his wooden stick in his hand like he usually would. Following his will, the Zenki that had pulled into his donchen flowed slowly out and was carefully guided through the meridians in his chest and belly, and as it had done for the past dozen or so years, it disappeared without trace sinking into the Xushan point in his spine by his kidneys. But the leftover Zenki stayed strong, and as it flowed through his meridians it felt like thousands of hot knives scraping at their walls. Fans Yan trembled all over, and cold sweat caused his clothes to stick to his body. His eyes shut tight and his long eyelashes quivered as he endured indescribable pain. After many years of practice with this powerful energy, he had found that even the greatest of difficulties could be surmounted after a quick rest. After that, things had been easy. He had never imagined that getting past the first scroll would be quite so hard to bear. The Zenki continued to rampage through the meridians in his chest and belly, scouring them deeply and endlessly. This sometimes allowed the meridians to grow larger and wider, and allowed Zenki to flow much quicker but it could also cause immense damage. The power to expand one's intangible meridians also caused intense mental pain that was difficult to stand. Fortunately, 
12 years of diligent practice made it so that Fans Yantu was able to make his meridians significantly stronger. No energy overflowed through the walls of his veins, something that would have led to really serious problems. His powers of concentration had been greatly honed throughout his strange lives, both in this world and the last, making him much stronger than the average person. Dot. Though it seemed like a long time had passed, the sun was only just rising above the eastern sea. As it hung there in the distance, it threw its warm red light upon the cliff, shining upon two lonesome figures, one standing, one sitting. The Zenki reversed its flow and headed upward. Powerful and ruthless, it broke through the thin barriers of his body. Flowing from the cycle gate point in his chest straight to the Tanshu point in his belly, it suddenly shot up to the top of his nose, slicing like a knife. In the red dawn light, Fans Yan felt as if he had been suddenly struck by lightning. His head shot up, looking up at the sky, his mouth wide open, unable to make a single sound. Chapter 31 The Singing Visitor Take off your clothes. Wu Zhu's wooden staff smacked the top of Fans Yan's head with a loud thwack. The Zenki continued to rush forth from the top of his nose. It seemed as if a faint light was emanating from him, especially his forehead which glowed uneasily with a dense, multicolored light. He couldn't see clearly, and a feeling of gloom seemed to spread from the point where the energy was stuck, filling Fan's yawn with distress. He could only stare up at the sky in despair. At that moment, Wu Zhu struck his forehead at the point where the energy was accumulating. As it hit his body, the wooden staff felt like it had struck his soul. His brain suddenly felt as if it had caught fire like black clouds being parted by a bolt of lightning, filling the sky with powerful rays of sunshine. Take off your clothes. This phrase was from a classic of the Kingdom of King, adages of old. It was said that Zhu Zhenchen, tutor of one of the current four Grand Masters, Ku He, a great teacher of the Northern Qi Kingdom, had received great teachings from heaven itself. When he became enlightened, he exclaimed that the human body was like an undershirt, only once one had shed themselves of it could one achieve greatness. And in the books that Fans Yan had read in his previous life, a similar saying had brought Buddhist monks to the point of enlightenment. The Buddhist monk Kini Un would often say if you shed your fleshy undershirt, you shall be filled with the wild joy of enlightenment. And so when Fans Yan, confused and in great pain, heard Wu Zhu's words, he understood their meaning and the point at the top of his head became free of its block. Daylight broke, and his mind was clear again. He guided the energy through his body, and convinced himself that the pain flowing through his meridians was the suffering of someone else, that it was not even remotely his own. By setting aside all attachments to life and letting go of all bodily perceptions, one could attain the mood found within the scroll of power. A single person's body cannot hold the powerful energy of heaven and earth. Only by abandoning one's body and becoming one with heaven and earth and by becoming a part of nature can one obtain control over such powerful, chaotic energy. The Zenki in his body slowly began to settle, and the point on his forehead had opened. The energy flowed out with gentle vigor, going down past the Tanzu point on the back of his neck straight into the Xushan point that existed on his back. His Xushan point had always seemed calm, but today, he could feel it had changed slightly. A small amount of Zenki began to seep out and replenish the Danshan point in his pubic region. And so the circulation of Zenki throughout his body finally formed a free-flowing loop, a channel forming a perfect circle, in faint harmony with the outside world. Dot. After some time had passed, Fan Xian woke up groggy. A dark and foul-smelling liquid had trickled out beneath him. He looked at Wu Zhu, who stood beside him seemingly unmoved, and smiled weakly. Thanks. Looks like you really hit hard. Although his body felt weak, he could feel his spirit flourishing. He closed his eyes and felt the conditions within his body, getting used to this new flow of Zenki. He could sense that this once ruthless Zenki, though still powerful, was clearly flowing more smoothly and freely. Fans Yan let out a sigh. It was hard to imagine that he had managed to master the Zenki that he had only been able to read about in Wuxian novels in his past life. He was gripped by a sudden and unclear urge, and unthinkingly, 
he slammed his right hand into the ground below him. There was a muffled thud and a hiss, like a red-hot poker punching a hole through a rag. A shallow palm print had appeared on the ground, its edges completely smooth. Fans Yang raised his right hand and looked at it, then lowered his head to look again at the palm print in the rock. He measured it with his hand making sure the it was truly his palm print that had just made such a mark, and stared at it in amazement. Finally he regained his focus. That's amazing, he said with a gasp. That's Zenki leaking out, said Wuzhu. It'll clear up soon. Didn't you say you'd never trained with Zenki? How do you know how to teach me? I've watched others train, so I knew what we had to do today. So it's like you've never eaten pork, but you've seen a pig run before. Fans yawn. Realizing that he'd just insulted himself, smiled faintly. That was really dangerous back there. He continued, If you hadn't been here with your stick, I'd probably be a vegetable again. What do you mean, a vegetable? Asked Wuzhu coolly. Fans Yan looked up at the sky and let his mind wander, paying no attention. A short while later, he realized that Wuzhu was an empiricist. If that blow hadn't brought him to his senses, and instead knocked him unconscious, then the ruthless Zenki in his body would have scattered, turning him into a puddle of blood and guts. He shivered, and put such terrifying thoughts out of his mind, looking at the wide sea before him. His mind was free, and he felt excited about his newfound mastery. He had finally freed himself from his gloomy mood over the incident with the assassin days before. In the days following the incident, Fans Yan could not understand why the assassin had chosen to use poison. Had all of Ji's training led up to that day? It seemed too great of a coincidence. It had been a bold move from the Count's second wife. Even if she had the support of some high-ranking official somewhere, to use poison in such a way suggested that she didn't care about his grandmother's life in the slightest, even though she had been the Emperor's wet nurse. Could his father really have had no idea that this was going on in the capital? As he pondered, the sound of distant singing came from far below the cliffs. The cliff bordered the sea, far from Danzu, and it was dangerous ground. There was a great reef in front of the cliff that prevented fishing boats from getting close, so it remained quiet and undisturbed. This was why Wuzhu had chosen it as the best place to train fans Yan in the art of killing and was why hearing this distant song put Fan Xian on edge. Though he was nervous, he made sure not to act rash. Lying on his stomach, he crawled toward the cliff's edge, staying behind the rocks while looking down toward the source of the singing. As he looked down, he saw a small boat drifting through the black reef, appearing and disappearing in and out of the sea foam. The boat weaved in and out, and it looked almost certain that it could smash into the reef at any time killing its passenger, but it carried on its way through the rocks regardless. The person on the boat stood alone, wearing a bamboo hat and singing away. Flowers fall once they appear, stones stand still a thousand years, but both must go just as they came, and floating clouds are just the same. The song was gentle, but perched atop the cliff, he could still hear it clearly through the roar of the waves. When he heard the song, Fans Yan thought about a line by a poet from his past life named Takamatsunaga, Flowers blossom but for an hour in the daylight, but compared to the thousand-year pine, there is little difference. How this boatman seemed to be so free and easy was a mystery. As he pondered, he heard Wuzhu's voice. Hide. Fans Yan hid himself behind the rocks. He sensed the movement of a shadow next to him and watched in horror as Wuzhu leapt from the hundred-foot cliff. Chapter 32, Tipping the Boat Before he went in training and developed his bad Zenki, Fans Yan did not believe a human's body could be harder than rock. But after one of his palm strikes left his handprint on a rock, he changed his mind. Even now, he still didn't believe a person would be completely fine after jumping several tens of meters down a cliff especially without slowing down during the descent. Wuzhu helped him disprove that thought, and at the same time gave him unparalleled fright. Fans Yan would have never imagined the true skills of this world's strongest to be this terrifying. Dot. The black cloth which covered Wuzhu's eyes resembled flowing black silk as it trailed during Wuzhu's high-speed descent. Wuzhu, however, was like an arrow striking down with the force of thunder. He aimed his feet at the small boat. Wuzhu isn't using King Gong, 
he was merely free falling with the help of gravity. While falling several tens of meters, he never stopped gaining speed. By the time he was about to land on the boat, he was going tremendously fast. A frightening whooshing sound could be heard as he fell faster than the sound of the wind, as if he had split the air itself. The force Wuzhu carried reached the boat before his body did. On the boat sat a singing man wearing a bamboo hat which was violently blown away. The bamboo hat flew far away before landing in the sea, exposing the man's face. The man had a simple, humble expression, his eyes clear as autumn waters. However, his pupils contracted when he saw the pair of feet crashing down from above. A pair of hands, pale as white jade, came out of the man's sleeves and waved gently. With his fingers parting like bare branches sprouting new leaves, countless jets of chi rushed out of his fingertips. In the moment before Wuzhu landed on a boat in the restless sea, those jets of chi forcefully blew the boat two paces backwards. Wuzhu brutally crashed down like a meteorite. Due to the boat being blown back two paces, Wuzhu landed on the deck, not on the singing man. There was no way this small boat could withstand such force, and before the sound of rushing air died down, there was a loud crunching noise. Because Wuzhu landed on the bow of the boat, he forced the entire font half of the boat into the water while the stern was lifted out of the water, pointing to the sky. The singer was catapulted high into the air. While airborne, he could do nothing but spread out his arms, looking quite miserable. With a huge splash, the boat broke from the intense impact and sank. A black shadow erupted from the waters, locking onto the singer, who was still in the air. In the blink of an eye, fingers shot out like swords, aiming at the singer's throat. The singer moved his hands as though he were constructing the beams of a roof. With great steadiness and grace, he forcefully blocked Wuzhu's killing blow. Small explosions tore through the air, the result of strong qi clashing against each other. It was hard to count just how many techniques these two world-class warriors unleashed in this short exchange. Moments later, the two shadows separated, landing on the two sides of an extremely narrow sandbar just beneath the cliffs. On the sea, the boat's flotsam slowly surfaced, looking like debris left in a jar. The back half of the boat was still floating, ownerless, looking quite desolate. Dot. Your assassination failed, so you have to pay me back for the boat. The singer stared at Wu Zhu's blindfold and smiled. He reached out and waved with his hand, as if expecting immediate payment. There were about nine meters between him and Wu Zhu. In response to this hand gesture, Wu Zhu frowned turned his body to the side, and took two steps back with unparalleled quickness. With a light shuffle, the ground where Wu Zhu was standing moments ago appeared thickly dotted, as though rain had fallen on the sand. From nine meters away, with a slight wave of his hand, the singer's strong chi penetrated through the sand. In this world, not many could accomplish such a feat. Why have you come here? Wu Zhu tilted his head slightly, while remaining expressionless. He was noticeably more cautious than usual. I fought you once 16 years ago. Since then, I've failed to find a worthy opponent, the singer replied with a grin. Last year one visited the capital and Yi Zong said you had been missing for the past few years. I thought you really followed Lady Yi over to the other side. I got two jars of alcohol, one of which I poured into the ground along with a few tears. I set out again this year and felt a strong chi from far away so I came to investigate, who would have thought it was you? The singer then became angry. I've not seen you in over a decade, old friend. How come you tried to kill me on sight? You are well aware that we cannot slay each other. Wu Zhu thought about it for a moment, then tilted his head as if accepting this fact. The singer knew of the blind man's strange temperament. If Wu Zhu really could kill him, he wouldn't hesitate, and the singer was mindful of that possibility. He then said with a smile, after the lady departed, I thought you'd go back to the temple. Why did you come to Danzu Harbor? You know why I want to kill you, Wu Zhu said coldly, ignoring the singer's question. The amount of people in this world who know me are few, and among them, you have the biggest mouth. Not knowing how to respond, the singer became embarrassed. Wu Zhu continued, If I can silence you by killing you, 
I'm more than happy to do so. The singer let out an uneasy smile and sighed. You've still got that same old temper I see. It's rare for someone to train to such a high level and still remain so bloodthirsty. Wu Zhu shook his head. The ends justify the means. He suddenly frowned. Since you found what you were looking for, you may leave now. Quite a crisp way of shooing someone away. The singer breathed in before letting out a lengthy laugh. He clenched his fist as he smiled. In truth, I am not much of a talker. As soon as he said that, the singer rolled up his sleeves and put his arms behind his back. Just like that, he coolly floated back to what remained of his boat which was somehow still floating, standing on the wreckage and humorously resuming the motion of rowing, the singer moved his half of a boat with his inner chi and set off towards Danzu. Wu Zhu faced the same direction, silent under the black cloth. Dot. Who was that? Fan Zhan, who just made his way down from the mountain peak, did not hear the conversation. He was still shaken after witnessing a battle between two of the world's strongest fighters, Yi Lai Yun as I thought. Fans Yan sighed as he followed behind Wu Zhu. They too were headed towards Danzu Harbor. Chapter 33, Idle Years Yi Lai Yan came and left, just like the floating clouds which were his namesake, gone without a trace. The inhabitants of Danzu Harbor had no idea that one of the four great grandmasters had come to their city, drank alcohol, picked a fight, and sang some songs. Wu Zhu was a bit worried. Not many people in this world knew about his relationship with the lady, but unfortunately Yi Lai Yan happened to be one of them. And directly in contrast with his status as a grandmaster, Yi Lai Yan was known for having loose lips. Wu Zhu did not believe it was a coincidence that Yi Lai Yan came to Danzu and then left immediately after seeing Wu Zhu. Fan Zhan, on the other hand, thought Yi Lai Yan was a simple traveler. He patted Wu Zhu on the shoulder, trying to provide some consolation. Who said a master practitioner can't travel? It was purely because of his intuition that he believed this. His intuition had proved accurate thus far, making him suspect there was something wrong with his father in the capital, the Council of Auditors, Assassins, and that second wife who was more sinister than a tigress. All those convinced fans yawned that his father, Count Xinan, was not as simple as he appeared. He should at least be significantly more formidable than a bond servant like Cao Yin. But Fan Xian was leading himself in the wrong direction. He had guessed that his father was the illegitimate son of the previous emperor, King Laosheng, because his grandmother was once a wet nurse who used to take care of the emperor. Nowadays, Count Xinan was bitter about being a petty count while his half-brother sat on the dragon throne. So the count plotted in secret with the Overwatch Council, uniting and taking advantage of all possible resistance against the throne, hoping to inherit the emperor's entire estate. As for fans Yan himself, because his mother had undoubtedly been an important figure, he became some kind of product which would benefit a marriage. Therefore, his existence would have a significant impact on his father's great rebellion. Such were his delusions he entertained when he was bored. When he told them to Wu Zhu, the usually expressionless Wu Zhu hacked the butcher knife he was holding deep into the chopping board, his way of showing a certain level of respect for the frantically imaginative youth. For that same reason, Wu Zhu decided that he would not leave Dan Zhu with fans Yan for the time being. This crazy youth did not worry about the future. His face still possessed that shy yet curious smile, ever ready to join Count Sinan's foolish rebellion without regard for the possible dangers involved. That being the case, the blind Wu Zhu had no need to be afraid. Wu Zhu had never cared for his own well-being, only fans Yan's. When fans Yan showed that he didn't care much either. Wu Zhu simple let him to do as he pleased, for example, when fans Yan started to drink excessively at the age of five. Wu Zhu was only in charge of protecting fans Yan. He would not voluntarily object to much. Typically, master and servant duos like fans Yan and Wu Zhu were lazy and reckless characters. It's not that they couldn't be underhanded, but rather they felt that their martial powers were more effective than any kind of scheme. Thus, they looked upon the canavery of others as trivial. As they say, a bright moon on a wide river, a clear breeze among the hills. Fan Xian was not a bright moon, however, he was a waning crescent, 
still afraid of death and without access to extreme methods, like Wu Zhu had. But he knew he wouldn't die that easily, not with the blind servant and Fu Ji in the Overwatch Council supporting him. After witnessing the clash between Wu Zhu and Yi Lai Yun, one of the four great grand masters, Fan Xian was deeply moved. He had finally understood the artistic beauty of martial arts which was just as beautiful as tea ceremonies and calligraphy. That was why he stopped copying Dream of the Red Chamber for the moment and dedicated all of his attention to training. Wu Zhu didn't have any exceptional sword styles or unarmed techniques, but he was methodical when killing. He focused on being quick, accurate, direct, and ruthless. Once, he said to Fan Xian, Don't put your faith in those roundabout tricks. If you want to attack, do it straight ahead taking the shortest distance, as fast as you can, and strike your target a devastating blow. Fan Xian immediately thought of the other day when Wu Zhu leapt down from the cliff. He had indeed taken the shortest distance. He smiled bitterly as he wondered how long it would take him to reach the same level. After some lessons one day, Fan Xian swung his slightly aching right arm around and asked Wu Zhu, who was standing with his back turned. Based off of what we talked about before, what level am I currently at? He asked curiously. Level 7 in Zenki. Level 3 in your ability to control it. Fans Yang quickly did some calculations. Which averages out to level 5. That's more than 4. I could get a diploma. The youth was a bit haughty, his pride showing slightly in his eyes. Wu Zhu shook his head. If you're lucky, you can kill a level 7 opponent. If you're unlucky, some level 3 rogue can end your life. Fans Yan signed, still smiling and thinking to himself, Master Wu Zhu sure doesn't sugarcoat his words. Overall, his luck seemed fine so far, or else he wouldn't have came to this world after dying. After Yi Lai Yan came, Fans Yan's life in Danzu truly became peaceful. There were no more assassins, supposedly. The Count's second wife was seriously ill for a while and became less troublesome than before. In the capital, Fan Ra Eruo still sent letters once a month. Fan Yan spent his days in the small coastal city, eating tofu, copying books, occasionally buying some clothes to please the old mistress, drinking wine in the shop, and chopping up radishes to go with his wine. A leisurely life indeed. One day, a mirage appeared above the sea. The inhabitants of Danzu Harbor all came out to see the phenomenon. Although they had lived by the sea for a long time, the sight of ethereal islands floating above the horizon still astonished them. Wu Zhu started behaving strangely. He closed the doors of his shop and went to a remote area by the sea. Alone, he climbed up a cliff and stared into the distance. It looked like he was recalling some unpleasant memories. The mirage soon disappeared. But Wu Zhu stayed there, looking out into the distance through that black cloth, it seemed like he wasn't blind at all. Fans Yan ascended the cliff. Having already transformed his skinny build, his bare torso showed excellent proportions. Seeing Wu Zhu sitting quietly, he didn't want to be a bother, so he sat down beside him, looking at the sky touched by a fiery red of the setting sun. A long time passed. Then, Wu Zhu suddenly asked in a cold voice, how old are you now? Fans Yan tied his long, jet black hair back into a ponytail. Signs of masculinity had started to appear on his attractive face. He smiled. 16. Chapter 34 Zhu the Cool Wu Zhu is a strange and mysterious person. In Fans Yan's eyes, Uncle Wu Zhu's life had been very lonely. For 30 something years, he never had a companion or anyone to talk to. To this day, some inhabitants of Danzu still thought Wu Zhu was not only blind, but deaf too. Forever wearing that black strip of cloth over his eyes, Wu Zhu made fans yawn wonder if there was some unsightly scar behind the blindfold. Fji called him Master Wu, an obvious sign that Uncle Wu Zhu had once took part in the capital's official circles. However, he did not act like a government official in the slightest. Rather, he was like a sage who did not partake in earthly matters. Thinking about this, Fans Yan looked at Wu Zhu, who by this point had returned to a state of silence and continued to gaze at the sunset. He basked in the red rays, his blindfold reflecting a fiery color. Suddenly, Fans Yan had a scary thought. After pondering for a while, he asked, Uncle, you keep blanking out at the scenery, 
Did you come down from the heavens? At this point, fans Yan had already fully accepted things like Naegong, and even started to believe in the existence of a heavenly figure. Even so, if his friend for over ten years were to suddenly turn into some divine sage who descended from the clouds, fans Yan would not be able to accept this especially if he were to include to another world. Fans Yan would only end up being scared senseless and fall down. Wu Zhu shook his head, I am merely almost remembering the past, when the lady and I ventured out. You sure you and my mom aren't sages? Are there any supernatural beings in the world? Isn't there a temple? Who said supernatural beings lived in temples? Uncle, are you remembering some events? No, I merely forgot some things some unimportant things. Dot. Wu Zhu stood up and gave an almost unnoticeable nod towards the sea, as if saying farewell to an unknown place. He then said lightly, let's go back. I can tell you some of those things now. Fans Yan smiled. Wu hadn't forgotten the promise that, once he turned 16, he would be told certain things about his mother. Walking to the edge of the cliff, Fans Yan took in a breath of air. Zanki slowly began circulating inside his body. His entire form held on to the cliff. The Zanki traveled to his palms through the meridians, coming out as film thinner than a strand of silk before returning to his body through the edges of his hands. His hands had miraculously provided the Zanki with surfaces of contact, because Zanki is shapeless, it could form a perfect seal along the edge of Fans Yan's palms. His hands sticking to the slick rocks, Fans Yan secured himself using the adhering force of his Zenki. By releasing his Zenki, he could unstick and reposition his hands. Using this method, Fans Yan began to climb down from the cliff with relative ease. He looked like Spider Man. An ordinary martial artist, regardless of how much Zenki he had, would never accomplish this. Fans Yan could do it due to his unusual training and body and also his unique way of thinking. In this world, every martial artist only cared about substance and potential. Substance, of course, referred to how much Zenki a person had, and potential could only be described in the figurative sense, meaning something akin to realms. Studying other crafts had never been the focus of the strong. Wu Zhu saw substance and potential merely as ways to describe the quantity and quality of Zenki and the mastery of its control. After teaching Fan Xian for over ten years, his pupil stayed somewhere between level 3 and level 7, making almost no progress in the past four years. The general trend among the strong martial artists was to use their Zenki like a one-time two-lore weapon, releasing all of it at once like water to attack their opponents. Once released, they had no intention of restoring it. They exhausted their Zenki after every major battle, though they could still recover by meditating. They could hardly be blamed for adopting such a philosophy. After all, once Zenki leaves the body, it would be insane to even think about taking it back. But fans Yan thought otherwise. The circulatory path of his Zenki was already different from other people's to begin with. It entered from his back through the Xushan. Meaning he had an opening there which formed a circuit with the Yuanqi from nature. For that reason, his sense of Zenki was much sharper. On top of that, Fans Yan was often bored and very stingy. So he kept on releasing his Zenki and then taking it back. He toiled with this experiment for three years, and he could now finally release his Zenki within one tenth of an inch away from his palm and reclaim it. Such a short distance made it completely unsuited for attacking an enemy causing fans Yan to sadly admit that he wasted three years on something useless. A useless trick it may be, but fans Yan still thought of a way to make use of it. Once every three days he would scale the cliffs by the sea, not an easy task by any means. In a stroke of genius, he started to use the skill for climbing. Perhaps this was his greatest advantage over other people of this world that being his way of thinking which was unlimited by time. He had no preconceived notions, and everything was new and possible to him. Like a fish swimming through the water, Fans Yan made his way down the cliff. Looking up, Wu Zhu had already become a small speck. Fans Yan smiled, he wasn't in a hurry. Besides, he enjoyed watching Wu Zhu descend the mountain. Wu Zhu took a step forward, as if there was solid ground in front of him. His foot suspended in midair. Wu Zhu fell. Every 30 feet, 
he would leisurely reach out a hand and gently press against the cliff, slowing his descent. After doing this around ten times, Wu Zhu stood emotionless at the bottom of the cliff. Wu Zhu had made it look easy, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Direction, angle, amount of force, and even the sea wind needed to be calculated meticulously. There wasn't even the slightest room for error. Such strong and precise level of judgment could only belong to one of the strongest in the world. Considering Wu Zhu was blind, the descriptor one of could be removed. Although he had seen it countless times, Fans Yan couldn't help but admire him, so cool. Chapter 35, Memories of a Rainy Night Warm and gentle seas caressed Danzu Harbor during the month of March. The spirit of spring took center stage as the entire mountainous region bloomed with unnamed yellow flowers. Every single household used this flower to steep tea. Drinking this tea outside while chatting with the neighbors became a pastime. The fragrance of this flower tea hung in the air while walking through the streets of Danzu Harbor, neither too strong nor too faint. It brought about a sense of purity and greatly lifted spirits. When night came, spring rain often followed. It blended into the night with gentle breeze, silently nourishing the earth. In Danzu Harbor, the black roof tiles and stone paved roads were covered in the mist created by the rain. The light rain fell softly onto the tarp that hung outside the grocery shop, barely making any sound. The water washed off layers of dust, giving the storefront a more uplifting look. However, once again, the store was closed. After telling the Countess he was heading out, Fan Xian went to the store and drank with Wu Zhu while shelling peanuts. The people of the estate should have known that Fan Xian liked visiting that store, but they all thought he was mere greedy for the blind man's alcohol. It was indeed good alcohol, but Fan Xian also felt like it was an effective excuse for him to go out. It was impossible for him to interact with Wu Zhu completely out of sight of others. But they still took care. A kitchen knife lay on a dry chopping board. There were no bits of vegetables on the blade, the knife apparently hadn't been used in a while. The crackling of peanut shells resounded. Fans Yan threw a piece of peanut into his mouth and chewed slowly. It wasn't until he chewed the solid kernel completely into an aromatic pulp did he raise the small drinking cup to his lips. Taking the cup, which was only about three fingers wide, he downed the entire thing in one go. He wasn't drinking yellow wine today, but rather tribute quality wine from the capital with a rather high proof. Drinking it reminded Fans Yan a bit of Wu Angai. Fans Yan wasn't in a hurry to ask questions, because he knew Wu Zhu was a simple person who wouldn't keep him waiting for too long. Wu Zhu wasn't sitting across from Fans Yan. He held a bowl of yellow wine and sat in a dark corner. He started talking in a faint voice. They named the Lady King Mai. Her family name was Yi. I was her house servant. Many years ago, the lady and I ventured away from home. Yi King Mai. This was Fans Yan's first time hearing his mother's name. Strangely, a sense of warmth spread through his chest, so he smiled and drank another cup of wine. Out of amusement, he refrained from asking a question. About where they lived, Wu Zhu would answer it if he wanted to. We lived in Dongyi City for a few years. From the day of her birth, the lady showed intelligence and understood many things. She also had a kind and gentle heart. Because of that, she started a business in Dongyi City at the age of 15. However, since she was rather young, she did everything behind the scenes and had a shopkeeper pretend to be the owner. Fans Yan's hand stopped in midair while holding onto his cup. He could not help but ask, what does having a kind and gentle heart have to do with doing business? He wasn't curious about his mother's innate intelligence or why she could make money at 15. During all these years, he had already guessed it. His mother must be someone who couldn't be judged based on general common sense. Wu Zhu answered in an emotionless voice. The lady was saddened by the suffering of the common people, so she enjoyed performing kind deeds. When Dongyi City was flooded, the one who set up the most kanji stations was the lady. She knew if she wanted to help more people, she must obtain money. It was from there that she started to figure out ways to earn money. Fan Xian nodded as he accepted his mother's logic. Her business did very well. Gradually, some people noticed she was the real owner and began plotting. I ended up killing them all. Wu Zhu's voice was very flat when he said it, 
but fans Yan realized it must have been extremely tense during the time. If Wu Zhu thought the business was doing well, it must be true. People always say wealth plagues its owner. A 15-year-old girl owning so much property really would invite unwelcome ambition from immoral lowlifes. But after realizing what type of bodyguard his mother had, fans Yan disregarded his unreasonable concern. Suddenly, he remembered something, and asked with a frown. My mom's last name was Yi, what that also the name of your shop? Yes, so it was. Fans Yan's face was filled with astonishment, I heard people mentioning the name. Over a decade ago, it seems, it was the number one business. But I never thought it belonged to my mother. I didn't know exactly how big her business got. Wu Zhu said very calmly, that was not part of my job. The lady thought I had killed too many people. So she closed her business in Dongyi City and went to King Kingdom, settling down in the capital. Fans Yan felt it wasn't that simple, closing up shop in Dongyi City and then coming to King. There was a better explanation than that. Wu Zhu continued, the lady started her business again after coming to the capital, and she once again did very well. Later she became acquainted with some people including Sinan. Everybody seemed to listen to what she said and prepared things according to her ideas. Eventually they changed a few things and came into conflict with King's royalty, who felt their benefits were being threatened. Wu Zhu paused a bit. Once, King was fighting a war on the Eastern Front, and the defenses in the capital were practically empty. I happened to be away from the city after a major incident. As you can imagine, the lady's security was compromised. The nobles sent out people and murdered the lady. When I got back, I only managed to save you, and brought you to Danzu Harbor. This event fans Yan knew very well, he also knew those enemies were all killed over ten years ago. He believed that whoever was still talking about revenge must have had something to do with his cheap father and the Overwatch Council. There was a long period of silence. The sound of rain outside became noticeable. That's it. Fans Yan felt troubled. His mother's entire life was narrated in such a few sentences. What was her business? What did she do that made all the royalty of King get rid of her? Why would the famous G of the Overwatch Council respond with the utmost respect whenever his mother was mentioned? Basically. That's it. Wu Zhu chose his words carefully. Fans Yan sighed, admitting that Uncle Wu Zhu really wasn't much of a storyteller. A bitter smile appeared on his beautiful face as he realized he must ask the questions himself. What was my mother's business involved in? Luxury items, military supplies, ships, food supplies, basically, anything that could earn her money. Wu Zhu answered casually, but fans Yan was startled by each one of the items. His two lives made him realize that, People who could manage such business much have some grand backgrounds. His mother was a single woman, and yet she brought her house up to such a terrific level. Then what happened to the business after my mother died? Fan Xian was most curious about this, as according to the national laws of King, he should be the sole inheritor of his mother's grand legacy. I heard later everything was taken by the King government. Fans Yan gave a bitter smile and shook his head. As soon as he heard it all became imperial property, he gave up the idea of suing to get it all back. Changing the topic, he grinned, Yi King Mai must have been quite the name back then. I heard that when my mother came to the capital, she gave the commander of defense a beating. The oil lamp flickered. Hearing fans Yan's words made Wu Zhu remember something. The corners of his lips perked up as if they were rusty hinges. Wu Zhu was showing a gentle smile. Fans Yan's wrist froze. His drinking cup fell onto the table and rolled several times. Inside his mind, he was screaming, a smile. He just smiled. Chapter 36 the spring of the fourth year. This was the first time that the blind Wu Zhu laughed, or more accurately, it was the first time fans Yan had seen Wu Zhu laugh. It happened when fans Yan brought up his mother. Although Wu Zhu didn't look old when he removed the piece of black cloth, he was still as cold as ever. It was rare to see any hint of emotion on his face, and naturally harder to see anything such as fear sadness or grief. Never mind a smile. As he remembered back to the year he came to Jingdu with the lady, 
The ends of his lips curled into a strange and awkward smile. The occasional display of gentleness for someone who never smiled was like finding the most beautiful snow lotus flower in an ice mountain that had been frozen for millennia. Its gentleness and beauty knew no parallel. Dot. Wu Zhu snapped out of his absent-minded state and returned to his normal self, responding coldly. There weren't many who knew that the lady was called Yi King Mai. The random people around her only knew her as the lady. Thinking about it now, the name Yi King Mai was well known in the capital. Even now, he replied softly. Really? Fans Yan's eyes widened. He thought that Wu Zhu's words contradicted themselves. If not many people knew that his mother's name was Yi King Mai, then how was the name Yi King Mai well known in the capital? The reason that fans Yan thought this was because he was unaware of the golden words and inscriptions written on the stone plate hanging above the front door of the Ministry of Supervision. Tell me about my father. Fans Yan's eyes sparkled. I only promised to talk about the lady. HMPH, you're real clever, Wu Zhu. I fell sick before you were born and forgot many things. Fans Yan laughed. You're even more shameless than I am. Um, the never mind, let's talk about something else. What did my mother look like? Wu Zhu thought for a bit before replying. Very beautiful. Wu Zhu's voice was never too expressive. Yet fans Yan noticed that he said those words with unusual sincerity. He rubbed his hands together, sighing as he said, She was indeed extraordinarily beautiful. Dot. Although Wu Zhu's storytelling skills were poor, fans Yan could tell from his simple words how interesting the story of the girl from the capital must have been. He felt a strong impulse to go to the capital, in fact, he had to. Wu Zhu motioned with his hands for fans Yan to get up and follow him. Curious, fans Yan followed him to the back of the room. Soft sounds could be heard from inside the walls as Wu Zhu pressed on it lightly. All of a sudden, the walls separated to reveal a secret chamber. Surprised, fans Yan followed Wu Zhu into the chamber. The room was covered in a layer of dust, and a box sat in the corner. The box stood out as there was nothing else in the chamber. It was a black leather box that was about as long as an adult arm, and not being wide, it looked long and slender. Nobody knew that the lady and I stayed in Danzu a while before going to the capital. This box was something the lady had left. I've looked after it for you. It's yours to keep now. Heart fluttering. Fans Yan stepped towards the box and brushed off the dust at the top. He found that the lid was made of bronze and that there was a lock. He was curious to see what his mother had left him, so he spent some time trying to open the box before he realized that the lid had not moved a millimeter and that the box was impossible to open. There's no key. Wu Zhu reminded him seeing his distress. Dejected, Fans Yan hung his head low. Why didn't you say so earlier? What's the use of giving me a box that I can't open? I left the keys in order to convince some people that you were dead before I brought you to Danzu. Fans Yan thought about how it sounded like that was the oldest trick in the book and raised his eyebrow. He retrieved a thin dagger he kept in the scabbard on his legs at all times and held it above the box as he looked for the easiest place to start with. There's no need to try. This box is much sturdier than you think. Hearing Wu Zhu's disapproval at his violent method, fans Yan smiled and put back his dagger. He patted the box and sighed while he shook his head. It's a shame. Who knows if there might have been millions in money in there. He then lifted the box and his curiosity increased after finding out how heavy it was. Where is the key? In the capital. Another extremely vague answer. Wu Zhu turned to walk out of the chamber. Seeing that there was no more attention on him, fans Yan decided to try again. Rolling his eyes, he lifted his right arm and slammed his palm directly on the top of the box. His palm carried all of his power. Bang. The sound reverberated around the chamber and dust rose into the air, causing the light in the room to drastically dim. Wu Zhu turned around coldly and looked at Fan Zhan. At this moment, Fan Zhan was staring at his palm, shocked. The box remained unmarked, save for some dust. It looked like the only way to get the box open was to go to the capital. He began silently thinking of when he'd be able to leave Danzu. Surely his father wouldn't leave him to grow old next to the seaside. Little did he know that Count Sinan had already sent people to get him and that they were already on their way. In the spring of the fourth year, 
Teng Tsai Jing sat in the only bar in Danzu and stared at the wall while wiping the sweat off his forehead. Framed beautifully on the wall was a piece of high-quality paper. It was densely covered in words, and judging from the handwriting, it was written by a master calligrapher who possessed a sense of elegance and purity. If this was in the capital, Sir Panlin would have sold a piece of artwork of this size for at least 300 silver pieces, so it was no surprise that in faraway Danzu Harbour it was framed so beautifully on the wall and treated like it was sacred. However, its context was truly unsuitable to be hung up as decoration. This was because it was full of useless and sloppy information. That's right. This was the rumored newspaper. There were only two copies in Danzu Harbor, one belonging to the local government kept in the local courtroom, and this meant that the bar owner must have bought it secretly from the servants of Count Sonnen's estate. Naturally, the general public had never had the chance to see fresh stuff like this, so to them, it was something extraordinary that was also handwritten by Sir Panlin. The bar owner hung it on his wall and treated it like treasure. Only, he had no idea that the newspaper was actually sold by Master Fan, who had in fact already made a sum of money from selling 20 copies of the newspaper to businessmen. And Teng Tsai Jing was about to meet Master Fan. Chapter 37 to the capital, the servants that had came to Danzu Harbor with Tang Zijing were currently shopping for the specialty tea of Danzu Harbor. As Count Sunan lived in the capital, he missed the taste of his hometown tea. In the previous years, the Countess of the mansion would order people to buy the tea and send it to the capital, but since Count Sunan was sending people over this year, they could simply pick it up themselves. In total, three carriages and seven people arrived from Count Sunan's mansion with Tang Zijing leading the entire thing. Although he hadn't wandered around the street with the servants, he was still sweating like a pig and had to constantly wipe away his sweat. The weather in Danzu Harbor was indeed hotter than in the capital. He had originally planned to greet the Countess as soon as he arrived in Danzu Harbor, but upon remembering his mission he immediately felt guilty. Instead, he sent the servants to buy tea while he sat in a bar and tried to get a hold of his emotions. They had not heard from the second housekeeper they had sent to Danzu some years ago, and they weren't even sure if he was dead or alive. All the people of Count Sunan's house were clear on the fact there was conflict between House of Danzu and the capital, and they figured that even though Fan Xian was on his own, something had happened to the second housekeeper. If this was true, then the people of Count Sunan's house had to reevaluate their views on the illegitimate son. After all, Fan Xian was only 12 when the second housekeeper went missing. The only way that the second housekeeper could have disappeared so quietly was if it was by order of the Countess, which proved that the Countess was on Fan Xian's side and that it was likely second wife was in store for hard times. Zhang Zijing noticed that the newspaper on the wall was dated last month which meant that he had already read it before in Count Sunan's study. There were no intriguing articles, as the lives of the officials in the capital were peaceful for now. There were no updates on the battle between the eldest prince and Su, and news of the Chancellor's illegitimate daughter had died down, as the young people of the Sensrate had not pursued anything further even though they had the cover of the mighty emperor. There were side articles about the director of the Overwatch Council and his first love. Even though the paper was backed by the Emperor, the editors would never have dared to post these articles if the absolutely horrifying and blood-chilling director had been in the capital. It was obvious from this that Director Chen had taken his first vacation in 20 years and had gone to visit his home down. As the Emperor was especially reliant on him, there would be no major activities during his absence. Tang Zijing thought of Count Sunan's orders and could not understand exactly why it was an absolute priority that he ensured the young master with no identity was rushed to the capital before the director returned, nor would he delay things, even if it meant going against an angry countess. He wiped the sweat off his forehead, gathered the servants, and headed for the corner of Danzu where Count Sunan's estate was located. The liveliness in Count Sunan's estate was a rare sight. All of the servants stood outside the hall and took in the people standing in the middle of the hall. Everyone knew that these people were from the estate in the capital, so to them, 
it was no wonder that they looked energetic even in pale green clothing. Since Danzo and the capital were far from each other, the two estates didn't interact that much, as it was unusual for such a large number of people to be sent from the capital's estate. The maids were trying to guess their motives, leading the servants. Ten Zijing knelt down conscientiously in front of the countess and performed several deep bows in respect and as a greeting. Afterwards, he passed on the message Count Sinan sent and stepped quietly aside to wait for her response. Tang Zijing was aware of her place in the Fan family, so he breathed as quietly as possible to show his deepest respects. He glanced at the young boy who was currently massaging the countess's shoulders. The young boy was pretty. He had long eyelashes, full red lips, and eyes that sparkled softly. In general, he looked like a girl. The wide smile on his face made him seem amiable and friendly. This was, of course, Fan Zhan. Tang Zijing sighed to himself. He thought it was unfair that this beautiful child was an illegitimate son with no identity. Perhaps it was because he was infected by the warm smile. Tang Zijing began to question whether this young master was easier to serve than the one in the capital. After hearing what this person in front of her needed to say, the countess cast her eyes down in thought before she spoke in a low voice, I understand, Zijing, you may rest now, since you have worked so hard and have traveled over 1000 miles. Sissy, please ask Lao Huang to, to prepare some hot water and food. The servants collectively acknowledged her request and the servants from the capital thanked her before exiting the hall. Although Tang Zijing was on a tight schedule from Count Sinan, he didn't dare to bring it up. He glanced at the foreign young master one last time instead and left. The hall became quiet. Well, you heard. Your father wants you to go to the capital. The old lady gently patted Fan's Yan's hands, which sat on her shoulder. What do you think? Although Fan's Yan was smiling widely, his mind was calculating. He was suspicious as to why his father had called him to the capital all of a sudden without warning. Perhaps he was preparing a career for his illegitimate son, but the spring imperial examinations had already begun, and he would never be able to make it in time, as it took at least a month to travel to the capital. Upon hearing the countess's words, fans Yan smiled dryly and answered, I've never been to the capital. I'm quite curious and scared at the same time. His answer was only half true the truth being that he really was curious about the people who lived there and of the city where his mother and lived and fought battles. However, he was not scared at all, more frustrated at his own lack of knowledge. Would you like to go? The countess smiled, it was as if she could see through his thoughts. Yes. Fans Yan answered honestly. I've always lived in Danzu and have always wanted to get out and see the world. Oh, you no longer wish to keep your old grandma company. The countess joked. Fans Yan giggled. Oh, yeah, and you can go ahead and punish me for that. He continued, anyways, the man said so himself, father has prepared for us all to move to the capital, so I have nothing to worry about really, as I would be at my grandma's side at all times. The countess shook her head gently, and holding his hands, she pulled him in front of her and spoke softly. My old bag of bones would not be able to tolerate the journey. If you wish to go, then go ahead. I will look after the house in Danzu. Fans Yan was thrown off guard. He had not expected his grandmother to reject the journey to the capital and he was at a loss for words. Chapter 38 Last night, grandmother and grandson sat in silence in the quiet hall. In the courtyard, the scented tea purchased by the people from the capital was piled in the corner. Slowly, the aroma of the tea began to seep out, eventually overpowering the smell of the flowers growing in the garden. A few yellow butterflies danced between the blossoming trees, above them, among the branches, the crisp chirping of hatchling birds could be heard. Go. The young phoenix becomes an adult when it utters its first cry. You should go and see the world. The countess smiled. It's just that, since you're still a child, I fear you may experience lots of unjust treatment in the capital. Can you endure that? Fan Zian knew what his grandmother meant. He smiled sweetly. The second aunt was kind to me for the past few years, often sending gifts. Grandma, you don't need to worry. The countess shook her head. She was aware that, despite his quiet demeanor, 
Fans Jan was actually a strange boy with many unusual ideas. She gently caressed his head. After a brief moment of silence, she suddenly expressed her concern. If something comes up, bear with it, for your father and me. Okay. Fans Jan nodded. To be honest, I do not want you to go to the capital, the Countess said very carefully, but you have to go eventually, so I might as well ask you to do something. I'll do whatever you need. Do you still remember that housekeeper Zhu from four years ago? The Countess smiled at Fans Yan. Fans Yan's heart skipped a beat. He dared not make eye contact with his grandmother. After a long while, he forced a smile. Of course I do. After Fans Yan's answer, the pair finally got to the bottom of everything. The Countess was serious. There was originally nothing to worry about. Since you're a calm and smart child, but judging from that incident, I could see that you are still too innocent. Fan Xian sighed inwardly. Isn't innocent supposed to be a compliment? As if guessing his thoughts, the Countess squinted. With a cold gaze, she said, if you really do go to the capital, you have to do something for me. What? Fan Xian had a faint idea. Be merciless. As if feeling a bit tired. The Countess reclined back and rested on her chair. While this world may appear peaceful, if you don't steal yourself, you will always be at a disadvantage. Fans Jan did not say anything. In truth, he wasn't a gentleman, he only appeared to be one because he never got the chance to show his darker side in Danzu, and so, he listened to the Countess's warning. He knew that her advice was priceless. The Countess half closed her eyes and said, your mother was so smart. But because she was also so kind, she ended up. She suddenly opened her eyes and emphasized each of the following words. Even if you have to kill others, you mustn't let others harm you. Fan Xian nodded vigorously. Dot. Go pack. Your father is under lots of pressure. He is afraid there really is something happening in the capital. The Countess looked at the child, who had just turned 16 with an expression full of warmth, I'm not going, I'm staying here in Denzu, if your life in the capital isn't going well, or if there are people trying to take advantage of you, you can always come back whenever you want to, right, fans, Jan answered, he stood up and went straight to his bedroom without saying much else, after he entered his room, he quietly sat on his bed and wiped his face using his blanket, after making a mess out of his hair, he quietly said to himself, Drat, I almost cried. Grandma really knows how to stir up feelings. Dash. Shortly after nightfall, a lamp was dimly lit. Fan Xian, expressionless, was writing a letter to his younger sister in the capital, informing her of his arrival. It wasn't until after he had finished that he realized the letter might very well be pointless. The mail coach might not be any faster than the Count's carriage meaning he might have already arrived by the time she received the letter. Fans Jan tended to save his energy. Since he already wrote the letter, he might as well send it. He was just about to beckon Sissy to remind her to send the mail tomorrow when he turned around and saw her looking at him blankly, deep in thought. Sissy, what's on your mind? He waved the letter in his hand to get her attention. Sissy came back to her senses abruptly. She was quite embarrassed. Oh, it's nothing. Is that for your sister? I'll take it for you. Fans Yang retracted his hand and looked at her with curiosity. What is it? Sissy thought for a bit. Finally, she gathered up her courage. Young master, you're about to leave for the capital. Aren't you happy? Fans Yang sat up straight and smiled at her. Why this all of a sudden, young master? I hear the capital is full of bad people. Sissy bit at her lip unsure if she should continue. Besides, you don't have much status. Once you're there, in front of the Count's second wife, I'm afraid your life will be difficult. Fans Yan laughed. So you're worried about me? Well, I can simply avoid the second wife. Even if I don't make a name for myself in the capital, I can still make a living running a clinic. As long as I don't stay at the Count's place. And quite frankly, I only want to go there to take a look, Sissy said, you won't be stuck doing menial tasks your whole life. After all, you've read so many books, you will certainly pass next year's examinations and become a high-ranking official. You will bring honor to your family. Seeing how she said it so seriously, 
fans Jan smiled slightly and didn't respond. He never thought of honoring his family, and deep inside he didn't even hold much feeling for his cheap father in the capital. Life over there was much different from how it was here with his grandmother. Why don't you take me with you to the capital? This was what Sissy was actually worried about. She looked at Fans Jan with a pitiful expression. The servants in the capital will certainly follow the second wife's orders, so you don't have anyone to rely on. What are you going to do? Fans Jan sighed. Sissy was two years older than him. If she were a maid servant of some other household, she would have been chased out a long time ago. The only reason she thought of herself as being dependable was because Fans Jan was secretly very mature as a result of having lived a previous life. Fans Jan then told Sissy in a matter-of-fact manner, I don't have any idea what the capital is like, so I can't possibly take you with me. Sissy knew this was true. She was afraid she might never see her young master again after he left. She felt her heart sour a little and quickly turned around to organize the bookcase. Fans Jan too felt gloomy as he watched her work, but there was nothing he could say. Perhaps in the capital there would be some pleasant scenery, or interesting people, or curious things. But there would surely also be brandished blades and hidden darts. Fans Jan was willing to take such risks, he wanted to experience them, because he had been gifted a second life. There was no sense in growing old and lonely without ever leaving the tiny city of Danzu. However, he couldn't say the same for those he cared about. He wasn't confident he could protect them, so it wouldn't be possible for him to take Sissy along. At night, he took a secret trip to the shop. Chapter 39 Leaving Danzu Harbor, Tang Zijing never would have imagined that the Count's assignment would be completed so smoothly this time. He had originally thought that. Since young master fans Yan didn't have a reputation worthy of respect, he would be extremely reluctant to came to the capital and contend with the Count's second wife, and therefore must be trying his best to stay in Danzu Harbor. The fact that this young master had agreed to the Count's request without complaint was beyond expectations. That morning, he found out that the Countess had decided to stay in Danzu Harbor. He didn't mind, however because all he needed was for that lowly young master to go back to the capital. Since the Countess liked to be by the sea, she could stay there and live out her remaining years. In any event, the Count had not requested that everybody in the Danzu estate move back to the capital. At the front gate of the estate, a black carriage was waiting. It was pulled by three horses and there was a blue cushion at the driver's seat. The contrast between the blue and the black was rather striking. Surrounding the carriage was a huge crowd of Danzu residents, drawn by the spectacle. After some gossiping, they found out the young master of the fan household was moving back to the capital that day. As with all humans, the residents of Danzu Harbor had their shortcomings, being envious or sharp-tongued. Even so, all of them had developed some sentiments towards the little fan child. After all, for over ten years, they watched this young master, who certainly did not act like one, stroll down the streets or shout from the rooftops. Now, hearing the news that he was leaving for the flourishing capital, they figured it was unlikely he would return. This caused some sobbing in the crowd. The crowd waited outside the Count's estate waiting for fans Jan to step out for the last time. They waited for a long time, but the charming face with its perpetual gentle smile never appeared. Dot. The backyard was a mess. Fans Jan leaned against a column, smiling as he watched the maidservants rushing about. One of them shouted, Toothbrush, forgot the toothbrush. They ended up spending even more time looking for it. After coming to this world, Fans Jan hadn't come up with any major inventions. One of the minor things he came up with was a more comfortable toothbrush which used boar bristles instead of the conventional horsetail ones. He also made a softer pillow, replacing the hard pillows with cotton ones. And finally, he made a shower head which he hung up behind the bedroom. There were many others, but from the way things were going, he could only bring a few of them back to the capital. After quite some time, when the carriage was completely stuffed by the last few bags, fans Jan finally walked out slowly. He was smiling brightly and supporting the Countess as they walked. Fans Jan greeted the people around him and wasn't surprised to see Sissy in the crowd. Her eyes were a little swollen. Fans Jan recalled her crying last night. Today, as an exception, 
He wore a chingshan, lifting the front lapel, he knelt and kowtowed to the countess. After standing up, Fan Zhan, going completely against the customs of this world, hugged the old woman tightly and firmly kissed her wrinkled forehead. He then said lightly, Grandma, please find a good family for Sissy to marry into, at least a family like Donger's. All of the estate's servants acted like they didn't see the young master causing trouble. The countess was surprised too. She never thought her typically well-behaved grandson would make such a scene. She knocked him on the head and said, why are you trying to stir things up? Of course I'll handle it. Scanning the familiar faces before him, Fans Yan made a gesture of respect by saluting everyone. Smiling, he said, thanks for putting up with me all these years. The servant stared not accept Fans Yan's courtesy and hurriedly found something to do. Suddenly, the countess smiled. Go. Don't make your father wait. As for Sissy, if you eventually feel comfortable living in the capital, I'll send her over to you. Fans Yan was startled for a moment. Before he could say something, he was already in the carriage in a confused state. With the sound of the wheels turning, the carriage slowly made its way out of Danzu Harbor. It was a bright and clear day. The silky white clouds floated across the blue sky. It was an exceptionally beautiful scene. The carriage passed by the closed general store and passed far beyond the tofu stand, lifting the curtain. Fans Yan looked towards the young woman running the tofu stand and her little daughter, who was now old enough to run around. Smiling slightly, he sat back down. Under his seat was an ancient, black leather box. Dash. In Danzu Harbor, that struggling general store finally closed down for good. The city residents casually mentioned it, fearing the blind shop owner would end up old and poor, and offered their sympathy. Shortly afterwards, the topic switched back to young Master Fan, who had just left the city. They were guessing that the Count had called his illegitimate son to the capital to assign him a position. Presently, Fan's Yan was lying in the spacious carriage. His carriage was in the middle of the traveling caravan. Inside, Fan's Yan had laid his blanket down so that its softness could absorb some impact from the bumpy road. Of course. He also wanted to learn the real reason why his father wanted him in the capital, so he invited Tang Zijing, who was leading the guards, inside for a chat. Tang Zijing sat on the other side of the carriage with a dark expression, he didn't know where to put his feet, as he feared he would dirty the snow white blanket. He felt uncomfortable, in his eyes, this young master was just another prodigal son. No better than the other young master in the capital. Fans Yan comfortably stretched. He squinted at the middle-aged man, who obviously possessed significant strength, and asked, Mr. Tang, since we've already traveled so far from Danzu Harbor, can you tell me why my father is summoning me to the capital? Tang Zijing was somewhat hesitant, as if there were some things he should not say. Smiling. Fans Yan's eyes were sparkling clear. He said in a gentle voice, You know my background. It's no wonder you're being cautious. Tang Zijing squeezed out a smile in return, and respectfully answered, Try not to look too much into it. The Count wants you to came to the capital in order to prepare you for your future. Fans Yan waved his hand and shook his head. There are only the two of us here. No need to beat around the bush. He suddenly laughed. If you don't tell me, Perhaps I'll jump out of the carriage and run away. Tang Zijing laughed. You're quite the comedian, my lord. Before Tang Zijing could finish, Fans Yan stated coldly, There are times when I don't like telling jokes. Tang Zijing's heart skipped a beat as he wondered if Fans Yan was serious. If you really didn't want to go to the capital, everyone would understand. So why didn't you speak out against it back in Danzu Harbor, in front of the Countess? Looking at the handsome youth, Tang Zijing started to realize Fans Yan wasn't as simple as he had thought. Of course, Fans Yan wouldn't actually run away, even though he figured that nothing good could be waiting for him in the capital. Having lived a wealthy and leisurely life these past years, he lost his adventurous spirit a long time ago. A difficult, destitute life would not suit him. He had came to this world to indulge himself. At the same time, he wanted to see what the capital was like, 
which was why he had no intention of refusing when Count Sinan sent people to take him there. But that didn't mean he wasn't curious about what was being hidden from him. After a long period of quiet, Tang Zijing could no longer endure the cold silence within the carriage. My lord, he began, in truth, the Count has arranged a marriage for you in the capital. Fans Yan looked at him for a long while before finally asking, Marriage? Chapter 40, Approaching the Capital Correct, Tang Zijing replied respectfully. He did not wish for the same miserable ending as the housekeeper from a few years before, so he remained respectful toward this half-prince. Fans Yan frowned, and a calmness unusual for someone his age appeared on his face. His expression was nothing like that of any normal teenager who had just been told who they were going to be married to. I'm curious about who my bride will be, he said softly. He was 16 years old, and he knew that among influential officials and powerful families, marriage was discussed as a part of the agenda. Even after all these years, his father hadn't forgotten about his illegitimate son and so this day was inevitable. However it seemed rather rushed, and he couldn't understand why. I am dot not sure either, replied Tang Zijing. But I have heard that the young lady of that family is good and virtuous, and that people say many good things about her in the capital. His cautious explanation only made fans yawn more suspicious. He was unsure why high-ranking officials would wish to marry off their daughters to an illegitimate son with no status even if his parents were, secretly, extremely well-renowned people. Seeing his facial expression, Tang Zijing eventually spoke. The only thing is that the young lady's health is not good. She recently became ill, so it is rather urgent. Fans Yan had a sudden realization, he was a gift for the family of the sick girl. He couldn't help but shake his head and smile bitterly. Tang Zijing studied the expression on his face and found that the young master was neither furious nor sorrowful. If anything he seemed calmer. He was to be married off to a dying girl, surely he should be at least somewhat angry. Fans Yan had nothing to be angry about, he had seen this plot too many times before in his previous life and getting angry wouldn't help matters. He felt a touch of sympathy for this girl, who was in her sickbed in the capital, forced into a marriage to some man she had never met just because of her failing health. And what about him? Fan Xian was not easily depressed, he had always been somewhat chauvinistic, feeling that when it came to matters between men and women, it was always women who got the worst of it and men who took advantage. He had always wanted to get married and have children in this world. If he happened to find a good woman, wouldn't that be all the better? Anyway, he had yet to arrive in the capital, so there was no need to flee straight away. He thought a good idea to investigate the matter first. He just had to wait and see. Would she be pretty? Cute? Is she like a Lolita? Dot. Young master, asked Tang Zijing carefully. Why? Why am I not angry? Fans Yan smiled at him. First, my going to the capital doesn't mean I agreed to getting married. Second, if I accept this marriage, it means that I like this girl. Third, even if she is confined to her sickbed, I don't think that it's anything to be embarrassed about. Fourth, perhaps you didn't know this, but I am quite a good doctor. Tang Zijing was taken aback. This four-point explanation had confused him, particularly the last part. Was the young master really a medical expert? But he still did not think that the young master's wedding could turn so easily from tragedy to happiness. The young lady's family situation was by no means a simple one. Even the imperial physicians could not treat her illness. How could the young master do so? Before their carriage had stopped, Tang Zijing stepped out and climbed onto the first carriage, leaving Fan Xian by himself. The journey was a lonely one. He pulled back the curtain of the carriage and allowed the wind to caress his face. Squinting slightly, he looked at the scenery as it hurtled past and the flagstones set upon the road. It felt like a series of endless pictures being displayed over and over again. It looked just like it had when he had came to this world 16 years ago. Dash. It was a late April day. The grass that surrounded the capital had been trimmed and the Orioles had been startled by people out on nature walks. There were only two rows of green willows along the side of the moat, swaying gracefully, proudly observing the people who had came to the city from all over the world. 
a convoy of three carriages approached from afar and joined the line along the road that was waiting to enter the city. The curtain of the carriage was lifted, and out came a clean face with a brilliant smile. He looked at the city walls and the peaceful happy faces of the people around him. He breathed in deeply. So this is what the capital is like. The face, of course, belonged to Fans Yan. After weeks of difficult travel, they had all finally arrived in the capital. On the road, he had observed the unfamiliar sights of the Kingdom of King with great interest, finally fulfilling his own wanderlust, and having gotten to know Tang Zijing and his bodyguards, he had become closer to them. Fans Yan was a lovable teenager who always had a smile on his face. A person like that finds it easy to make people happy. Tang Zijing took hold of his arm and helped him step down from the carriage. When his feet touched the road, Fans Yan rotated his ankles slightly, letting the soles of his cloth shoes touch as much of the ground as possible. It was as if he was trying to feel whether the ground in the capital was different. A great many people were trying to enter the capital and security was tight, so the line was long. The waiting left fans Yan rather bored. He pointed at the city before him, and chatted idly with Tang Zijing. He figured that the Count had not sent a large team of people to collect him because his status was not particularly great. As they chatted, there was a sudden disturbance in the crowd behind them, and the people parted to create a wide path through. A squadron of cavalry rode silently and quickly through toward the city gate without stopping. On the horse in the front was a young woman wearing a light-colored jacket and skirt. She had on a white deerskin hat that looked very attractive on her in the bright spring air. Her eyebrows were indigo, like the color of distant mountains, and her eyes were clear and bright. She was quite beautiful though she seemed worried as she sat on the horse. It seemed that she was in a hurry to return to the city, something must have happened. Fans Yan stood by the side of the road, smiling as he observed the riders rushing past. It seems there are many beautiful women in the capital, he said in admiration. He couldn't help but wonder what his wife looked like. Standing on the side of the road, Tang Zijing coughed lightly. Fans Yan was only giving a compliment, he hadn't forgotten his manners. What was there to be nervous about? It seems the capital is not as uptight as I thought, he said with a smile. That girl was wearing a skirt while she was riding a horse, and nobody said a thing about it. Tang Zijing laughed bitterly. The woman who went past us was the daughter of the master of the garrison, he explained. Nobody would dare say anything to her. Oh, said Fans Yan, standing on top of the carriage to get a better look at the city gate. When the riders reached the gate, they did not wait in line at all. Presenting a token, they entered the city. When it came time for Fans Yan to enter the city, he studied the guard's expression. It remained neutral, which was a part of his job. When he looked back at the carriage, he realized why. There were none of the markings of the Fan family on any of the carriages. It seemed that the capital would not be welcoming him with any great fanfare. Chapter 41 Entering Fan Manor Fan Manor stood on the east side of the city some distance away from Tan Avenue, and out of sight of the Imperial Palace. This was a place where many high-ranking officials and nobles lived, commoners were rarely seen, and so the streets appeared much quieter. On the cold and cheerless street, a mansion stood every 30 meters. Outside the entrance to each mansion, a stone lion lay peacefully. The dozen or so lions stood guard staring with what almost looked like a bored expression at the carriage that rolled down the street. The black carriage passed slowly by, drawing little attention from either side of the road. Reaching Fan Manor, it turned with a little difficulty into a side alley, coming to a halt underneath the shade of a tree by the corner gate. Fans Yan pulled the curtain on the carriage aside. Taking Tang Zijing's hand, he stepped down from the carriage. There was no expression on his face and as he surveyed his surroundings he gave an almost imperceptible nod. The wooden gate creaked open, and the servants came out to meet them, looking upon Fans Yan with curious glances, seemingly unsure how to greet him. Fans Yan smiled and said nothing as he walked through the gate with Tang Zijing. The servants let out a sigh and began to unload the luggage that filled the carriage. Within the gate, a young man servant waited bowing as he ushered them in. As they entered, there was a rock garden in the courtyard, with neatly groomed grass and a bubbling water feature. It was a most elegant sight, 
and as the old women saw them arrive, they moved quietly to the side, not uttering a word, remaining neatly in formation. As they carried on, still yet to reach the inner courtyard, Fans Young couldn't help but let out a sigh of awe at the sight of all the splendor of this old mansion. It was much, much grander than the estate in Denzu. With such a grand mansion in one of the most expensive areas of the capital, it seemed that his father was certainly a man of great influence. Entering such a grand residence as this would make any average ordinary person feel flustered and anxious, not daring to say a word for fear of putting a foot wrong. But Fans Yan was not any person. He had lived two in two worlds, he had died and been reborn, and so he felt rather more at ease. He was accustomed to his status as a baseborn son, and in keeping with the social attitudes of his previous life, he didn't see anything wrong with it. If anything, he thought his father was the one who ought to be ashamed, so the grandeur of Fan Manor did not perturb him too much. As he walked along, looking around the manor, he smiled completely at ease. Although there was perhaps a hint of shyness in his smile, it was a cover and nothing more. As he surveyed the scene, he let out a low whistle of astonishment. As he passed by a weeping willow, he stroked its branches with his hand. As he strolled over an arch bridge, he peered at the goldfish that swam in the shallow waters beneath. It appeared that he did as he pleased. The servants of the manor could not help but look upon his manner with curiosity. So this was the young master they had heard so much about. Some of the things they heard were good, some not so much. Either way, it was suggested that this young man had a forceful personality, though it was hard to describe in words. As they approached the inner courtyard, Tang Zijing spoke in a low voice, Young master, I am not permitted to go any further. You must enter alone. He paused for a moment in thought, Young master, when you speak. Tang Zijing secretly harbored some admiration how young fans Yan seemed unaffected by all the trappings of status. He felt he had to say something to the young lad about the power struggles that went on inside Fan Manor but the words could not leave his lips. It felt impetuous to do so, and he had no idea how to word it. Fans Yan could tell that he was deep in thought. Moved, he clasped his hands respectfully and bowed slightly. Don't worry, Mr. Tang, he said, asking him to make sure his luggage was taken care of, and suggesting that he might call upon him later that evening to calmly arrange the day's later affairs at such a moment at this suggested to Tang Zijing that this handsome young man possessed a great maturity. On hearing it, he relaxed slightly and smiled, going off with the young man servant to rest in the courtyard to the side. A young servant girl took the place of the young man servant. She was a rather pretty young woman. Fans Yan followed her into the rear courtyard. A middle-aged woman, carrying a brass basin walked up to them and curtsied. She washed his face with pleasantly warm water. Fans Yan remained silent as he washed his hands. He returned the towel and thanked her. The woman was rather taken aback to hear him thank her. She walked away, somewhat confused. Fans Yan smiled. The capital's nothing like Danzu, he thought. The politeness he'd shown to servant girls was seen as excessive and inappropriate here. He entered the inner courtyard, but instead of standing in a foyer, he was led into a side door by the servant girl. The walls around the side door were all painted white, and black eaves protruded slightly from above the passageway. He stood there for a while, but no one came to meet him. He was unsure whether this was intended to put him in his place in the mansion as the Count's baseborn son. He sighed, beginning to feel uneasy. He looked up at the carefully constructed black eaves. The old manor was a indeed a rather tasteful building. He was incorrect in his assumptions, however. The young servant girl and the old maid stood to one side not because they wished to treat him coldly, but because they were aware of his status. They did not dare to approach him. This was partly because they were unsure how to address him as he was not the son of the Count's legal wife. But it was also because the Count had not yet arrived, and as servants they did not dare to act rashly. Someone had already gone to inform the master of the house. Fan Xian waited. With a self-deprecating smile, he called over the young servant girl. She was quite young, her face delicate and fair. Young. Young. What is your wish? She had, at first, wanted to address him as young master 
but she was unsure if it was appropriate. She stammered, her face turning crimson. Bring me a chair, said Fan Zhan, giggling at her discomfort. She followed his orders, carrying in a heavy wooden chair from the hall, which left her slightly out of breath. Fan Zhan drew closer and took hold of the chair, placing it on the ground and smiling slightly. He sat down on it with noble bearing, and lifted his head to look at the eaves ignoring the rest of his surroundings. When she saw him sit on the chair, the servant girl was shocked. If one's elders are yet to arrive, one should stand with one's hands folded, how could he act so boldly? Dot. The sound of footsteps echoed from the hall, and a light fragrance was carried on the wind. It could make one's heart flutter. Fans Yan turned his head to the side, and saw a noble woman approaching, a slight smile on her face. She was good-looking, and her eyes were neatly decorated with eye shadow. She wore a skirt that fluttered around her, and her beauty was sure to turn heads wherever she went. Hers was an air of reserved nobility that suggested that she was not to be trifled with. Fans Yan let out a sigh and stood up from the chair. She raised her umber-painted eyebrows and smiled, lighting up the room. Zhan, she said, regarding him from afar. The journey must have been difficult. Take a seat. Good day, stepmother said Fan Zhan, smiling sweetly. Chapter 42, Lady Liu This was the second wife of Count Sinan, Lady Liu Ruayu, who was taken into the Count's household over a decade ago. Her family's roots ran deep, within three generations, they had become high nobility. So when she had become a concubine of Count Sinan, it was a source of great discussion within the capital. Everyone wondered what the Liu clan could be thinking, to give away a daughter to Fan Jian. Even if he had just been made Count Sinan, he was only a distant relative of the influential Fan clan. It was only in the past decade that he had gained the Emperor's favor and amassed great prestige, climbing up the ranks. Now the great family served her ruthless vision. But strangely, the Count had never intervened in her scheming. Whether this decision was made rationally, or out of deference to the Liu clan, it made little sense either way. Fans Yan smiled sweetly. It is good to finally meet my father's concubine. Lady Liu also smiled, but an indescribable expression flashed in her eyes. Hearing this child call her concubine rankled, most people would have called her his second wife. There was a world of difference between concubine and second wife. Come along, she said, smiling. You've come a long way. What have you been doing dawdling under these eaves? If anyone saw you, they'd think that Fan Manor was inhospitable. Inhospitable? There were certainly some people they didn't want to be hospitable to, thought Fan Zhan. He knew that she was reminding him of his own status as an illegitimate child, but at the same time, he admired the beauty of her words. He wasn't prepared for a war of words with the woman. He knew full well that she had been in the manor for a long time and it wouldn't have been worth it to spar with her verbally. But, considering that they were at cross-purposes with each other, why did he have to back down? It seemed that she wasn't some fool with sinister intentions, as he had imagined her before. So now he felt somewhat confused, why had she tried to kill him four years ago? As he followed her into the hall, he made sure not to stay too far away. Her unique scent reached his nostrils, and he inhaled. It was quite a pleasant aroma. In times like these, one may have trivial thoughts. Fans Yan felt rather pleased with himself, and he smiled as he made small talk with Ems Liu. The noblewoman and the young man both played their part, putting on a facade of a mother and son. Dot. The tea arrived. It was genuine Wu Fun tea, a fine variety. The refreshments had also arrived fine flaky pastries from the south. After talking about the journey, how the lady of the house was faring back in Danzu, the seaside scenery of the town he had just left behind, and what was worth seeing in the capital, the two found that they had nothing else to say to each other, at the very least, nothing polite. So, going by what seemed to be a quiet mutual understanding, Lady Liu and Fans Yan sat in silence. Both were aware that the other person was not easy to deal with. There was no sense in sounding out each other with clever words, it was best that they both stayed silent. The awkward atmosphere of the room had convinced the servant girls to keep quiet out of fear, even making sure that they stepped lightly as they came by to refill the tea. But neither Fans Yan nor Lady Liu felt awkward, 
Once in a while they would grasp their teacups and look at each other, their gazes soft and gentle but hiding daggers underneath. Lady Liu was perturbed. She had discovered that this was no ordinary young man before her. To her surprise, the situation had not stopped him from responding freely, without the least bit of nervous restraint. He seemed mature and earnest, perhaps even more prudent than his father. It seemed to her that she should not have listened to advice she had received four years before, which had made her hasty to see him as an enemy without good cause. Now it appeared something of a mistake. It would be difficult to resolve this situation. As they sat in silence, Lady Liu suddenly got the feeling that it was weakening her position. After all, she was his elder. She cleared her throat. Your father is now an official at the treasury, she said. Have you come to the capital to prepare for next year's imperial examinations, or will you be going straight to the treasury for work? Fans Yan smiled. I shall do as father says. He paused for a moment. But I'm not sure when he'll be back. He was telling the truth. There were a few people he wanted to meet with in the capital. Lady Liu was one of them, as was Fuji and his little sister Ra or Yuo. But the person he was most interested in meeting was definitely his father. He was very curious as to how Count Sunan had caught the eye of his mother, the head of the illustrious Yi family. In his mind, he thought of the dead woman as his mother but never much considered Count Sunan to be his father. This was perhaps a quirk of the male mentality. Your father will return shortly. As she said this, there was a slight clattering outside the door to the inner courtyard. The servant girls hurried to greet whoever it was, but the noise came too quickly, and the servant girls were unable to bar the way. A young woman walked in. She wasn't particularly pretty, but she was exceptionally neatly dressed with what seemed to be a somewhat delicate and faintly indifferent disposition. The indifference was not that of a nice maiden, a loathing for the impure things surrounding her, but rather of someone who had yet to discover their own self-confidence, and so created an apathetic demeanor, feeling at odds with the world around them. Fans Yan's heart skipped a beat. It wasn't becoming of a young noblewoman to have such a cold exterior. The young woman looked Fans Yan in the face. Her cold expression softened until it finally melted away entirely, and a slight blush began to spread on her cheeks. She opened her mouth to speak, but stopped. She took a step back and slightly rearranged her garments. Curtsying, she spoke in a gentle, clear voice that seemed both polite and boastful. Good day. Brother, Fan Xian smiled, and held out his hand to support her. Ra or Yuo, there's no need to be so polite. The two exchanged glances and faint, earnest smiles. They had exchanged letters for many years. In this world, each was the person the other one knew most deeply. But the sound of a clumsy child immediately broke their tender reunion. Hey, are you Fan Xian? Fan Xian turned to face the youngster who had entered. He was rather chubby and the left side of his face was covered in unsightly moles. His face seemed full of resentment, and he stared at Fans Yan with a slight disgust. Chapter 43, Raw or Yuo's Lessons Fans Yan sat down, ignoring the boy, and offered his little sister a seat. Who's the boy? He asked, smiling. He had already guessed who the plump young lad was, but he wasn't going to say anything. I'm Fan Sis, the boy said the young master of the fan family. He looked Fan's yawn in the eyes. H.M.P.H. So you're the bastard. He heard a faint sound, and tried to catch sight Lady Liu in the corner of his eye. To his surprise, she had already left, and he wasn't sure where she'd gone. It seemed she had intentionally allowed her son to come in and annoy him, overturning his efforts to remain calm. In any case, if he acted inappropriately, there was the excuse that Sis was still young and unaware of how he should behave. A strange smile crept across Fan's Yan's face. He was already aware when he left Danzu that the Count Sare was a bad-tempered, rude, and unreasonable young boy. For his father's sake, Fan's Yan decided that he would commit himself to educating his little brother. To prevent him from committing some grave offense and bringing the house of Fan into disrepute. But taking on this task was more than he had bargained for. Give me your hand, said Ra or Yuo, coldly. As she said this, she pulled out a ruler. Why? Mumbled Fan says. His face was filled with fear, 
and yet he still obediently extended his hand. Two solid wax later, Fan Siz's hand was left with two red marks. Tears began to well up in his eyes, but he gritted his teeth and tried to keep them back. But Sis, he is a bast. Before the word could leave his mouth, Ra Uruo had already brought the ruler down on his hand again, her expression completely unchanged. Fan Xian realized that the coldness of his sister's manner, in the eyes of most people, would seem rather repressed. First of all, you are to call him older brother. Second of all, you understand our family's status, so you shall not make such awful remarks. Third of all, if you will not respect your elder brother, then you will be punished. Fan Ra Uruo spoke coldly. The way she gripped the ruler in her hand reminded Fan's Yan of a kindergarten teacher, gentle on the outside, but ferociously strict on the inside. Fan Sis looked Fan's Yan resolutely in the eyes, pressed his lips together tight, and ran away towards the rear courtyard. Every time, he runs crying to Mama, sighed Fan Ra or Yuo. I was wondering what he was about to say. He'll think twice before saying it again. It's quite funny to watch you be so strict with him. I don't think there's anything funny about discipline, brother. Why do you carry a ruler to hit him with? Father gave me the authority to discipline him. It seems I was mistaken in my analysis of how the world works. You mean, in terms of male authority? Huh? There's still the question of distribution of power in the household. It seems that I now hold a little power. But don't forget, that kind of power is completely dependent on that man's whims. Brother, you should not forget that that man, as you call him, is our father. Dot. Their quick-fire question and answer session at an end, fans Yan and Fan Ra or Yuo smiled at each other. They were truly happy to be in each other's company, with no one else around. Fan Ra or Yuo let her guard down and allowed herself to laugh, it seemed her happiness was difficult to restrain. Fans Yan was the same. Perhaps because they had exchanged so many letters, they were able to have a conversation on each other's intellectual level. When they had started to write to each other, Fan Ra or Yuo was still young. To an extent, her view of people and of the world had been deeply yet imperceptibly shaped by Fan Yan's influence. They had not seen each other in ten years, so it would have been natural to feel like strangers to each other. But as they sensed the bond that had developed between them, it soon brought them closer together. It was as if the two siblings had never been apart but had seen each other every day, as if they were long-standing intellectual confidants and close friends. In their relationship, Fan Ra or Yuo saw Fan's Yan as a kind of tutor, and Fan's Yan saw her as his student and his junior. They had a subtle mutual understanding. Fan's Yan smiled. It seems like you have a good life here. He said to her in a low voice, I suppose I don't need to worry. Fan Ra or Yuo lowered her head. I have missed your counsel, brother, she said quietly. Oh? Fan's Yan smiled shyly. Had the last chapter he wrote and sent to her had an effect? It wouldn't be right to ask so directly. Lady Liu has been happy with herself recently, she said coldly calling her by her name. Even though she and Fan's Yan were the only two people in the hall, the atmosphere had clearly gotten colder. Fan Xian paused for a moment in thought. Even though I was far away in Danzu, I knew about the Yu family's position in the capital. You shouldn't disrespect her. I won't. Fan Ra or Yuo's eyelids drooped, and her eyelashes hung beautifully on her pale skin. Fan Xian gazed at her with a slight smile. It was his good fortune to find someone who understood him in this world even if it was someone that he had taught himself. Did you receive my letter? He asked softly. Fan Ra or Yuo smiled, and the coldness left her face. I saw it in my room the other night. It scared me, I thought some awful person had left it there. But then I saw the handwriting and I realized it was you. Fan Ya shrugged. Relying on Wu Zhu's abilities to deliver a letter was truly a waste of his talent. No one had entered the room to interrupt their conversation. Fan Yan was happy for that. He took a sip of his tea. You probably don't know why I'm in the capital, he said firmly. Fan Ra or Yuo lifted her head and looked at her brother with a smile that didn't seem quite like a smile should. Fan Yan felt somewhat embarrassed by her gaze. What is it? He mumbled. Fans Yan gave a sigh that seemed almost mocking, 
then smiled. I think most people know why you're here. I believe the children of the capital's noble houses are quite curious. Count Sinan must have big plans for his illegitimate son, if he's going to summon him to the capital, eh? Fan Xian was taken aback. I thought father brought me here in secret. How come everybody knows? There can't be that many people in the capital who know who I am. Why is everyone so curious about me? Because you're here to be married. Fan Ra Eryuo laughed. The bride father has arranged for you is quite well known. Fan Xian frowned. Although he didn't necessarily want to marry her. He was still rather concerned over what his bride might be like. Do you know her? My future sister-in-law is a daughter of the Lin family. Fan Ra Eryuo's eyes shone. Not only do I know her, I believe the whole capital knows her. What Lin family? Why is this girl so famous? Fan Yan raised his eyebrows. Brother, although you were far away in Danzu, I know that the imperial household sent you a letter about it. Grandmother should have a copy of it. Fan Ra Eryuo laughed. Fan Yan thought back and slapped his palm to his forehead in realization. You mean the Lin family, as in the family of the Prime Minister, Lin Ruofu? She's the illegitimate daughter from that great scandal he was caught up in. Chapter 44 Father and Son The King Kingdom had entered an age of prosperity. The past ten years had seen fine weather for crops and peace and stability for the people. The nation had the wisest ruler in its history, who received a great many accolades for his management of state affairs. But strangely, it also had the most corrupt bureaucracy in its history, and its most wicked prime minister. This was Prime Minister Lin Ruofu. Lin Ruofu was born in poverty. He was by no means the son of a noble family. He entered the bureaucracy after passing the imperial exams starting as an evaluator in Suzhou before being transferred to the capital to work as an administrator for palace affairs. He later moved on to being responsible for the imperial army, before returning to lead the Overwatch Council in the capital. He also held a degree from the elite Hanlin Academy, and during the last government reforms, he was responsible for specific affairs of the six departments, rising from an assistant minister to minister in the Ministry of Appointments before rising to head of the bureaucracy. He was subordinate to only the emperor, with thousands of people underneath him in his role as prime minister. People who paid cautious attention to the posts he had held discovered that he had he had experience with civilian affairs, military affairs, literature, and the auditors. Although his career had had ups and downs, he had experience in every area of the bureaucracy and had made slow but steady progress climbing the ranks throughout his life. There were rumors that Lin Ruofu was not trusted within the palace. His ability to move throughout the complex bureaucracy despite his lack of deep connections left many feeling astonished. The prime minister seemed a principled man on the outside, but his exterior hid a treacherous spirit and he accepted countless bribes. His plotting and scheming within the bureaucracy and the nobility had caught the ire of many people and so he was loved neither by officials or by the common people. But his efforts over the past decade had granted him a control over the bureaucracy that could not be toppled. Occasionally an official would accuse him of misconduct, but lacking any concrete evidence they would have no choice but to drop the subject. The upstanding officials of the capital hated him to the bone but did not dare to cross him. Only the emperor could strip him of his power or his life. Every official knew this. Only the director of the Overwatch Council could spit in his face. No one else among the nation's most powerful people had the courage. And when the director had spat at him in the street, he was fined three years' salary. The punishment was personally ordered by the emperor. Dot. People found that the emperor's trust in his prime minister would never waver. Officials who considered themselves uncorrupt began to despair. No one could have foreseen that. At that moment, a scandal would emerge in the newspaper, accusing the prime minister of having fathered an illegitimate daughter. In noble houses, it was normal for the master of the house to have a number of concubines, to only have one woman was seen as rather embarrassing. But parentage and etiquette were seen as extremely important in society. Everyone knew that the prime minister was cunning and ruthless, 
but he had always appeared uncorrupted. To have an illegitimate daughter outside one's household showed a great lack of morals, and that daughter was now a teenager. She was not permitted to live within his manor, she lived outside, alone. It was proof that, when he came to fatherhood, he lacked even the slightest compassion. Because the news had come from the imperial palace, it caused a great stir within the capital. People debated whether the prime minister had angered his majesty, and whether the emperor was preparing to replace him with someone else. The imperial censor Master Tai later gathered a petition on the matter. To everyone's surprise, the emperor personally intervened to put an end to the matter. The affair gradually settled down, but the prime minister's illegitimate daughter became the center of attention. Dash. Fans Young laughed bitterly. He never would have thought that he and his bride-to-be would have so much in common. At that moment, the silence outside was broken. They both knew who had returned home. They looked at each other, unsure what to say. Fans Yan gave her a look that suggested they go outside. Fan Ra or Yuo nodded slightly. Candles were lit, but the sky was yet to darken, which made their flames seem much weaker. In the hall was a table laid with a sumptuous variety of dishes. Five people sat around it with a number of servant girls attending to their needs. Fan Xian realized that Lady Liu was no ordinary concubine. She did not wait for the master of the house to eat first, but sat by the side of the middle-aged man, her face calm and composed. Is that middle-aged man really my father? Fan Xian couldn't help but furrow his brow, and pleasant-looking wrinkles spread across his forehead. Count Sinan had a stern, average-looking face with a four-inch beard on his chin in keeping with the current style. He seemed quite a serious man, not given to humor. Calmly finishing his meal, Count Sinan walked away, and fans Yan followed him to the library. This was the first time he had ever been alone with his father. He smiled. He wasn't particularly emotional about it, deep in his heart. He had never seen the man as his own flesh and blood. Count Sinan looked at the young man before him. Noting his delicate complexion, he looked thoughtful, and after a long while, he finally spoke. You look just like your mother. Fans Yan had no response, he had never seen his mother. He had many questions for the man who stood in front of him, but he knew it was not his place to ask first. How has it been in Danzu? Count Sinan looked at him, his face betraying a hint of exhaustion, and yet still carrying traces of the beauty he possessed in his prime. It's been all right. I believe you already got Tang Zijing to tell you why I have summoned you to the capital when you were on your way here. Yes. Do you feel wronged? No. Fans Yan smiled. I just took a ride to the capital. I never said I agreed to marry Miss Lin. There was a deathly silence in the library as soon as he said it. Do you know what marriage means? Asked Count Sinan coolly, eventually breaking the silence. Other than continuing the family line. It means the Fan family has a chance at currying favor at the palace. Fan's Yan's response was in jest, but he had no love for his father. Logically, he knew he should have Remei and dispassionate, but his father treated his own son's marriage as merely a political allegiance. Although he understood and accepted it, that did not mean that he wasn't angry, just that over the past few days, he had managed to hide his anger well. Chapter 45 palace intrigues. Very well, you're showing your anger at last. The corners of Count Sinan's mouth curled into a slow smile. From what I heard of you and Danzu, I assumed that you were not prone to anger. My child, you are only 16. If you suppress your emotions, it will cause you no end of pain. So what? Fans Yan fixed his father with an odd look, and made up his mind. There's something I need to tell you first father. And what would that be? I, I'm not going to let you control me. Fans Yan's speech was blunt. I have no desire to control you. Even though. You are my son. Count Sinan looked into Fans Yan's eyes coldly, as if he were searching for the slight panic behind his calm demeanor. But we must forge this alliance to the Prime Minister's family through marriage. I am not going to debate this with you. Fans Yan lowered his head in a moment of thought then raised it again with a smile brimming with self-confidence and perseverance. You can try. Count Sinan seemed somewhat angered. He gripped the armrest of his chair tightly, the exertion making prominent his blue veins. After some time, 
he composed himself. What is it about this that do you not understand? He said coolly. The Lin family's daughter is a gentle, considerate girl, educated and well-mannered. It would be a good match. And our family does not need to cement its status through marriage. Does someone as insignificant as Lin Ruofu really matter to us? Fans Yan was felt somewhat surprised. His father seemed genuine. But if he really saw the Prime Minister as insignificant, then why did he want his son to marry into the Lin family? Was it simply because the young Miss Lin really was that wonderful? Fans Yan couldn't believe it. No matter what, fans Yan frowned. Why does it have to be her? Kaunsanen gave a slight smile. Because Miss Lin's mother is the eldest princess, the younger sister of His Majesty. The eldest princess has never married, but she has managed business for the imperial household in secret, providing no end of money for the nation and the royal family. Fans Yan was shocked to think that his yet unseen bride-to-be was the daughter of the eldest princess, and that the prime minister and the eldest princess had had an affair. Even multiple affairs? No wonder the prime minister had climbed his way up the ladder so easily. He was quite the Lotharyo after all. There were surely only a few people in the entire nation who knew of this secret. Were it not for his father's close and lifelong friendship with the emperor? he would not have known either. Fans Yan suddenly realized that this secret was not something that his father should have divulged to him. Kaunsanen smiled. Make no mistake, this should never leave these walls. If you speak of it, you'll be put to death. So if it ever reaches your ears, you are to act as if you never heard it. I am telling you the, the royal family's secrets because I want you to be prepared. I don't want you to ruin your relationship with Miss Lin when you meet her. Dot. Fans Yan suddenly recalled something that Wu Zhu had told him. His face fell, and he sighed. The royal business that the eldest princess has been managing. Was it once the Yi family's business? Correct. There was a trace of tenderness in Count Sinan's eyes, admiration for this young man before him, able to see through things and get to the truth so easily. Miss Lin is the eldest princess's only child and the emperor has long allowed the eldest princess to manage the royal household's business. So whoever marries her, becoming the eldest princess's son-in-law, is likely to become the master of the royal family's business. The long explanation had left Count Sinan somewhat tired, but he deep down, he felt a twinge of excitement. He pushed himself up from the chair and gazed at Fan's yawn, emphasizing every word. That business belonged to your mother. So you're only taking back what belonged to you. Dot. There was a deathly silence. Father, I'm in awe of your plans. Fans Yan bowed to his father. Even though Miss Lin is not a princess, she is of royal standing. Do you really think we can take back mother's business this way? It feels somewhat arrogant to me. Of course, I have tricks up my sleeve. Do not forget that I am an official in the treasury. I also manage financial affairs. Count Sinan smiled, finding himself more and more appreciative of his son's ability to keep a cool head. There's something else I must tell you. That old thief Lin Ruofu has little control over the matter, but he has some doubts about this marriage. I hope that you will soon make yourself well regarded within the capital. Why? Fans Yan had some doubts. Although Lin Ruofu was prime minister and head of the bureaucracy, he was fully aware that the Fan family was held in high regard in the capital. Surely he should be pleased about his daughter making such a powerful allegiance, why would he oppose it? In terms of status, the young lady was roughly on a level with Fan Zhan. they were born in the same circumstances. Everyone has their own positions, explained the Count, coldly. Different people will see things differently. The Fan clan is one of the capital's great houses. Lin Ruofu is head of the bureaucracy. It is of great significance for the two families to be secretly connected by marriage. Lin Ruofu has misgivings because he fears that His Majesty will dot his intentions. He also fears that his young subordinates in the bureaucracy will be disloyal as a result. Fans Yan sighed, and smiled self-effacingly. I gave it a lot of thought on my way here. But it sounds like it's your way or the highway. That's right. So you had best find a way to get Miss Lin to approve of you. The Count laughed. But what does my way or the highway mean? I misspoke. Fans Yan pursed his lips and smiled, changing the subject. Father, 
There's something I have always wanted to know, but I don't know if can ask you. Go ahead. Never mind. It's getting late. I'd best go to bed. He didn't know why, but he couldn't find the words. He decided to ask something else instead. I'm still new to the capital. Would you mind if Tang Zijing could accompany me? Tang Zijing would make a good guide, but he is not the greatest of fighters. Count Sinan frowned. I shall assign you a bodyguard. The capital can be a treacherous place. Fans Yan smiled. No need, we've been through a lot together. I'm used to him. No need to change him for someone else. After some more light conversation, Fans Yan saw that it was late and bade his father good night. The servant girls had been waiting for him the whole time, and when he left the room, they escorted him through the twisting corridors to his bedchamber. Chapter 46 Old Friends in a Distant City Fans Yan lay on the freshly made bed and ran his hands over the wonderfully smooth silk cover while he thought about what his father had told him. Although he had expected to run into some problems in the capital, he had never expected them to be so serious. Before he left, Fans Yan had originally planned to ask his father about the attempt to assassinate Fans Yan ordered by the Liu clan four years ago, but after some thought he decided against it. There was no use in forcefully uncovering the dirty secrets of high-status clans. What's more, Fans Yan could tell from the first conversation with his father that he really did care for him. It seemed like he was sent to Danzu because the people who had killed his mother were still in the capital. Thinking of this, his lips formed a dry smile. Was he really going to marry that sickly girl? At this point, it felt like he was the one scheming against the young Miss Lin. She really did seem like a pathetic girl. With this in mind, Fans Yan decided to visit Miss Lin when he had the chance. His attention moved to the slender box placed carelessly in the corner of the room. He wondered where its key was. Due to the journey, Fans Yan had to stop training for ten days. Without a word, he began to practice and the Zenki began slowly flowing. Just before he entered a meditative state, he thought of his father and his head filled with countless questions. While fans Yan tossed and turned during his first night in the capital's estate, Count Sinan was in a daze in his study. Seeing fans Yan's charming and dainty face for the first time in 16 years brought back old memories. Zhao Yazi, he mumbled to himself, your child has grown up to be so smart at such a young age, just like you were. Chen Pingping was against him coming to the capital. So when he went on vacation I brought fans Yan over. I have been guaranteed by someone that the Yi family business will be rightfully returned to him. A light shone on the face of the serious middle-aged man as he whispered softly. Don't worry, no one in this country would dare harm him. Dash. Sunlight peeked through the gaps in the clouds, causing the land below to flicker between light and dark. The new branches of the old trees by the roadside danced gently in the breeze. It was the end of spring and young lotus flowers covered the lake by the foot of the mountain. The Fan Estate's carriage rolled forward slowly, surrounded by guards. It was quite an impressive scene. The carriage was silent inside. Fans Yan had his eyes half-closed while Ra Yuo was carefully peeling the thin skin of some loquats before feeding the sweet and sour fruit to her brother. Fans Yan opened his mouth and swallowed the fruit in one bite. It was so sour that he had to swallow repeatedly. A look of disbelief was plastered on Fan Si's face as he observed this scene in horror. His 15-year-old sister was an expert in the arts. She was famous amongst the aristocracy of the capital for her ice-cold attitude which caused countless noblemen to sigh in grief. And yet, here she was peeling loquats and feeding them to some fellow named Fan Yan. Fan Roru had no idea she was looking at her older brother with a face full of admiration or that her younger brother had witnessed everything. She had only wanted to make her older brother more at home. She thought he must have had a hard time in Danzu, and now that he had finally moved to the capital, he had been assigned to marry Miss Lin. In Ra Yuo's eyes, no one was fit to be with her brother, let alone a girl who was in such a sickly state. Though the young Miss Fan was well known throughout the capital, she always saw herself as a little girl listening to ghost stories in the Danzu estate. She was the only one who knew that her brother was full of poems and stories. Fan Ra Yuo remembered the pen names he had used in his letters, Su Wing and Kao Gong, 
and smiled gently. She looked at her older brother and wondered why he hid his talent from others. Fan Xian enjoyed the warm feeling he got from his sister. Half closing his eyes, he knew that his sister had guessed long ago that the story of the stone and those other articles had been written by him. But he was thinking about something else. The situation at the Fan Estate differed from what he expected. But at least the Liu clan seems to have learned their lesson four years ago and have not stepped out of line since. Meanwhile, the rumored rude and wild little brother was obedient to Ra or Yuo. There was nothing that fans Yang found particularly intolerable. They were quite the happy family. Dot. Francis looked at Fans Yan's face curiously. He had to admit that his older stepbrother was much more handsome than he was. Despite this, he was certain that the only heir fit to inherit the Fan family fortune was himself, the rightful young master and not this outsider before him. Fancy thought of his sister, who was normally simple and straightforward, and of how much he admired her. He then thought of how much his sister seemed to admire Fan Zhan. This puzzled him. Could it be that there was something impressive about Fan Zhan? No one on this street dares mess with me. Fancy proudly told the boy who was four years older than him. He continued arrogantly, since you have just arrived in the capital, I'll show you around. Fan Xian leaned lazily on the soft cushion and burst out laughing. He had planned to let his sister take him around the capital to sightsee. He never imagined that his brother Fancy's would join, without having been invited, and tag along in the carriage. Why must you follow us around, little guy? He asked Fances. Fances shouted back, Don't call me little guy, I am the rightful young master of the Fan family. Don't you think shouting makes you look low class? Fans Yan questioned him curiously. And if you were worried about me taking the family fortune, you should be more scheming. He patted his brother's head and laughed. You should take some lessons from your mother. Fances looked at the shy smile on Fans Yan's pretty face and all of a sudden felt scared. He retreated behind Fan Ra or Yuo and wondered why this strange boy could speak without the slightest restraint. As they were speaking, the carriage arrived in a busy part of the capital. It was noon and there were many people out on the streets. Restaurants on both sides of the carriage were welcoming customers and the sound of merriment together with the delicious smell of food floated into the carriage. It was so enticing that Fancy noisily announced it was time to eat. While Tang Zijing entered the restaurant to claim a table, Fancy's and Fan Ruru, under the protection of some guards, went to a noodle bar by the side of the street. Fan Zhan, on the other hand, was half kneeling as he admired the engravings on the pillars beneath the restaurant. These engravings were elegant and decorated with gold paint. They were so uniquely vibrant and unlike anything he had ever seen in the books of his previous life. Two guards stood in the distance, their observant eyes scouring the surroundings. Just then, a middle-aged woman dressed simply and carrying a baby hurried towards Fan's yawn as though she were a thief and whispered. Would you like some books? Ones that haven't been censored by the 8th Bureau. Fan Xian was touched by this warm, familiar scene. It reminded him of home. He lifted his head and asked her ever so gently, Are they Japanese or Western? Chapter 47, The Treasured Red Book The 8th Bureau of the Overwatch Council, also known as the Department of Court Articles, was similar to the News Examination Board of the Republic of China in the previous world. They were responsible for the review of all legitimate books. Only a book approved by the 8th Bureau would be published. In recent years, many of the duties of the Department of Court Articles were reassigned to the Ministry of Education, though they had still held on to their right to review books printed privately by civilians. The 8th Bureau would not accept anything that involved creative descriptions of the human body the art of violence, or suggestions of revolution that were not permitted by the emperor. However, it didn't matter what world you lived in, the subjects of sex, violence and politics were bound to be hot topics, so it was inevitable that underground booksellers would surface. Normally, the booksellers wouldn't dare sell books about politics. But romance novels like Of Joy and Passion were mass-produced and passed through the hands of many before finding an owner. There was no doubt that a middle-aged woman with a child in her arms W was the last in the chain of recipients of the book. Nobody in the capital batted an eye at this familiar scene, and even government officials let it slide under their watch. 
say less of the civilians who benefited from it. What did you say sir? The women selling prohibited books stared blankly, oblivious to the beautiful existence of Avenue. Fans Young laughed and asked, what books do you have? The woman put the child in her other arm and retrieved a book from the layers of clothes. The book was roughly 8 inches, square, and completely red. It looked to be of good quality. Fans Young was quite impressed by how the woman managed to keep the edges pristine despite storing it in her clothes whilst carrying a child in her arms. These are the most popular short stories in the capital. The women spoke with an air of secrecy, unaffected by her facade. Fans Yan took the book. He smiled as he opened the first page. He could not contain the look of surprise on his face. Although there was no author name printed on the front cover, the four words Feng Yu Bao Jian was written in large font on the title page. On the following page were the words, who knew that this daughter-in-law possessed a natural charm. Her entire body becomes limp and soft whenever a man bumps into her and the man would experience the sensation of lying on a bed as soft as clouds. Fans Yan was speechless and his mouth opened wide. He recognized the book right away. It was called Dream of the Red Chamber and he had sent a written copy to his sister before. The section he had just read was from Chapter 21, when Kiao Ping saved Ji Yan by using softly spoken words, and it was a told about Ms. Duo. The middle-aged woman mistakenly thought that the pretty boy in front of her was enticed by it all, and continuing in a low voice, she said, That's just a small taste, there's more exciting parts to come. In his previous life, Fans Yan was stuck in his bed for years, incapable of doing a lot of things. He couldn't bring himself to ask his nurse to help him turn the pages of lewd books. So he reread Dream of the Red Chamber countless times instead. He was able to relieve his fatigue all thanks to Ms. Duo's ladylike manners in the book. Now that this familiar scene was played out right in front of his eyes on the busy streets of the capital, he couldn't help but be surprised. He was grateful, but confused at the same time as he couldn't understand how this story known by only him and his sister was being published and sold on the streets. Without asking for the price fans Yan paid her handsomely for the book. He had earned quite a sum of money from selling newspapers in Danzu, money he would spend without hesitation. After the overjoyed middle-aged woman had left, Fan Ra or Yuo led Fan Sis to the restaurant, his hands occupied by a sugar figurine he was holding. What were you up to? Fan Ra or Yuo questioned her older brother with a smile. Before fans Yan could answer. Fans is cut in with a cold chuckle, I saw everything. He bought a book from that woman and he wasn't even discreet when going about his dirty business. Fan Ra or Yuo felt slightly panicked, as she had no idea what was going on. Fans Yan couldn't be bothered replying to his brother and instead wanted to speak to his sister in private. Just then, Tang Zijing conveniently announced that their tables were ready. Fans Yan gently tugged at Ra or Yuo's cold hands as they walked up the stairs. Phased, Fans is licked his sugar figurine once more before following them up the stairs in a hurry. Although there were many people in the restaurant, the third floor remained quiet. Even though the private rooms were all booked, Tang Zijing proved to be skillful, as he still managed to find a compartment. Fans Yan felt that his decision to ask his father to let Tang Zijing come was the right one. As fans Yan sat down, he noticed how Fan Size's eyes were busy studying move. He smiled and openly handed his sister the red book. Fan Ra or Yuo frowned as the book was given to her. Her eyes grew large in astonishment when she saw the title page, and she grew even more bewildered as she scanned through the pages. She explained to her brother hurriedly, Brother, this is the first I've seen of this. Fans Yan laughed and comforted her, I'm not blaming you. He had already guessed that his sister would take her copy of Dream of the Red Chamber and make it into a book, and also knew that she could not resist sharing the story with her good friends. The only question on his mind was how the story had managed to spread beyond her circle of noble friends. It was when he saw the book Dream of the Red Chamber being sold on the streets that he realized he had completely underestimated how tough the underground bookseller of this world was. Dash. 
Fan Ra Er Yuo thought back to an incident that happened the previous year when she had just bound the first 68 chapters of Dream of the Red Chamber and left them to sit under the pressure of some wood. Regia Princess from Lord Ging's family had come to visit and she saw the book. Once she had read it she refused to let it go, as she was convinced she would be able to take it back home. But to Fan Ra Er Yuo, her brother put his blood and sweat into this book and she would not risk losing it under her watch, so no matter how much Ryuo Jia begged or threw tantrums, she stood her ground. In the end, it was Princess Jing who suggested that their maid rewrite a copy. Fan Ra Ryuo couldn't find a reason to object, so she let her be, who knew that the book had spread like wildfire and soon became a secret that everyone shared. It passed through the houses of the lords, and then to the public market. Nobody knows I wrote it. Fans Yan took the book, turning it in hands. He noticed that the author was named, Kazukin and he felt instantly relieved. Fan Ra Eryuo spoke with guilt, I know that you don't care about fame. Letting your story spread into the public was bad enough, there's no way I would have revealed your identity as the author. I don't care about fame. Fans Yan laughed awkwardly and rubbed his sister's head, apologizing quickly when he realized he was messing it up. When I wrote it. I had already knew it was going to be read by the public. He thought of the deposit he had paid and felt a jab of pain in his heart. I just didn't expect the underground sellers to get the biggest benefits. It's just a shame I spent my silver on nothing. The siblings continued to talk until the waiter came with their food. It was at this moment that they noticed fans is looking at fans yawn with shock, and he broke the silence, mumbling enviously. You wrote dot that book? Chapter 48 Street literature. Hearing those words, Fan Ra Eryuo was reminded of the fact that her little brother had just heard their entire conversation. Her cold, emotionless face was slightly tinged with worry, as she wondered if he would cause Fan Xian trouble by telling Lady Liu. She glanced at Fan Xian. Fan Xi's expression changed from a look of shock to one of admiration. What is it? Fan Xian looked at him with a strange smile. Fan Xi's could no longer tolerate his gaze. A gaze that seemed extremely gentle but that was in reality limitlessly cold. He trembled as he spoke. I'm just surprised you wrote that book. Fans Yan was baffled. You've read this book? In his memories of his previous world, anyone who read Dream of the Red Chamber before the age of 12 and loved it was likely to become a hipster or a rogue who cheated female hipsters. No. Fancy shook his head in a hurry. I read a little of it and thought it boring. He felt he regained confidence with these words, and held his head higher. My teacher read it, and he said. He deliberated before deciding to tell the truth. He was full of compliments. He said that the author wrote colorfully and was brimming with talent. The high praises failed to make Fan Xian blush. Instead he smiled and asked, So you admire me? I admire my teacher. Fan Xis thought about it, and my teacher really likes the book you wrote. All of a sudden, his eyes sparkled with greed as he said enviously, Although I've not read it, I know that it is sold by chapters on the market. Each chapter could be sold for a price as high as eight tails of silver. He nodded his head and regarded Fan's yawn like an idol. Making so much money just for some words is quite impressive. I think I understand why my sister admires you so much now. I haven't made money off of it, Fans Yan corrected him. He was confused as to why Fans viewed him so highly all of a sudden because of the money he could make rather than his apparent talent in writing stories. After some thought he understood, his innate passionate love for money was inherited from his father, who was the emperor's personal accountant. Fancis rubbed his hands together and spoke in a frenzy, saying, If you ever wish to make money off your talent in writing in the future, then I will happily buy shares. Fans Yan sighed as he realized that his brother was quite innocent, merely, it was a shame that they were so conflicted in how they saw the benefits. Although Fans Yan did not really plan on taking over the fan business, the idea was deeply ingrained in the minds of the Liu clan. In the spur of the moment, Fans Yan decided to attempt something, as after all, he was related to his brother by blood, and it was in his interest to avoid a tragic conclusion. You haven't told me why you've been following me, don't you have school today? Fans Yan had made up his mind and decided to chat with his stepbrother. Although Francis was young, 
He was not stupid. He knew that what he said earlier may have pleased fans yawn, so he smiled sweetly and replied, because. Mum says. You're competent, and that I should hang around with you more. That you would be a good influence. Fans yawn sighed on the inside. No one could hold a candle to him when it came to being cute, and so Fans's cute act put him to shame. Fans yawn was clear it was Lady Liu's idea to have Fans's follow him. But there was no reason for Francis to flatter him, even if he realized Fans Yan was treated more importantly than a useful tool by their father, there was still no sense in doing so. Dinner was served. Fans Yan's chopsticks flew as fast as lightning around the table as he picked up his food with precision and put it in his mouth. He was oblivious to the dumbfounded expressions of his siblings. He licked his lips as he tasted the food daintily and he nodded. The cuisine of the capital is quite delicious. Fan Ra Eruo was delicate and ate only a little, her body turned to the side as she concentrated on the book Dream of the Red Chamber. Meanwhile, Fans Yan and Fances were munching away, with Fances growing more depressed at as he ate, not understanding why he was chubbier than Fans Yan, who ate faster and more than him. Fan Ra Eruo's frown grew deeper as she realized that this copy of Dream of the Red Chamber was practically identical to the one that was in her room, the only difference being that the excerpt concerning Ms. Duo that was intentionally extracted from the first page and that might lead the capital people to see Dream of the Red Chamber as a dirty book. Seeing her expression, Fans Yan knew what was on her mind. He smiled and placed his chopsticks down on the plate of fish, saying, this is merely a marketing method, what's there to be upset about? Their voices slowly increased in volume. Fan Ra or you guessed what marketing method meant but Fances was completely confused. Before someone buys a book, they will flick through it for an idea of what it's about. Things like the foreword, preface, postscript or prologue must be written clearly not necessarily to explain the novel in full, but to catch their interest. Fans Yan took a sip of tea and continued to talk, Sister, you are angry because you feel that the bookseller has no morals, as they placed Ms. Duo's excerpt at the front which could easily cause the misunderstanding that the story was a romantic affair novel, right? Fan Ra Eruo blinked her eyes and nodded. Treating such a lofty novel as something so unrespectable wasn't this something to be mad at? But the booksellers must do this. Fans Yan looked at his sister's serious face and burst out laughing. If it were me, I would have been even more excessive. This is a copy of Chapter 10, so on the title page I would have wrote the most intriguing excerpts designed to intrigue the customer so much that they must buy the book to find out more. Like what? Ones like Miss Duo's excerpt. How about this chapter? Fan Ra or Yuo understood what her brother meant, and with a slight smile. She pointed to a section of the book, Chapter 23, Lines from Romance of the West Chamber quoted for fun, a vibrant song from the Peony Pavilion singing the distresses of the heart. This chapter talked about things which happened before the flower burial, and there were no sentences which would have made someone blush. Fans Yan chuckled as he spoke, the words vibrant song makes it easy. If it was me, I would use the excerpt where more than half of the people in the garden were girls, and it was a chaotic and innocent place. People lay around lazily, laughing to themselves. At the time, Beioyu had something on her mind and wasn't herself. She hung out in the garden and only messed around outside, yet once again she stupidly witnessed the red array of flowers. And then I would outline the words lay around lazily, laughing to themselves and playing around stupidly and red array in the color red. Fan Ra or Yuo looked down in thought and realized that this really seemed to work. The words meant nothing special on their own, but once combined, and in addition the words vibrant song in the title, a vast room for imagination was created. She blushed, and spoke in a low voice, it would seem that brother has much experience in this sort of business. Fancies, however, was stunned, he gave his brother thumbs up and said, Big Brother, you really are full of talent. Fans Yan snorted and spat out all the tea in his mouth. At the moment, a highly arrogant voice could be heard from outside of their compartment. Just where did those ignorant people come from? How do they dare call a mind full of dirty thoughts talented? Chapter 49, 
In the restaurant, the Fan siblings had chosen a restaurant named Yishijiu, a well-known wealthy establishment in the capital. Every day at noon, the place would always receive some rich government officials, gifted scholars, or beautiful ladies. No one knew where the scholars got their money from, or how famous those ladies were. Regardless, the third floor was vacant, without a great reputation, one cannot get there. It was pretty common knowledge that only those with reputation could be seated on the third floor, and so there was rarely ever an issue over it. After all, the capital wasn't as small as they said, though, its governmental circles were intertwined with many hidden connections and shady deals, so no one could really be sure what their exact relationship with someone was. The one who refuted the fans' Yan Trash publication was a proper scholar, named Izan Wai. He was well known in the capital and praised by his peers, so his arrogance was understandable. A few days ago, he read The Dream of the Red Chamber at his friend's place. Although he was very displeased with the contents of the book and unimpressed by its literary style, he was still impressed by the fact its author had put down several hundred thousand words. Today, in this restaurant, gulping down three cups of yellow wine had made him a bit inebriated. Hearing a few youngsters making unrestrained outbursts about Dream of the Red Chamber from the next room made him angry, so he let loose that remark. At that precise moment, the three fans had finished eating and were chatting over some tea. Hearing what he Zong Wai just said, fans has thought about his boast and then realized that the scholar was addressing fans yawn because it made him lose face also. He was enraged. Born to the great Fan family, Fan says was too privileged to endure embarrassment from a mere scholar. He raised the curtain and went to the main hall on the third floor. Fans yawn though that since it was his first time in the capital, it would be best if he kept a low profile, and he hinted this to this sister. Fan Ra or Yuo knew what he was thinking and smiled while shaking her head, signaling that Fan says shouldn't go overboard. In the past year or two, Fancis had grown up a bit. Thanks to Fan Ra or Yuo's intense upbringing, he matured slightly, just enough that he no longer played rowdy games in the streets. Because of that, Fan Ra or Yuo wasn't worried. Fancis barged into the hall, picking out He Zong Wai from the crowd. With great swagger, he walked up to the scholar and said, Was it you who said that? And what if it was? He Zong Wai's skin was a tad tan and his face had a pronounced shape to it. Overall, he was on the ugly side. Seeing someone barge out of a private room, he knew his words had caused offense. However, the sight of an arrogant rich kid had made him very hot-blooded. So he tried to brush fences off. Watch it, child. Where are your manners? Who are you raised by? While this scholar was well-connected in the capital, he had never met the 12 year old Fancis and wasn't afraid of the youth. Fancis was only planning on scolding the guy, but now that he heard Where Are Your Manners, he was reminded of his mother's constant berating. He retorted angrily with a shout, And you? Which family scoundrel are you? At this moment, Fancis had already forgotten his sister's discipline. He leapt forward trying to slap the scholar. He is on why wasn't expecting to have to deal with uncivil behavior in a place as high class as Yishijiu. He took half a step back, avoiding a slap to the face, though the green cloth on his head was ripped away leaving him embarrassed. Other scholars and an honored guest were sitting at Izong Wai's table, and were infuriated by what they saw. How dare you behave with such insolence? Have you no sense of the law? Law? Francis snorted, I am the law. As soon as he said this, he swung his fists at He Zong Wai. Suddenly, a hand came from the side and firmly grasped Fancis's skinny wrist. Fancis felt as if his wrist was caught in red-hot shackles. The pain pierced through to the bone, forcing him to shout out, Can someone come help me, please? His bodyguard went forward, but there was a flash of shadow as he received two palm strikes to his chest and abdomen, forcing him to back down. The man holding Fancis's wrist was none other than the bodyguard of the valued guest. While appearing ordinary, the bodyguard's eyes hinted at how skilled he was. Toss the child aside, 
Don't ruin Mr. Zongwei's mood. The skilled bodyguard swung his arm. Fences was thrown out like a hatchling chicken. Fans Yan had thought there would simply be some bantering. He had no idea things would get this ugly so quick. He expected Fences to throw temper tantrums in spite Ra or Yuo saying otherwise, and seeing his expectations play out, he wanted his little brother to learn a lesson. However, he was not expecting the other party to have someone so skilled, not to mention someone with such merciless methods. That toss had hidden intents. If things went badly, Fances would end up with broken bones. For all his insolence, Fances was only a 12-year-old child, and using such a move on him went way over the line. Somehow, Fans Yan was already outside the private room. With a single flick of the wrist, he caught the collar of Fances's shirt. Following the body's rotation, he twisted his right hand clockwise, making Fances spin. Once, twice, thrice, Fances stopped spinning. Nauseous, he could only stare blankly, not knowing what had happened. Fans Yan let go of his brother's shirt and left him in Ra or Yuo's care with an uneasy smile. Stepping forward, he looked at the refined bodyguard, and in a meek voice, said while my brother may have offended you due to his youth, what you did went a bit too far. The people at the table could only give a haughty snort in response. They couldn't retort because they agreed with Fans Yan. The young man who had bodyguard only drank his wine in silence, he didn't even look at Fans Yan. He Zongwei felt embarrassed after adjusting the cloth on his head. Seeing the beautiful looks of the youth in front of him, a sudden, unforeseen wave of anger overtook Zongwei. To him, Fans Yan's smile appeared malevolent and despicable. He spat out, You have such an unruly brother, what's wrong with giving him some punishment? Fans Yan ignored He Zongwei. His smile was directed to the bodyguard. He took two steps forward. In response, the bodyguard who had just witnessed this young master cancel out the force of the toss felt a sense of unease. He couldn't measure up this youth. The bodyguard frowned slightly and took two cautious steps back. Fan Ra or Yuo's figure came into view as their steps shifted. Fan Ra or Yuo was known throughout the capital, and everyone in the restaurant had heard of her name. Some of them had even seen her from far away in government meetings. The crowd gasped and paid their respects from a distance. It was only now those guests at the table realized which family that brat came from. Naturally, they became nervous. And when He Zongwei saw Fan Ra or Yuo, his expression changed just so slightly, as if he was about to say something. Chapter 50 what is strength? Tang Zijing rushed up the stairs. As he looked upon the scene, he frowned, and whispered something into Fans Yan's ear. Fans Yan finally realized that this was the somewhat renowned palace scholar Go Bao Kun, the only son of Go Yu, director of the Board of Rights. After the gloomy looking young man caught sight of Fan Ra or Yuo, the expression on his face filled Fans Yan with loathing. I wondered which family could have such powerful children. So you are the offspring of Count Sinan. Count Sinan was a favorite of the emperor, but he was only an assistant minister, a fourth rank title. And the average son of an official would be unaware of the power that the Fan family held in secret. Fans Yan had no desire to inflame matters further. After all, Francis had started it, and no matter what anyone said, it seemed that he was a fan of Dream of the Red Chamber, but he could not help but frown upon hearing this clear attempt at provocation. Go Bao Kun was a high-ranking official and a scholar within the palace. He was on good terms with the crown prince, and so he had grown up to be an arrogant, condescending type. As soon as he laid eyes upon the allegedly cold-hearted Fan Ra or Yuo, he was filled with wicked urges. How amusing. All the insignificant inhabitants of Fan Manor see fit to throw their weight around. Truly a disgrace to the educated classes. In keeping with his self-proclaimed scholarly air, he flipped open the folding fan in his hand with a confident and nimble energy. The group of scholars sat beside him, worried that they had offended Count Sinan and were unsure what to do. When they heard Go Bao Kun's words, they immediately agreed and rushed to label them as bullies, not even considering for a moment that they might have been in the wrong. Only He Zongwei, who had kicked off the incident, was silent. Educated? Seeing that his opponent had no desire to let matters lie, 
Fans Jan could not help but adopt a tone of mockery. If a scholar does not study, he will not gain knowledge, if he has no ambition, he cannot become a scholar. You call yourselves geniuses, but you don't even bother to attend school. You run to the first tavern you find to get drunk instead. What sort of ambition is that? You call yourselves educated? Other than Gobeo Kun, the others at the table were also all gifted scholars. When they heard Fans Jan's words they were bewildered. One scholar chided him. Don't think you can get away with such impudent language just because you're the Fan family. Fans Jan frowned slightly. He didn't think that he and his siblings were completely in the right, but when he looked at the faces of these scholars, he couldn't help but feel disgust. You say we use our power to take advantage of people, he said. I can't comment on that. You all sit at that table drinking with the sons of high officials, not afraid of power and boasting of your own virtue. I'm truly in awe. As they realized the meaning behind his calm words, some of the people in the building began to stop talking. The people who sat with Gobeokun were angered, and were ready to get into a full-blown dispute. Gobeokun waved his fan, preparing to teach these youngsters a lesson. But fans Yan was an odd type. On the surface, he was gentle, but if he was unhappy, he liked to make others unhappy. He did not like to give his opponent the chance to retort. He preferred to end things with one blow. So he did not wait for the official's son to open his mouth, but pointed at the fan that Gobeokun held in his hand and smiled. When I first came to the capital, he said, I saw how young people would amuse themselves all day, all skin and bones, fanning themselves. Is that really strength of character? If that's what you call strength, then I'd rather not study at all. Gobeokun came in and out of the imperial palace as he pleased. He was a friend of the crown prince, who would dare to speak to him this way. He slammed his fan down on the table, speechless and shaking with rage. The current ruling kingdom of king prized affairs of culture as well as political and military achievements. Young scholars could be found throughout the capital, and in this tavern, a great many of the guests were scholars. Among those scholars, who didn't wield a fan. Hearing fans Jan speak so mockingly of strength of character, not only were the table of people sitting with his on why suddenly angered, even the other people on the third floor stood up. Fans Jan had never had much tolerance for these so-called gifted scholars. As he had lived in two worlds, he was generally unconstrained in his behavior, and so he let slip a remark. But seeing the unusual atmosphere in the restaurant, he finally realized that he had angered a number of people, but he wasn't afraid. He smiled, and bowed to them all, cupping his fist in his hand as a sign of respect. They weren't sure why, but when they saw the brilliant smile on the young man's face, the angry scholars felt their anger recede. But Gobeokun remained enraged, and threw his fan upon the table with gritted teeth, signaling that he wished to fight. Dash. Scholars tend to disparage each other with words and they were surrounded by the sons of high officials and great families, so a dangerous atmosphere began to rise. Tang Zijing fixed the Go family's bodyguard with a cold stare, and prepared to defend his master. With the sound of two blows, the two men collided with each other. Their fists flew, and the enfeebled scholars in the restaurant cried out in surprise. Heroic struggles within the capital were always fought to the death by servants. Masters stood to the side as if watching some sort of game, rarely affected by the fight themselves. But fans Yan was completely different to the sons of the nobility. When Tang Zijing and the Go family bodyguard came to blows, he quietly slipped behind them, finding an opportune space and moment. He extended a clenched fist, with an echoing smack, what the onlookers expected to be a bitter and drawn-out fight was brought to an abrupt end. Fans Yan retracted his right hand, and stood in his original space, beaming, as if he had never moved. The Go family bodyguard was crouched on the floor. The bridge of his nose was broken by the blow, and blood gushed out along with tears. Fans Yan was very satisfied with the results of the blow. Master F had taught him well. Breaking the bone in that place caused such pain that even a ninth-level master would be unable to bear it. Gobeokun looked at his strong family bodyguard, brought to the floor like a dog by a single punch. He turned pale with fear, and pointed at Fan's yawn, his voice trembling. You! 
You bullies, fans. Yan looked at him and shook his head. He felt somewhat confused. Fighting was something you should do by yourself, he thought. He wasn't some sort of hooligan. He took Ra Uyuo's hand and walked downstairs, confident that he was in the right. He never imagined that what he had done could be such a violation of the customs of this world.